Gwyn Saga. Guide in one. The seven mages. In the year of the black dragon, the third cat, the seven hills of Cylon, the capital of Cheiron, were filled with black death. But these were but the faintest signs of the evil that would soon befall the Cylons. From the Book of Chiron. Prologue. In Cylon, the capital of Cheiron, the destination of all the red roads, the sacred city of gold and obsidian, the shadow or shade of misfortune has spread its ominous wings since the year of the cat, which has not wavered from season to season. Protected by seven green hills and a sparse waterway, the city of Cylon has received a strange half-human, half-beast king who is said to be the second coming of the legendary Silenus. For the first time since the grand coronation feast of the year of the deer, a crisis is approaching. The people of Cylon had at last become accustomed to peace and tranquility, and were beginning to praise the king's name, to inscribe his great deeds on stone pillars, and to think that his protection would last forever. However, the plague crept into the Cylons on the winds of the Black Devil, first as a vicious dust that brought the Black Death. At first, the disease visited the Cylons with a casualness as if it were the rubella or the black rash of the previous year, as if it were proud of the cleverness of its plan. Only newborn babies, children, the elderly, and the naturally sick, who had no power of resistance, were affected by the epidemic, and people cursed Dole and lined up ahead of others to make offerings to Cassis, the god of medicine. But before the smoke of the offering had ceased to rise in the temple of Cassis, it was replaced by another smoke, much greater and more numerous. The smoke of that funeral, of the procession so long that it filled the seven hills, which burnt the dead and buried their dust in the earth with tears. Cries of curse and grief filled the silence, and they deafened their ears to the groans of the black, puffy lips of the newly dying, lest the scabby, black old skin that fell from their bodies should claim another victim. The new king, the ruler of Chironia and husband of the venerable princess Sylvia, who resides in the obsidian palace on Windward Hill, the largest of the seven hills of Cylon, has issued a flurry of decrees closing the most polluted areas of the four capitals of Cylon, and has even sent a brave volunteer force to disinfect the towns and sewers. The towns and sewers were disinfected with brave volunteers. Furthermore, he took care to provide them with plenty of clean food, water, and medicines that had been cleansed by the sorcerers. His dreams of a new marriage to the Princess Sylvia were just beginning to fade, but not even the slightest hint of the boldness and generosity of action that had brought him the throne of Chironia. The silence, however, seemed to be possessed by something. The disease continued unabated, and the nobles began to think that the Wind Hills were still too close to the black death-ridden city, and many high-ranking officials, including Drax the Thousand Dragon General and Aurelius the Protector, secretly drove their families away from the city, to Lungobard beyond the Seven Hills Sards, the clean green city of Sards, or even farther to Wallstad. At first, the people of Cylon cursed and vilified Dole, but as the plague swept over the land, they began to come in droves to his temple with offerings. The Ceylonian king issued a new edict forbidding it, but to no avail. The Cylons were beginning to show signs of death as a city of calamity. The city was still functioning in the hands of its brave guardians, and though it had not yet reached the point where the streets were strewn with corpses, all the children, the flowery figures of the girls, who brought life and laughter to the streets, were gone. Between the hills, at the great gate of the city, they were advised to go around. The shops shut their doors tightly, and the sky was darkened with the smoke of burning corpses, even at noon. The towns were as still as if they were the dead cities of Canaan, and all that prowled about were hordes of militia, and robbers, and rogues, and the poor, who had no life in them. There was nothing left for them to lose. Night and day, the obsidian palace on Kaziaka was seriously worried that if any other country were to take advantage of this situation, there would be no end to it. However, his worries were nothing compared to the gloom he felt when he heard a rumor that had begun to whisper in the silence. The rumors were, It seems this Black Death is not a normal epidemic. Normally, the Black Death would spread over a very wide area, spreading like wildfire on the wind, but as if some demonic will had drawn an invisible line across the seven hills, this epidemic has been confined to the silent city. 
It's as if someone had set their eyes on the silence and simply wanted to wipe them clean of all living inhabitants. In addition, there are some unspeakably bizarre things going on secretly in the silence. The prophetess, who was a moron, saw a tree frog land on a black lotus leaf and predicted that the evil would continue for some time to come. That is how it was. People were beginning to think seriously about abandoning the silence. In the red moon, the black death subsided a little, but now various apparitions became more noticeable, and King Chironia sent his mages and astrologers to tell fortunes and perform exorcisms, but to no avail. At last, at the end of the red moon, Sylvia, queen and princess of Achilles the Great, departed for the remote palace of Sardes, accompanied by a grand procession of attendants. The ladies of the nobility also accompanied her. The only ones left in the palace of Obsidian were the ten protector generals, the twelve generals, and the three electors of the year who were stationed at Wind Hill, the marquises of Langobard, Atokian, and Frilgia, their respective subordinates, and the palace ladies and servants who could not escape. The splendor of the Obsidian Palace in Chironia had lost its splendor, and the splendor of its noble ladies and elegant musicians, and it seemed deserted and dreary. But that was not even the end of the silent ordeal. At last, from the Starland Palace, a small palace on Hikarigakaka not far from Kaze no Oka, the old emperor Achilles, who had retired to live a life of self-sufficiency, received the sad news of his illness. And then came the urgent news from the intelligence that the ambitious king of the neighboring kingdom of Gala, who had maintained a brief period of peace by means of an alliance, had at last decided to give up his word and advance his army to Chironia. Here, at last, King Chironia sprang into action. It was in the year of the cat, at the beginning of the blue moon, when the full moon of Iris was casting its blood-red light over the seven hills of Cylon, that the naturally adventurous King Chironia set out on what would later be recorded in the Book of Chiron as, the adventure of the seven mages. Casting its blood-red light upon the seven hills of Cylon. And. Chapter 1. The Cylon Nightmare. Hey! Suddenly, the man was called out from behind in a hushed voice and turned around. It was an unexpectedly agile and deadly gesture. The one who had called out to him retreated with a little hesitation, as if intimidated by the unexpected intensity of the light. Something, something. From within the shadows of the hood, a heavy, muffled voice pours out. It's a side street on the outskirts of the downtown area of Terid which is notorious for its bad character even among the silence. The time was now nearer to night than twilight, and a thick, acrid fog was beginning to swirl between the houses. But the yellow, flickering lights in the cut windows of the stone-built houses were fewer in number than the stars on a rainy night, and as he passed noiselessly like a huge, ominous black tiger through the streets where no one seemed to roam, all he could hear was the monotonous chanting of the Miroku faithful from inside the houses, and the occasional the monotonous chanting of the Miroku faithful from within the house, and the occasional, heart-rending wailing that came from somewhere else. In this part of the rid, the emptiness, as if in death, was all the more terrible and horrible because of the usual bustle. Normally, on the main street there would be a herd of newly arrived traders pulling camels, a slave woman drawing water, her breasts exposed, boiling a pot in a fountain, carrying a nobleman or a noblewoman, children like beggars crowding around the carriage carried by the slaves, begging for coins, and the poet sitting on the stone steps with a papyrus in his hand and the poet, papyrus in hand, sits on the stone steps, waiting for alms. But now that a terrible disease and a monstrosity were raging in its fury, and it had become the newest ruler of the silence, the fountain stopped flowing, the shops withdrew their wares, and the merchants bypassed the silence to go east to Lungobard or west to Frilgier. The east to Rangobard or the west to Frilgier. Moreover, it is in the twilight of ashes and purple, when the light is dim. To dare to wander in this dusk is to be a fool, a madman, or a desperate man, if not any of them, then only one kind of man, a wicked man with a bad dream in his heart. And even a blind man like the earth spirit Igurek would have known at a glance that the tall man in the deep hooded cloak, who looked as if he had come from the north, who suddenly called out from behind him on the talus street in Terid, was not one of the three types mentioned above. If he was not a silent of the cleanish sort, 
He was probably born in southern Wallachia or Ifriqia, as evidenced by his dark skin and slightly coarse black hair. His hair was tied up with a dirty leather cord and hung down over his ears, and he wore a boiled linen jacket, which might have been white, and a leather bodysuit, which was tightly laced around his torso. But the inside of the belt. However, it is not possible to tell what he is hiding inside his belt or in his right hand, which he holds casually behind his back. If you were to ask me what he resembled most, I would say it was a rat hole in a tower. He has a thin jaw, a pair of dirty teeth, a pair of narrow eyes, a weak mouth, and yet, with a piercing light in his eyes, he is trying his best to look kind and good, and is smiling with his teeth. All this the man on the other side, who had seen it all with a sharp glance from within his hood, concluded with a sarcastic grimace, that it was no doubt because he had weakened him with the weapon in his right hand as he called out to him, and had thought to renew his pocket, when he had encountered the evidence of his opponent's unexpected formidability, and had been dismayed and preoccupied. It must have been that he was taking precautions. He was a lowly villain, half snitch, half pedant, and half thief. Can I help you? The man in the hood repeated lazily and stepped towards him noiselessly. The rat-like man sniffed and stepped back again. You know where you're going if you go that way. Just thought I'd give you a heads up. That's kind of you, the hooded man said sarcastically. The thick hood and cloak make it almost impossible to tell what he even looks like, but even so, it is so out of place to have a small man with deciduous teeth worry about him and the magnificence of his physique is clearly visible even through the cloak. His shoulders were so broad that they were seldom seen even in the great games of the barbarian race of Lagan, and he had a commensurate paunch, so that he could not have been anything other than a warrior by any stretch of the imagination. This was evident from the fact that the left side of the cloak had the shape of the scabbard of a great sword protruding from it. The way it moves without making a sound reminds us of a darkness that has come to life, or a carnivorous beast such as a supersized saber-toothed tiger. At last the little man realized that he had made a terrible mistake and began to be frightened. The hooded man was well aware of the little man's embarrassment, but he did not try to save him from himself, like a tiger enjoying mauling a mouse. I haven't set foot in the Terrid neighborhood for three years now, so my memory may be fading, or it may be that Tala Street has undergone a makeover. In a low voice, with a growling crack, he admitted, So let me ask you this, where was I going to end up if I kept going like this? Where are you going, you little? He suddenly felt a faint hope that he might be able to get what he wanted by manipulating the other man, who was a provincial savage who did not know his way around. He bared his teeth and gripped the dagger he had hidden behind his back tightly. That's just a spell path for the Terid that you're too proud to mention. Terid Spellbound Alley. Hey, I don't know where you came from or when you came to Cylon, but anyone in Cylon who doesn't know about the Terrid Spell Lane is just as ignorant as the fool who doesn't know the name of the Leopard Head King of the Cylon's Obsidian Palace. Terrid's Charm Alley is said to be the only place in the Middle Plains where so many mages, sorcerers, fortune tellers, astrologers, and witches are gathered in one place, except for the horrible Crystal Palace in Peros where every single inhabitant is a mage. So, woohoo! The dagger fell from the little man's numb hand. The little man's face twisted in astonishment and pain, and he fell to his knees on the cobblestones with his wrists twisted behind his back by a huge hand from his cloak. Seeing that the customers in the hood were completely distracted by his story, he suddenly thrust at them to achieve his goal, and just as he thought that his desperate blow was deflected too easily, his five bodies were struck by an intense pain like an electric shock almost without knowing what was happening. A low, unamused laugh escaped from under his hood. The big man grabbed the rat man's wrists and neck, twisted them behind his back, lifted him up high, lowered his body carelessly on the cobblestones, and leaned his knees lightly on his back. He was taking it very easy on her, but she was screaming in pain. Bones, bones, bones. You're gonna break your wrists. He cried out in a pitiful plea. Hey, the man in the hood is fine. What's your name? I say. So why don't you loosen up a little bit? I'm not trying to be a jerk, so, give me a break. What's your name? It's called Ars. Ars the hole in the rat torque. You're a silent. 
here and there. I was born in Ifriqiya, then I came here on a boat. We've been nesting in Terid for three years now. It's been the most comfortable place to live, until now. Life and work are cut off, as it is now. No, sir. I swear to you, I'm not I'm not. Ars ranted in a pathetic voice. I say. I say. I say. Listen to me. I don't want to do this. I'm more of a tout and a patsy, he <laughs> he. I've got a great goddess, Tina. I had no choice. The goddess Tina was hit by the damn black death, and her white, milk-like limbs turned black as a mummy. So you couldn't eat, so you saddled up as a chaser. No, sir. No, you're not. I just wanted to save Tina. These days on the Terid, the only way to save yourself from the Black Death is to wrap your body in fresh, healthy human flesh, bathe the affected area in fresh, warm human blood, and then let the Black Leeches suck out all the bad blood. There's no shortage of amateur folk remedies, is there? The man in the hood murmured so low that ours could not hear him. There seemed to be a note of deep concern in his voice. Ignorant people, no matter what you tell them, will never stop believing that human flesh, especially fresh raw blood, is a cure for all diseases and has a mysterious effect. How many lives have been wasted because of this superstition? Fresh blood is really good for you. Ours argued stubbornly. And the more alive they are, the better. That's why I didn't want to do this, but I wandered out into the streets at night, casting my net. It was bad luck to bump into such a horrible man like you. Now my goddess Tina is just waiting for her body to turn black and scabby and die. If you don't let me go, there won't even be anyone to take care of that poor baby. Ours sniffed and made a mournful sound that didn't sound like empty tears. The hooded man peered at him, but he grinned back at him with a toothy grin, as if embarrassed. I think you're more suited to be a clown than a pedant. The hooded man said, shrugging his muscular shoulders. Be that as it may, I wonder, since even someone like you believes so, it must be that your delusions are spreading secretly throughout the silence. Human blood can cure the Black Death. That's right. I've heard that in the great mansions of the nobility, slaves are skinned and bled to cure their master's ills. I've heard worse stories too, that in poor families who can't afford it, Sisters are killed to cure their brother's diseases and children are killed to cure their father's. Bearer. What a terrible calamity has struck the black and gold silence. But that's only for a short time now. A painful voice came out from under his hood, as if he was gritting his teeth. He lost all interest in the little man, and when he let go of his hand, he turned to go without looking back. Ars, the whole rat torque, rubbed his numb hands and watched his broad back but suddenly, startled by what he saw, he jumped up and followed him. Wait, please, wait. You still need me. What do you want? Ours was coughing. Hey, sir, really, if we go any further, we'll end up in a dodgy terrid spell alley that's already dark in the morning or afternoon. He's not a silent, is he? Maybe. I thought so. You know, this guy's always been kind enough to tell me that Spell Alley is a real scary place. It's supposed to be just a side street, less than a hundred tarts between Talus and Bylos. But all of a sudden it became a strange street full of spells, divination, curses, witchcraft and other such practices. Even the silent guards don't want to go in there by themselves even in the daytime and no one knows what kind of shady and dangerous things are going on behind those closed doors. Or that a drunkard, after desecrating a dole, went into the spell alley, and that no matter how far he walked he could not reach the end of the street of a hundred tar, and that he fell down and died like a weary horse. And he died like a tired horse. Anyway, that place is really a dangerous place. And when there is such a stench of death all over the town, approaching such a place is like going crazy, sir. I appreciate the advice. The hooded man said, peeking beneath his cloak and holding out something. Ars recoiled in horror, but when he saw that it was a gold coin of one run engraved with the profile of Achilles the Great, he rolled up his eyes and clutched the edge of the coin suspiciously. It's real. 
He muttered in horror and looked up at the huge shadow with his eyes rolled back. You're not going to Magical Alley, are you? In his own way, he felt compelled to thank him, and with a breath that smelled of Vasha, he advised him again. The hooded man laughed lowly. I wish I could, too, but I have to go, Ars. Why, sir? Why did you go to that horrible place? The man in the hood did not answer. He walked toward the entrance of the alley, which was not marked with a sign of a magic alley, nor was the row of houses different from those of other places, but was strangely dark with smoke and shadows, and filled with anxiety that strangely made the viewer's heart grow cold. Ars was about to continue his inquiry. At that moment, as if a long and slender creature called a magic alley were conspiring against the hooded man, a gust of wind suddenly and without warning blew from the alley and swept his thick hood off behind him. As soon as he saw it, R slumped down to the cobblestones without making a sound. His eyes widened in surprise and fear of seeing something he should not have seen, and he slumped back as if he had lost his mind, staring at what appeared from the hood with his mouth open. It wasn't a man. No, not even the world's usual demons. Ah, ah! R stammered. The man whose hood was snatched by the breeze as if it were a live alleyway looked down at it with a bitter smile. There is nothing unusual about the man from the neck down, with his cloak thrown off carelessly. Only that it is a form of an exceptional warrior, frighteningly strong and splendid, leaning on muscles so developed and full that they are rare even in this age, as if the image of the god of war lure had risen from the dead. His physique, which even the most discerning warrior could not help but admire with bated breath, is covered with a magnificent and opulent accoutrement that accentuates it even more. A jet-black, well-trained warrior's armor that is not overly ornate, but beautiful enough. It is not a formal warrior's armor, but rather a simplified, light-armored body armor that allows the wearer to move lightly. At the waist, protected by its four halves, is a large sword with a magnificent inlaid hilt that would be too heavy for a normal man to carry. The foot pegs, made of black leather and tightly clasped to the thighs, the light, sturdy, riveted boots that protect the knees, and the chain-knit cuirass. On the belt hangs a soft leather bag containing the necessary items. It was immediately apparent that all of the accoutrements were of the highest quality and value. But it was not even all those things that appeared from beneath the cloak that astonished Ars. Ars eyes were absorbed in the face that appeared from the man's hood, and he could not even blink, as if he was under the curse of Sido, who could not look away even if he wanted to. He was dumbfounded by the bizarre and unbelievable wonder. It's. A warrior's face emerges from beneath his hood. It was that of a huge living leopard. It is not a mask resembling a leopard, nor is it a stuffed animal that has been falsely attached. This is evident from the eyes that shine brightly beneath the round ears, emitting a magnificent yellow light that can only be seen in wild beasts and freezing the viewer. It was a strange creature, half man, half beast. It looked as if it had emerged from a myth, and was so strange and majestic, and so strange that it seemed to have no sense of loveliness. Ars, who had been gazing at the strange creature, finally let out a faint, horrified voice. Oh Yuri. Your. Yellow eyes looked down at Ars. The leopard's eyes burned like phosphorescence in the violet darkness of twilight. Ars cried out in a voice numb with fear and awe. The leopard-headed king of Chironia. The leopard king didn't want to answer. In any case, even the most ignorant of people could recognize him at a glance, for he knew that it would be useless to conceal or say anything at all now that he had been seen. Downtown Silen, Talus Street in Terid, and the mysterious Spell Alley, that night, hovering in the mists of the dead, was silent, still, even breathless, as if nodding before its own ruler, who stood there haphazardly. The round eyes of ours, the whole mouse torque, have never been able to get rid of the ridiculous deformity that is the other side, ever since he learned what the big man was that he happened to meet in the town at night. Not a day goes by that a silent cave rat doesn't hear the name of Gwyn, the leopard-head king of Chironia. There are all sorts of sorts of squires among the rulers of a land, but the strange and mysterious character of the literal squires, the fabled and strange story told by the Kithra player of their rise to the throne of Chironia, 
and the rumors of their incredible valor and wisdom, make Gwyn the leopard-headed king of Chironia a name to be reckoned with. No other ruler was more revered from the day he became king than Gwyn, who was a living myth. No one knows where or what fate befell this deformed man until he appeared alone in the Chironian capital, Cylon, less than ten years ago, and entered the annals of Chironian history as a mercenary for the Cylonian black dragon general, Darcius. On the contrary, in his first battle as a mercenary wearing the armor of Chironia, he became the tenth dragon chief, and in the next battle he was appointed the hundredth dragon chief. This exceptional warrior lost his birth, the story of his strange appearance, and all his memories, and finally drifted to Chironia in search of his lost self. He had finally drifted to Chironia in search of his lost self. But he could not find it, at least not yet. During the two terrible border battles, the fierce expedition to Eulania, and the long and difficult adventure in search of the kidnapped Princess Sylvia, he was appointed as the Black Dragon General of the Obsidian Palace. In the course of his long and difficult adventures in search of the abducted Princess Sylvia, he was appointed as the Black Dragon General of the Obsidian Palace and replaced Darcius, and as the commander among the generals, his name as the leopard-headed general of Chironia became famous all over the Middle Plains, and finally he obtained the Princess Sylvia, became the son-in-law of Achilles the Great, and ascended the throne of Chironia. The only mystery he is searching for is his own. But except for that one thing, he now has everything. No one knows his true age, for his birth is unknown, but there are even rumors in silent circles that he is immortal, for his huge frame, soft and steel, has the vigor and resilience of a young man, and has not grown old in nearly ten years. As the silence knelt before him, there were some who were secretly hostile, wondering if the obsidian palace had a demon on its throne because of his disfigurement and the fact that even his birth was unknown. Gwyn the leopard-headed king, while still alive, was already more than half deified and had become a legend. All these things came at once, without context, into the mind of ours, the cave rat who remained slumped over. Facing the living legend so closely, in the dark of night, with no one else around, was a terrifying experience that filled him with awe. The leopard-headed king had seen the fear in ours. It was all too common for the king to frighten and awe people with his deformity and majesty. Instead of trying to soothe the pedant's emotions by speaking to him, the king slowly pulled back his hood, hemmed his cloak, and began to walk toward the spell path. At that moment, our spell was finally broken. At the same time, a feeling of compassion befitting a loyal silent citizen welled up in his chest, making him jump involuntarily. Please wait. You do not know how to speak to the king of a country, but you speak to him with the utmost respect and politeness. Please wait. Leopard's head, uh, I don't think his majesty the king intends to go to magical lane, even after all this. I have to go, ours. Gwyn answered simply, not bothering to explain the intricacies of the situation to the little villain he had just happened to bump into. R shuddered. That place is not a place for a person like you to enter alone. Don't worry. You know me only as the leopard-headed king of Chironia. But I have traveled the world alone and fought in the temples of Dor himself. That's true, of course, but if anything were to happen to you now, wouldn't Chironia be completely helpless with that, your majesty? It's all right. It is only to save the silence from the Black Death that I am going to see the Sorcerer of Enchantment Alley. I've seen him before. Don't worry. I'm worried about you, sir, he said stubbornly. He is a man of lowly birth, not of right mind and not of strong temperament, and that is why he is also known as the whole Rat Torek. The majesty and power of the leopard-headed king was transmitted even to R's weak heart, and made him feel as if he had to show some kind of loyalty for the king. Though Gwyn himself did not know whether he was aware of it or not, since long ago, when he was still but a mere ruffian who had wandered aimlessly into the frontier, this unremarkable quality of his that moved men, that made even a mere stranger feel that he must give him strength, was the very thing that made him nothing less than a born champion. It is this mysterious effect that makes even a mere casual observer feel that he must be given power for his sake, and this above all is what makes him nothing but a born champion. Well, King, if there's anything I can do, 
If you'd like me to call someone from the Obsidian Palace, just say so. Thank you, Ars. The Leopard King said gravely. But it's not necessary. I've told Hazos, the Marquis of Langobard, everything I need to know and I have to do this alone. Don't worry, if I can find out the reason for the black death fog that surrounds the silence and root it out, the silent night will dawn, the winds of death will blow away, and your beloved goddess Tina will smile again. As king of Chironia, I promise you this, citizen of Silen. And what a waste, what a waste, what a waste of me. R stuttered and shouted, shaking his head. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to go. Ah, the mages of the Obsidian Palace are useless. Some years ago I asked a mage who betrayed Dole, a man named Eulatia, to tell me a fortune and got good results. Now that I've run out of ideas, I remember the black magician who was betrayed by him, but this man is morbidly afraid of the reach of Dole's followers, and will never appear before ordinary people, nor will he come to me in response to my request. No matter what, I have no choice but to go alone to the house of Eulatia in the Alley of Magic. Eulatia! R shouted, shaking, and rushed to cut off Janus' mark, showing that he was more than a little well informed. Then the king will go to Eulatia, the man chased by the doll. No, that's outrageous, this is getting more and more unacceptable. Don't be afraid. You think I'm afraid of a doll? The leopard headed king laughed with a barking voice. And then, as if the king of hell had heard his insolent words, a gust of wind came from nowhere and again, rolling up the king's recovered hood and revealing his leopard face. As if Dole, the champion of the seven hells and Hades, the disobedient son of Janus, the ruler of all sin and immorality, had wished to gaze upon the strange face in order to remember it well. He, Ars groaned, covered his head, and seemed to hesitate to flee at once between the stone houses, but then he turned and looked up at the majestic leopard's head with a strange, enraptured, and admiring gaze, which, no matter how many times he saw it, always filled him with awe and wonder. I see, I've heard rumors, but this leopard-head king might be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the doll himself. He murmurs lowly, and then suddenly nods. Thank you. I won't stop you now. Let's go. What? This time the leopard-headed king was surprised. Seeing the king's astonishment, who was rarely moved by anything, Ars felt good. Now, you're going to Yalatia's house, aren't you? I'll show you. Come on. Hey. The king was about to say something. Ars spat out the vatch of fruit he was chewing on onto the pavement. Ars the rat truck is a bit of a face in the enchantment alley. And to save the pretty goddess Tina. You'll never make it through the spell alley without me, my king. With your conspicuous guttural voice and your figure, you'll be stuck in the clutches of the scoundrels before you can take a step. I used to tout card readings for gypsy girls in the spell alley before Tina and I got together. At that time, I learned some spells by imitation, and I will take you to Yolacia's house and back to the end of Talis Street. Gwyn was about to say something, but when he saw the little villain's toothy grin, he silently put his hood back on. Come on, let's go. He walks off at Ars urging. But he was not to be caught unawares, for he saw that the little man had taken a prayer string from a closet and had tied it round his arm in a strange manner. It could be taken as a curse or bad luck charm to enter the magic alley, but it could also be taken as a secret sign of friendship or a code. The leopard-headed warrior with his hood pulled down deep and the small man with the buck tooths stood shoulder to shoulder, their footsteps echoing on the cobblestones as they stepped onto the dreaded spell path that had given the raid its name. As soon as they passed through the entrance of the alley, which at first glance seemed to be no different from many other similar side streets, they both looked at each other as they heard the sound of rude laughter like that of hyenas somewhere in the distance. It sounded like the laughter of a huge, gloomy spider shouting with delight at the fact that its prey had been caught in its web at the first touch of its wings. It was a laugh that could have come from the depths of the earth, or from above, or from the depths of some house, or from any place. Doll, you'll believe I'm in his hands again, and you'll laugh with joy at that. The leopard-headed king muttered in a low voice, so as not to arouse Ars' fear. But Ars. Hey, king. He slips fearfully into his cloak and whispers as he gazes around. 
As I'm sure you're aware, there's been a lot of laughter around the silence lately. A laugh. Like now. It's just like that. There's a man who laughs like a hyena who feeds on the dead, not at night, not during the day, not from afar on the wind, not from beneath my feet where I'm standing. As if the silence misfortune were a delicious fruit wine to him. That's why rumors began to circulate that the silence were enchanted by the doll. I've heard that the silence are riddled with monsters, but, the leopard-headed king murmured in a somber voice. Ours looked around more and more. Weird. It's nothing like a monster. A baby goes missing in the middle of the day, a small glass bottle comes dancing after people with a big face, a herd of horses runs through the street, you think it's a militia, but when you go out, there's nothing. When I went out, I thought it was the militia, but there was nothing there, and the sound of hoofbeats was always the only sound in the next street. He stopped suddenly and jumped up. The fog had not only grown thicker, but it had also begun to cling strangely to the cobblestones, and there was something living that had suddenly crossed the narrow alleyway near their feet. It gazed at them stupidly with eyes that burned like fire, and quickly disappeared under the opposite door, but it was neither Torek nor Cat, nor did it seem to be any small animal on earth. If anything, it seemed to have the body of a lizard with the fur of a tork. What horrified ours, however, was that these black, hairy creatures, with their eyes blazing like fire, looked at them with clear thought and intelligence. Oh, my God, what is that? Some sort of messenger or composite creature. It's not uncommon in Spell Alley, Gwyn replies calmly. It's disgusting, really. Hey, King. Yeah. I can't help thinking that I've heard a baby crying somewhere since I came in here. Is it my imagination? There may have been tens of thousands of sacrifices slaughtered here behind those doors over the years. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what happened. Besides, it's so much hotter here than on Tala Street, and the air is so sticky, it's like I'm in jelly. Protect me, Janice, for this is a terrible place, my king. It didn't need ours to tell him that he had felt Gwyn's keen senses from the moment he stepped into the magical alley. It appears to be nothing more than a series of low, stone-built, low-roofed shanty houses standing close to each other, a common sight in downtown Silen. Some of the houses are badly disintegrated, others are infested with strange withered and shriveled grasses under the eaves, and others look strangely old and unsuitable to be there, but in general there is nothing unusual about them. And only the fact that many of the houses have runes softly carved or inlaid on their stone or oak doors, or hang signs for fortune-telling under their eaves more imposingly, reveals the livelihood of the inhabitants of this alley. Next to the old black picture of gypsy fortune-telling there was a shining sign of astrology, and next to it the house of a Miroku priest, known as such by the three copper spheres he hung, and beyond that a sorcerer with a degraded skeleton on his head had a shop. But when one entered the alley, the shop seemed to go on and on, perhaps for two or even more tens of thousands of yards, and even beyond that they seemed to be distorted and lost in the mist. It made those who stepped into the path think that it might have gone on forever. From inside the houses, there seemed to be a secret creeping voice that went on forever, and there was a strange, disgusting smell in some of the houses, as if some kind of medicine was being smoked inside, and from inside other houses, there were many eyes that were neither human nor animal, glowing green and looking out at you. And in another house, a number of eyes, neither human nor animal, glowed green and looked out. Strange to say, it was already night, and the fog was growing deeper, and there was not a single street lamp to shine out in the uninviting alley, and yet, though it was not bright, but the color of utter darkness, the houses and their signs were not shining but the houses and their signs are not shining with light, but they are clearly visible to their eyes, and strangely enough, they have the appearance of being both far and near, which is difficult to grasp. It was just like wandering in a deep dream and not being able to wake up. When Ars looked up, he saw that the hood had been completely removed from the head of the leopard-headed king, who was walking fearlessly ahead of him, and the sight of him made him feel even more like he was in a nightmare. There was no one else passing by, and yet there were occasional footsteps. There was no apparition to be seen, 
and yet there was a deep anxiety and fear that they had come so near to the realm of the strange and the strange that they could not stay any longer. In this world, time flowed differently than in the outside world, and good and evil, life and death, had different meanings and forms than in the outside world. Ars, realizing this, touched the prayer string on his arm and murmured the merciful name of Janus. A moment later, the screams that chilled the hearts of all who heard them rang out through the sticky night darkness of the magic alley. The king and Ars had no time to brace themselves. The door of the quiet house on the right, which seemed to be uninhabited, opened, and a figure stumbled out. With eyes wide with astonishment, the two intruders saw that it was a young, dark-skinned girl, almost naked. Her eyes were bloodshot, her long hair was matted, and her face was drawn with fear. She saw them standing there, and suddenly, without looking at ours, she clung to Gwyn's waist and squirmed. Help! He's gonna skin me! Oh, my God! She sobbed and screamed. Ours was so surprised that he couldn't speak at the moment. Terid's magic alley is a place where even the most bizarre things are commonplace. It is no wonder that Ars saw the naked girl who suddenly appeared there as not so much a flesh and blood human being, but rather a monstrous phantom who was pretending to be one, or perhaps as part of a deeper plot to slaughter them all. However, the dark-skinned girl, who came running out with a scream, did not seem to have a clue why the two were there, nor did she seem to have a clue that one of them was a leopard-headed half-breed who was not human from the neck up, and who would surprise anyone who took a glance at him. Her eyes were wide with fear as she gazed towards the doorway from which she had escaped. A feeble cry escaped from her mouth. Oh, please. Please help me. He clutched Gwyn's shoulders and ranted as he tried to shield him between himself and the doorway. Don't be fooled, my king. I don't know what this bitch is made of. Before you know it, you'll hear a ghastly moaning sound that will make you want to cover your ears from the blistering darkness behind the door she just came out of. It was as if it had been crushed by a living darkness. Ah! Oh. She put her hands to her ears, tried not to hear, and squirmed. Her bare, smooth, warm skin was rubbed against the king's body. I think Dwella's been hit. She screamed in despair. She sacrificed us to feed the insatiable appetites of the darkest life that ever lived. Oh, no. Help me. It's coming after me. If you can't save me, then kill me before it catches me in its hands and carries me away in its mouth. I don't know what kind of disgusting creatures Arachne keeps, but I don't think we should give up hope so easily while we're still alive. The Leopard King said as if to say. Ours jumped up and down. Don't be fooled. You don't know if that bitch is really what she pretends to be. This is a spell path. Don't worry. I've been the only one to go down into the doll world, so I have a good nose for demons. This girl's skin smells only of a healthy human. Ha! R said, with sufficient disbelief. But soon. Whoa! Something's coming out. He let out a horrible cry and ran out of that dreadful doorway. That's it. The daughter's eyes were wide and white with fear. She clung madly to the king's waist, so terrified that she forgot that she was wearing nothing at all. Whoa, what the hell is that? Ars cries out and rushes to Gwyn's back. Gwyn, shielded by the two frightened men and women, kept his eyes alert and prepared to draw the sword at his hip at any moment. A low, leopard-like roar rumbles from his throat. It smells like a monster. He mumbled something that made my hair stand on end. Looks like Arachne has one hell of a thing going on. Help me. Help me. In a fit of madness, she screamed, turned her head back to avoid seeing what was emerging from the dark doorway, and tried to run away at a run. Gwyn's quick hand suddenly snatched the long, tangled hair and held it back. No. Stay here. You're safest here, behind me. If you're not safe here, you're not safe anywhere. How confident I am. Although she was frightened, she really seemed to be neither shy nor quiet. Suddenly the king's calm words seemed to restore his true character. Who the hell are you to say you're not afraid of monsters? He teased her, but then again, she remembered the situation she was in and stuffed her hand in her mouth. It's coming out. From within the dark doorway, a gentle rustling sound could be heard, 
as if a great many leaves or dead grass were rubbing against each other, and it was getting closer and closer. And then there was a strange, indescribably unpleasant smell, a painful moaning that could not be described as the groaning of the souls of the damned or the curses of those in dire agony. The sound of the strange illusion of Sawa Sawa is becoming clearer and clearer, and now the body of the creature is just revealing its whole body from the doorway of Arachne. Gwyn stood behind them and drew his sword, glaring at them. The first thing I saw was the strangest thing in the world. In the darkness, floating in the air, the head of a miserable woman, her hair disheveled, her mouth hung up in a bloody smile. Against a strangely weighty dark background, the neck has no part below the shoulders, and the reddish-brown hair stands upside down, as if it were a hokey star in the shape of a woman's neck, with a tail of hair. As the three of them gasped in surprise, something even more bizarre happened. On the woman's neck, the darkness opened her eyes with a snap. Just above the woman's head, the grotesque magnification of the woman's eyes staring at us, two eyes with red, raised, flickering flames like a shadowy fire, opened up and stared at us grimly. Ours felt sick. But even more than that, the inhuman hostility, the coldness, the monstrous lust that lurked in that ghastly gaze, that no creature on earth could possibly understand or resist, was too much for the weak heart of the little villain to bear instinctively. The weak heart of the little scoundrel instinctively could no longer endure it. A ah! I could hear her groaning in horror and disgust. Oh, that's, that's Arachne's head. She screamed and clung to Gwyn with one hand, hiding her face behind his back, while she raised one hand and pointed to the woman's head in the air beneath her glowing red dark eyes. What a mess. The monster I summoned has eaten Arakun and my own personal history. Don't look. Keep a firm grip on my cloak, Gwyn said, and gripped the great sword firmly in his strong arms. With his red eyes fixed on him, slowly, the darkness moved. The sound of dead grass rubbing against each other was becoming more and more deafening, and darkness was beginning to ooze out of the doorway. The woman's head, clinging to her red eyes, was also approaching. And just when I thought. Arachnid spiders. Amidst the high-pitched screams of terror from her daughter, the monster finally revealed its nightmare form on the street. It was an indescribably horrible creature, a huge round creature with dense black bristles all over its body, and a spider's face with glowing red eyes and a long beak was placed in the middle of its round, swollen body. It looked as if it were a monster with a woman's face, because it was holding the raw head of Arachne. From the side of its black, puffy body, it had long legs that rose upward, six on each side, and when it moved its many legs quickly, it made a crunching sound like dead leaves brushing against each other. As the spider of Arachne and her daughter said, the most similar form was that of the dreaded hawk spider, and that alone, as a creature under the dominion of the demon Dole, was more than enough to arouse the instinctive dislike and antipathy of mortals. And yet it was more than enough to stir up man's instinctive disgust and antipathy. Even ours, the man, could not help vomiting and screaming at the sight of it licking its beak in a disgusting, sullen gesture. Arachne kept a secret from me and Dwella that he had somehow summoned from Hades in a deep underground dungeon. Arachne's fortune-telling was reputed to be accurate, and it was said that those cursed by Arachne would die horrible deaths if they gave her money. That's because Arachne used to send it to haunt him at night. But for the past few months, with the Black Death, there have been no customers to ask for a curse. Because death, which is far more certain than a curse, fills the town every morning and evening. That's why it was hungry to death. And Arachne wanted to trick me and Dwella, who had done so much for her, into letting her feed on us in the stone cell. She whispered quickly, with a hint of trembling. But it's got Arachne on the other side. Oh, my God. What a horrible fate. If you think so, how dare you drag us into this? R shouted, trying to hold back the disgust in his chest, but just then. Stay back. Gwyn screamed and pushed them away without looking. The giant spider, its beak revealing the vestiges of a female sorceress, did not care that its envious head rolled across the cobblestones as it charged without warning at its new and lively prey. Caw! In the midst of his daughter's screams and our screams, Gwyn held up his great sword and threw it to the side with all his might. But the demon ducked with unusual swiftness, 
and the leopard man's sword merely cut off two of the goshawk's legs. Perhaps the spider felt no pain. Only that its red eyes blazed with a primordial rage that was all the more frenzied at being hurt, and instead of flinching, it opened its beak and made a high, monstrous cry. Meanwhile, on the cobblestones, the two hairy legs that Gwyn had cut off were flailing about as if they were one living thing in themselves, and their struggles showed no sign of abating. Gwyn, as expected, wrinkled his nose, bristled his fur and growled in annoyance. A violently cut-off leg sprang up at the tip of her nose, and she fell back, sniffling. My daughter and ours also backed away as if they were being pushed. If you cut it, it's a stain on the sword. We should run, my king. It's for the best. Ars rasps as he cuts the sign of Janus. No, my daughter screamed in desperation. You don't know anything about it. This is a spell alley where each door is like a separate ward. They won't open a door unless the owner wants them to, so this spider is no threat to them. So it's just us who have to suffer your maki zoe and be eaten by it here. Ars gets mad and yells at her. She didn't even listen. Oh, no. They wrung their hands and screamed in despair. The great spider threatens them again with a shrinking of its legs and a widening and closing of its beak. Dwella tried to protect me with her knife, but the blade wouldn't even go through that body. Oh, doll. He must be immortal. You'd have to hold your breath to know if that's true. With a cry, Gwyn jumped up like a leopard and did not even wait for the next attack of the giant spider. He raises his sword and aims it sharply at the spider's glowing red eye. His aim was right and the sword pierced the spider's eye. With his sword drawn, Gwyn leaps aside, and with his next thrust, he pierces the remaining eye. The great spider gave a high-pitched cry. The specter did not seem to be bothered by having up to two legs cut off, but it was indeed a terrible blow to have both eyesight taken away, and it began to flap its legs and struggle like a madman. The rage and the pain of the wounded life of the dark and dreadful darkness, which is not of this world known to man, came upon them in invisible waves, and struck them fiercely and drove them back. But the great spider showed no sign of weakening, even though he had lost his eyes. Rather, he became even more frenzied, literally flailing about in a blind frenzy. Unable to resist its mad movements, Gwyn and his two companions desperately dodged from the legs that were stretching out in search of sacrifice. They were caught in its dense black hairy legs, but in the end they were drawn inevitably to its snapping, flapping, blood-sucking beak, and would meet the same fate as the spider-wielder's raw head lying there. E.I., you doll monster. Gwyn cries out and leaps to his death with his daughter and ours at his heels. A short cry of horror escaped from his mouth as he tried to stifle his instinctive disgust and thrust his sword as hard as he could at the flailing spider. The sword will not pierce. The black chitinous body was made of steel, and it repelled Gwyn's sword with all its strength, and if it was not a well-honed sword, the sword would have been broken. Ei, shit. Gwyn immediately puts his sword back on his belt and opens his hands, saying that he will use his unrivaled strength to fight. But. No. No, don't touch that. There's poison on the end of that hair. He hears his daughter screaming and jumps out of the way. So you're out of your depth. We have no choice but to flee. Ars pulled Gwyn's hand. Well, it looks like it. Gwyn stalked back, not taking his eyes off the raging movement of the infernal creature. Run away for now. The warding of the spell path has made him immortal so if we go out into the normal world. Before they could even say anything, the three of them were running like crazy. Ours and the girl are both fast. Fear made them agile, and they ran without looking back, but when ours turned, he saw them. Wow, they're chasing us. No, you can't go on. Their daughter's high-pitched scream also rang out. It was as if their feet had fallen prey to the schemes of the dole who had laughed at them earlier and when they ran between the houses and the blind alley they felt no hindrance, but when they tried to run out of the alley that guaranteed them life and safety, something held them back. It seems so obvious, but you just can't get there. It's the curse of the doll. Ars cried out. Oh, it's catching up. Gwyn draws his sword again, and prepares to turn around, 
hoping to diminish their fighting power at any cost, even if his blade is not intact. The spider is shouting in anger and is about to attack them. Come here. A supple black hand suddenly broke through the doll's ward and reached out from behind, grabbing Gwyn's arm. Gwyn, so keen and agile, could not sense a single sign until he was grabbed. The leopard, struck dumb with astonishment, raised his sword and the other hand latched onto it, and a hot voice rang out in his ear. No, that spider won't be killed by a man's sword. Come on, come on. Wait, I have company. Something like that. The owner of the muffled voice clicked his tongue, but when he saw that Gwyn would not budge in the face of the approaching blind spider. Come in, come in, I'll open my door for you for two seconds. At the same time that he pulled Gwyn backward, a black hole suddenly appeared in the stone wall where they had been trapped. At the same time, Baruz and his daughter, who had been screaming, were pulled hard by a hand that came out of nowhere, and before they could scream, they were sucked into the suddenly opened entrance to another dimension. Seeing this, Gwyn also followed his hand's lead. However, he did not forget his fear that this was another trick of the devil, and he still held the greatsword firmly in his hand. The three of them were sucked into the blackness in a truly awkward moment. At the same time the toe of a spider grazed their skin, and Ars's hand was blistered, but they heard the inarticulate voice of the monster, knowing that it had lost its prey, and its fury shook their bodies in waves, and their eyes narrowed in the midst of it, and the darkness grew smaller and smaller. And at last the hole is gone. All that remained was a long, crumbling stone wall, which had never been opened or had any entrance. On the other hand, when Gwyn and the other three were sucked into the hole, they felt a strange and unpleasant sensation of falling. It's going down. My daughter screamed. Oh, Janice. I escaped from a spider and got stuck in a living wall. The voice of Ars's grief was heard in their ears, and after a time of seemingly endless anxiety, which seemed to be going down and up, the bodies of the three of them suddenly fell to the bottom. The shock of the crash was almost imperceptible, as if there was life in the air around them, rather than an invisible hand, which took them in and set them down gently. However, the fact that the area around them was so dark that they could not tell even if their noses were pinched, and that there was no sign of anything living, stirred up anxiety and fear, as if they had been blinded like the spider earlier. Hey, you okay? Gwyn ranted. He couldn't grasp the distance or anything at all, it was as if all his senses had been stuffed with black cotton. That's when it happened, before either of them could respond in a huff. Don't worry. I'll turn on the light now. A kind, familiar throaty voice rang out as if the darkness itself had spoken. Wow. Arza's frightened voice and her daughter's sobbing tell her that they are safe, but even then, it's hard to tell if they are close or far away. As the three of them wait in the dark, each with their own fears. E.I., damn it, did this candle come out of a doll's ass? It's never gonna light. Again, I heard the unidentified voice from before, foul mouthed and abusive. What a pain in the ass. Stubborn candle, you're more afraid of your master's doll than this Tamiya curse, aren't you? Now watch me, watch Tamiya's curse. Or, yes, just be quiet and do as you're told. Before the voice had finished, a pale, ghostly light appeared at a point in the darkness, and it grew larger as it went on. However, there was no glare or heat in the light, but only a pale glow on all sides, as if it were the guiding hand of the spirit world. The three of them huddled together, gasping for breath at the rash of apparitions. All right, all right, you can see now. Tamiya is the only master in her house. That messenger of Arachne's will never get in. A rather shrill voice said, and the owner of the voice suddenly revealed himself in a pale light. And so they knew themselves to be the guests of Tamiya the Black Witch. There, standing there with her hands on her hips and her piercing eyes staring at the three of them, was a figure that bore no resemblance to whatever kind of demoness the three of them had associated with that voice. The pale lights of the apparition world illuminated a buxom, cheerful, black-skinned Landurgian woman with skin as black as cocktan. Nothing was blacker than the darkness that formed her background, nothing was whiter than her bared teeth, 
and nothing was more incendiary than the clothes she wore. On her black body, which shone as brightly as if it had been oiled, the witch Tamiya wore only a suspicious brocade sash, a slinky skirt, and a jewel-encrusted breastplate that encircled her two heaving breasts. And the jeweled ornaments in her shining hair, on her wrists, on her ankles, even on her shapely navel and around the middle of her forehead, which made her look like a woman who had taken a piece of the night sky it made her look like a woman who had cut out a part of the night sky. When she moved, her firm, cannonball-like breasts shook in fright, and when she looked at something, her plump hips undulated like black waves. Her face, too, was that of a very pure black race, found only in the southernmost Landergear or Friantia. The shining white eyes are large, move well, and are full of expression. The big fat lips and the crouched nose reminded me of the wooden dolls of Landargia or the frogs of the steppes of care, but it was not that Tamiya was ugly. Rather, she is beautiful in her own way, and at any rate, her overwhelming luster and fullness, mixed with a strangely cheerful sense of cruelty, make men feel as if she were a goddess of fertility, and even a woman among women. R's eyes were drawn to her, and Tamiya knew it, and made the spot where R's eyes were staring at her waver expertly each time. A mocking laugh bubbled up in her hot lips. The slave girl of Arachne, who had seemed so beautiful and well-proportioned when she had first appeared before the witch Tamiya, began to look like a skinny little girl with no charm and no personality. Tamiya, who wore many ornaments and a skirt of overgrown silk, looked even more bald than Tamiya, who wore nothing on her slim body except her long hair. There was a secret hostility in her eyes as she gazed at Tamiya. Tamiya may or may not have noticed this, but she put her hands on her hips and kept her cone-shaped black breasts bared even more. Anyway, you're Tamiya's guests for the night. Sit down, the drinkers and the eaters are on their way here. Sit down and introduce yourselves anyway, in Tamiya the Black Witch's house, no one who doesn't have a name can sit in my wicker chair. Oh, no. His white teeth appeared and he smiled. You're all right, Leopard Head Gwyn. You're the only man in the world who could mistake you for someone else. That little guy over there, that's you. I'm Ars, the whole rat, the torque. Ars is gazing at Tamiya's breasts and vaguely. I'm Varousa. I'm a dancer from Arachne, she said, somewhat angrily. The silence of the other three had a certain significance, and Tamiya's ugly, yet strangely beautiful face had a clearer tinge of mockery. They knew well what it was to be a dancer in a magic alley. Varousa noticed the silence, and the blood rushed to her dark cheeks. But she showed no sign of distress, and though she was completely naked, she sat in her chair, leaning her head back as if she were in a silk dress. That Arachne is apparently dead, too, and this time she's in the hell of the doll that she sent so many of her customers to. Tamiya laughed in a hushed voice. It was a voice like that of a demoness tens of thousands of years old, the only thing unlike this buxom black woman. You're not much of a witch or a sorceress, and you're summoning creatures of the dark, and using them for your own purposes, and we said you'd end up like that. Arachne the spider will be dead when she's nothing but a head. Oh, here's your drink. Tamiya raised the white, black woman's hand in her palm and made a strange gesture. The three guests looked at each other. For when Tamiya's hands clasped the top of the table, a silver cup, a jar with a silver handle, and a basket full of strange-looking fruit suddenly appeared in the empty space, and clothed the table with a big face, as if they had been there from the beginning. With a snap of Tamiya's fingers, the silver jar flew open, poured its contents graciously into the three silver cups, and then settled back into place. The silver cup then slipped into the hands of each of the three men, with a careful but impersonal gesture, as if to say, take it and drink it quickly, so as not to spill the red liquor that filled it. Whoa, he said vaguely, as if he had lost the power to be frightened at the sight of this apparition. This cup is alive. In Tamiya's house, Tamiya is the only one who knows. Tamiya's toys are very well trained, says the witch proudly. Ars creepily withdraws her hand from the silver cup that's slipping away. Mr. King, is it possible to drink wine poured from a living jar into a living silver cup? I don't think it's for my taste. 
but it's still wine. Even if it's from the tomb of an ancient king, the wine of Hades that was prepared for his funeral, Gwyn said without any sign of fear, and took up his cup to drink. Ours did the same with trepidation. Soon a silver jar flew out and filled the cup. The red wine was perfumed and mellow, but a musty odor also lingered in the nose, leaving a bitter aftertaste on the tongue. Varousid did not touch it. Oh, I drank, I drank. Tamia, who had been watching Gwyn carefully, clasped her hands together in a fit of giggles. I'm glad you've accepted Tamia's hospitality. Aren't you hungry? How about a baked and flavored leg of lamb? Or kneaded bread? If you're tired, I'll wash your feet and anoint them with oil. No. The leopard king pretends to be ahead. I'm not hungry, he said gravely, looking around. You want to see Tamiya's house? Then I'll show you. It's a candle. When Tamiya raised her hand, the same pale, resentful lights that had been the only lights in the ghost world appeared in the four corners and lit up the witch's dwelling. Both Ars and Velusa looked at it curiously. It was hard to believe that it was the same spell alley. For, while the houses in the spell alley were nothing more than the low, stone-piled, window-hewn, Chironian style of the lower town of the Rid, those inside had high ceilings, as if they had been carved out of the inside of a deep mountain cave. The ceiling was so high that it looked as if it had been carved out of a deep mountain cave. The witch sat cross-legged beneath her sheer skirt, looking at them with half-lidded eyes. The witch wore a southern-style wicker table, and the same was served to the guests. The four sides of the cave are strangely obscured by the pale blue light. There were many strange things hanging from the ceiling, most of which seemed to be herbs that had been picked up and dodged, or the carcasses of animals that had been picked up, or prayer strings or the skins of snakes, but there were also things hanging in between that could not be explained in any way. If you look carefully, you can see that the tentacles are moving upwards, twisting and turning without any wind, or entangling themselves in the bundle of herbs next to them, and coming down again. It was not a pleasant thing to have such things above his head, and he wrenched his neck and fumbled with the prayer cord. The four walls seemed to be lined with prayer wheels, spell boards, skulls, and all sorts of other incomprehensible things. Suddenly, R shrank back to his feet in dismay. This was because, as the blue-white light illuminated, he saw that the rocks beneath his feet were not what they seemed to be, but that water was trickling through them, and that there were countless other strange things, such as deformed frogs and albino fish, moving about in the water. While Ars and Velusa were looking around, completely distracted by the specter of this uncanny dwelling, the leopard-headed king had finished his second glass of wine and was talking to the witch. Thanks to you, I've been saved but that sorceress Arachne has turned that spider into a spellbreaker. It's not easy. Nothing is too much trouble for you, my king. Tamiya laughs in a hushed voice. He'll roam the Arachne dimension forever, and if he's lucky, he'll even get out, but mostly he'll just die of hunger. These creatures of the dark have no wisdom or thought whatsoever. It's like an Arachne dimension. That's right. The time you came into the alley and the time the girl broke Arachne's seal happened to coincide at nightfall, so you were in Arachne's ward. You couldn't go out to the Terid, and you couldn't find a single person in the magic alley, which is always crowded. Are you saying there is another spell path than the one we were on? A spell alley, my king, is a kind of boulevard. It's open to everyone, but it doesn't belong to anyone. In order for the mages who gathered there at the beginning to be able to come and go without damaging each other's wards, they decided on this street as a common ward and then added their own wards on top of it. That's a strange thing to hear. The leopard king said and put his hand on his chin. So you're saying that this alley is like a portal to all dimensions? Rather than that, there are as many spell paths as there are mages, you know. Tamiya looked at the king with a lustrous smile. And that one of them, of course, is the witch Tamias. Other than that, you have the spell alley of reality. Reality. Everything is real. Tamia laughed. You've just drunk the dark wine and you're sitting on Tamia's wicker chair, so you know that our magic is not blindness, hallucination, or hypnosis. Sake taken from the air will make you thirsty and roasted meat from the air will make you hungry. 
Are you saying that one of these things is real and the rest are just dreams? Tamiya made a gesture. At once, Tamiya's figure increased to four. One of them leaned on Gwyn's knee and tried to make her put her hand on his lustrous breast, and the other, smelling of perfume, leaned on R's shoulder and made R's eyes open, and the other took Varousa by the shoulders and tweaked her breast and the other one hugged Varousa's shoulders and fondled her breasts, making Varousa let out a loud scream. And the other one is looking at this with a cold smile on his face. It's all me. I'm not an illusion. That Tamiya said. It's not like I'm the real thing here and the rest of you are my alter egos. I can give you each a bobcat's worth of pleasure if you want it. All right, just let these women go home. Gwyn said, fed up. Instantly, Tamiya was alone again. See? Just so Tamiya can be here and still be with you, there's one spell path and countless others. I see, Gwyn said with a stern face. Ars was staring at Tamiya with his mouth open, and Varousa was trembling, holding his shoulders with both arms, as if he had been terrified. Very well. By the way, the leopard-headed king glared at Tamiya with yellowish eyes. Your hospitality is much appreciated, but we're in a hurry. We've fallen prey to an unexpected calamity and are in trouble even if we weren't. Could you tell us how to get to the spell path that is our common boundary? I'm not gonna stop you. Please, go, Tamiya said in a mean voice, and looked at the king with streaming eyes. It's not like I'm the one who asked you to come, so please. Don't be shy. Hey, Tamiya. Gwyn shrugs. Tamiya watches him. Gwyn's cloak was flung back, and his strong, splendid physique stood out brightly in the pale light. The shadow on the rock wall is that of a mythical half-beast, half-god. On the flat forehead of the leopard's head is a thin silver crown, the sign of a king, and the accoutrements he wears only accentuate rather than conceal his statuesque features. To the wretched mortal, Blinded by the common sense and superficiality of the world, it might have been seen as a deformed monster, a hideous creature, but it was nevertheless a figure of strange and fantastic power and pride. The witch's eyes narrowed, and a feverish gleam came into them, as if she were licking them with her eyes, and she looked round at Gwyn's thick neck, which was covered with the fur of a leopard, at his silver armlet, at his arms, which were full of muscle, at the knots in his shoulders, at his firm waist, at his long, powerful legs. I looked around. Well, yeah. She muttered in a throaty voice. I didn't ask you to come here, but I don't mind at all. A man like the king can stay here forever and ever. Hey, king, why don't you have another drink of my wine and then go to sleep? I'm sure your friends are all asleep. And she let out a throaty laugh. Gwyn turned around quickly. To his surprise, both Ars and Varousa were asleep in their chairs with their heads on their chests as soon as Tamiya said that, even though he hadn't even been able to see them. You've got a nasty trick up your sleeve, witch. Gwyn murmurs in a low voice. Tamiya's eyes flashed slyly at them and the Leopard King, and she stood up and approached Gwyn, her breasts jutting out like cannonballs. But then he stopped. In Gwyn's hand, he noticed that the long sword was held in his hand, and that its point was aimed straight between his nipples. Don't try to imitate Miroku, Leopard Head Gwyn. The witch said angrily in a hoarse voice. You're a brave man and a brave man deserves a woman. Gwyn, you started out as a mere ruffian and rose to the throne of Chironia, but pity you had to settle for a woman so cold and frozen on the floor. On the contrary, your wife called you a monster who was never born and wouldn't even let you into her wedding chamber. Tamiya knows exactly what she's talking about. So, Leopard Head Gwyn, forsake your rule over Chironia and join me in becoming king of the land of Tamiya. If you and I work together we can have everything, even this land. Hey, Leopard Head Gwyn, you're a leopard, the strongest man alive. Tamiya's been waiting for a man like you all her life. You know, that's why. Tamiya did not lift a finger to do so, but the drapery she wore slipped softly out from under the sash as if to meet her wearer's intentions, and slid down to the floor. The brocaded sash suddenly came undone and crawled down the witch's shiny thighs to the ground by her legs. Gwyn did not recoil, 
but as soon as the sash dropped to the floor, he saw it crawl into the darkness as a strange, disgusting, slimy, extremely colored snake, and he was indeed horrified. Tamiya stood there in her nocturnal garb, wearing only jewelry, and held out her hand to the leopard king. Her white eyes gleamed as if wet, and her pink tongue appeared to lick her fat lips. She looked into the king's eyes and twirled her naked body in a troubled manner, as if inviting him. Her black body, glistening as if it had been anointed with oil, twirled lasciviously and lasciviously in the pale light. Don't play dumb with me, dark witch. The leopard king's voice was cold. Tamaya twisted herself more and more, and made a lewd gesture that would have made any man lose all respect for her, and she tried to slip herself to the king without making a sound. But again, he was stopped by the tip of the sword which he lifted quickly. You won't embarrass me, will you, Gwyn? The voice of Tamiya was half an intimidation and, and the flirtation which appealed more was mixed. I'm sorry. And the king said, and sheathed his sword, and flung up his cloak, and stood up. Do you expect me to spend my time ruling this miserable cave, Witch of the Serpent? No, that may be, but as King of Ceylon, I want to save the silence from disaster and solve the mystery of why I was given this form and destiny as soon as possible. Don't waste your breath, witch. Let them sleep, and let us out. We'll pay you back. Tamiya looked terrified. For a moment, the thought of hitting her with some scathing remark sank into her mind. Suddenly, however, she changed her mind again. I hope you're not lying when you say that, Leopard Head Gwyn. I'll always be grateful to you for saving my life. You're a man who never lies. Then I believe you, you won't regret it, will you? Gwyn shrugged and didn't answer. Tamiya is naked and turns around to ours with her arms crossed over her chest. How long are you going to stay in bed, in the house? A sharp cluck of the tongue was heard. Immediately, both Farousa and Ars woke up and looked around. That's funny, I didn't mean to fall asleep. Ars murmurs. Tamiya shrugs. Come on, get out of here. Tamiya has a lot of work to do before the long night is over. The two rushed to their feet and looked around in a panic. The way out is that way. E.I., what a bunch of idiots. Why don't we just do what we came in to do and get out? They raised their hands, which were unusually pink and shapely. At once the three saw the rocky wall become as black as Saki. As Gwyn walked briskly into the room, Ars and Varousa followed cautiously. When my body touched the open darkness, I felt the unpleasant dizziness again, which I did not know whether to go down or up. Look, Yolacia's house is the fifth door on the left from Tamiya's house. And be careful, because Yolacia is always being chased by the doll. And Tamiya's shrill voice followed them, as if from a great distance. Gwyn the leopard head. I'll be seeing you soon, but when I do, don't forget my kindness and what I just said. I'll see you again. And I'll have you. The last one was faint, as if from an infinite distance. When the sensation of falling ceased, the area suddenly became bright. And they knew that they were standing in front of a common stone wall in a magic alley. Oh the spiders! Verousa screams. But it was nowhere to be seen. Unhindered, the three of them reached the house of Eulatia, the man chased by the doll, and the house Tamiya had told them about. Verousa, too, had followed them, not wanting to be separated from them. The door, a common monolithic door, was carved with runes, and when pressed, it opened unceremoniously. The man being chased by the doll is surprisingly careless, isn't he? Muttering, Gwyn steps carelessly into the darkness. They follow him cautiously. It's dark inside. Ours flicks on a flint to light the way. Immediately, the three of them screamed and ran away. An old, gray-haired, bearded man's head on a poorly made table. It's Yolacia. The head opened its eyes and stared at the three of us. Whoa. Oh shit. I'm too late. Ours screams, Verousa's voice of disgust, and the leopard-headed king's cry of pain, echoed through the dark, stone-built house. It is the home of the sorcerer Yolacia, known in the magic alley of Terid as the man chased by the doll. 
As soon as they took a step into the darkness, they found that in the darkness, which seemed to go on forever, lay something terrible. Yelisha's head. The head, with its long white hair and white beard, which looked as if it was infinitely old, was thrown out on the wooden table in the upstairs hall, as if it had been pulled out of the body by an overwhelming force. White bone, red flesh, and even nerve fibers are clearly visible in the slit of the neck, as if the doll had given the apostate the most horrible example in the world. That's when something even scarier happened. The head arose and slowly opened its eyes, glaring at the visitors as if they were fire. Yelisha. Amidst Varaus's shrill screams, the leopard-headed king yelled. You don't think. At once Varausa gave another shriek, and, pushing Ars aside, clung to the king's strong arm. She opened her eyes and stared at the three, for the mage's head opened its white, bloodless lips, and a low, grave voice flowed from them. Be not alarmed. Make no noise, children of the earth. The head of the old mage on the table made a sound that was clearly audible. Yelisha, since the last time I saw you, has the hand of the doll finally reached your body that you had been trying to escape? The king calmly inquired. A muffled laugh escaped from the lips of the man chased by the doll. It is not unreasonable to think so. But that's not the case, leopard man. I'll tell you why now. Okay, and... I'm sorry, but you'll have to lift me. I'll have Onihai show you. I can't talk much here. My king, my king. What the hell is this? Ours, the whole mouse, let out a shudder, and Varousa clung to him more tightly. The king of Chironia nodded reassuringly to them both, and then, pushing aside the dancer who had come to embrace him, he strode fearlessly to the table and gently lifted the heads of the dead in his hands. Ars shuddered and shook his body. Immediately, a single light appeared in the darkness, flashing as if to tell him to follow it. Don't worry. Yelisha was originally a necromancer of Dole, but she gave her soul to Janus and now Dole is her enemy. In the house of Yelisha we have nothing to fear, Gwyn said, motioning for Aruz and Velursa to follow him. He then walked off, holding the raw head as if to offer it. The two men and women followed hesitantly. It was both frightening and creepy, but it was still cheaper to be attached to the leopard king than to be left behind. The king did not seem to be surprised or moved by this strange situation. It was a bizarre sight. When I entered, it was just as I had seen it from the outside, a shabby stone hut, only strangely appearing to have a deeper depth of darkness. However, as I proceeded, Guided by the demon fire of the guide face, no matter how far I went, the darkness showed no sign of hitting the wall at all, and I realized that it was just another passage connecting the earth and another dimension through the strange magic art, just like the black which Tamiya's seal earlier. It was just another passage between the earth and the other dimension. The darkness on the left and the right is dark, but it is not dim and it seems that the way is finally open for the guests after checking each time whether it is permitted by the owner to pass. Behind him is a leopard-headed warrior with a fresh head of white hair in his hand, followed by a little terrid pedant and a naked dancer. The darkness in which this fantastic little procession was passing seemed to be an endless sea of space leading to other stars, and in it even time seemed to stand still. Their feet were indeed stepping on something solid, but they could not perceive what it was. And once, right beside their faces, blew a cold, dilute wind, which, indeed, blew only at a great height in the sky. The heads never spoke again, and the guests were silent as well. It was the demon's fire that announced that the journey, which resembled the procession of the dead led by the Valkyrie, had finally ended. It turned suddenly round and, as if urging them to turn to the left, disappeared as suddenly as it had arrived. Gwyn turned left into a brightly lit room. Brighter, though, than the eternal darkness that brought us there. It was a strange place. The room is much smaller than Tamiya's cave, like the inside of a dugout, but smaller and more compact. In the corner, there is a wooden bed, covered with a white cloth as if a person were sleeping. Near it are a wooden table and some chairs. There was an unglazed pot on the table, and a prayer wheel was placed around the corner of the room as if it were a magic circle, but that was all the furniture in this simple house. 
The air in the room was clean, and the sweet scent of fresh herbs drifted in from somewhere. A refreshing night air swept over their faces, but the three of them who looked up were startled. The slanted roof had a large skylight through which they could see the starry night sky, but the arrangement of the stars was completely different from what they were used to every night. O oh, leopard man, O oh, leopard-headed king, take the quilt from that bunk there, the head said. Gwyn did as she was told. Then he looked at the thing that had appeared as if in dismay. It was a torso wearing an old robe, with its hands stretched straight out to the sides of its body, but there was nothing where its neck should have been. Well, he said, why don't you put me on your pillow? Yalacious head said. Gwyn did as he was told and fell back. Then he watched in amazement as the mage's torso rose with a languid gesture on the bed, and with a dumbfounded look on his face he fumbled with his hands to find the position of the pillow, and, groping his neck, lifted it up and put it back in place. The mage did not take any offense at Ars's dismay or Varouse's weird look, but shook his gray head a couple of times to make sure it was still in place. Then he stretched out slightly, stepped down from the bed with his feet together, and pointed out a wooden chair to the guests. I knew you were coming by the position of the stars, my king. I came down to the ground to greet you, but as usual, a bunch of lowly messengers were waiting for me to take credit, and I showed them a bad time, said Yulatia, a mage now complete in neck and body. He was an immeasurably old man, but his tall, slender, vine-like body moved as smoothly as if his fluids had run dry and he had become something else. On his gray forehead he wore a bronze ring of wizards, a light robe that had once been white, a huge prayer cord and a strange-looking medallion on his chest. His wrinkled face was thin and sharp, but he had the appearance of a wise man, quiet, intimidating and reassuring at the same time. The wizards always say that they knew it, that they could read the stars. The leopard-head king made a growling sound. But you always say that after it happens or after it's over, he said. If you knew what was going to happen, why didn't you just say so and try to prevent it? No, this is not about you, Yalatia. Do not blame them, O oh king, Yalatia said in a funny way. In witchcraft there are laws of witchcraft. There are various golden rules that govern the operation of the universe, but the power to know them can only be obtained by following the oath of the Magus not to change or interfere with them. You are the possessor of an astonishing power, but it comes mainly from the fact that you have no idea who you are or what drives you. By the way, my king. Yulatia pointed a slender finger at Gwyn, who remained standing alone. I knew of your coming because the Red Star of the North, the Leopard Star, which is your symbol, made a sudden movement in the constellations and moved to the southeast, but you did not come at the time when you should have come. I knew I had to open the gate, so I went to the Alley of Magic, but there I found a lowly messenger waiting for me, who grabbed me and ripped my head off. Although my body had returned here before that, I did not think that such a thing would baffle the eyes of the great demon, but I left it to him to do what he wanted, thinking that he would verify my true character and leave me alone until he sent his next assassin. They left my head there to make an example of me, but that's because your visit was interrupted, O oh king. Leopard head king, what's going on? What? It's no big deal. The king growled, and rescued Varousa from the spider of Arachne in the Alley of Spells, explaining briefly how he himself had been rescued by the Black Witch. Tamiya. Yulatia growled low and... That slutty black woman saw a rare opportunity and jumped at it. That's because I was killing time with a demon, otherwise I would have annihilated such a lowly creature of darkness. Then I must apologize to you, my king, for what the Black Witch has done to him. I hope he doesn't regret this later. Is that the Witch of the Dolls? Not. No, but that's the Landurgian woman. A true heathen, so to speak. Landargia, the friar god, is a giant frog-faced remnant of the old gods, evil as evil is, but so old that she usually keeps her power hidden before the new gods. I think he was called Lontagos. Tamiya is a lowly servant girl of the ancient gods, but you know the importance of the power you hide. I'm very sorry. I must confess I was careless and showed up at Terid's house without checking. Yulatia, the man chased by the doll. 
Nonsense, I don't know what you care so much about. The leopard-headed king waved his hand in a troublesome manner. It doesn't matter, Yalesha. If you knew I was coming, you know what I'm here for. I know. That's why I've been reading the stars since the day before yesterday, laying out the spell board and the Ouija board, and when I was satisfied with my findings, I returned to the silence via the dark path. Yalesha said. Gwyn refused to listen. That's a strange thing to say. Are you telling me we're not silence? Of course. Yalesha waved her hand, and the four walls vanished, revealing a sight never seen before. Verousa screamed. It was, in all likelihood, a world not of this world, unknown even to the Leopard King, who had traversed from the ice and snow regions of the north to the deserts of the far south, and had visited the Sea of Lent, the Sea of Corsima, and as far away as Corinthium at the end of the world. The whole place is a red desert. Not a tree, not a rock, not a house, not even the shadow of a city, but a huge, red, dimly shadowy thing, slowly, slowly passing by, far beyond the waves of the desolate sand. Where am I? Gwyn asked with a stern face. The mage waved his hand and the wooden wall reappeared. You wouldn't believe me, and you wouldn't understand. I'll tell you this, this is not a region on some twilight planet where you and I live, not in any age that planet has ever been. Nor in any age that the planet has passed through. For the apostate Eulatia, once a high priest of Dole and then saved by the grace of Janus, the god of light, is always sought after as a traitor by the hand of Dole, and nothing but unutterable ruin awaits him if he falls into its hands. However, since Dole is only a god who is manifested in a space-time continuum, his power is limited to that space-time continuum and he cannot follow me to a completely different dimension. Therefore, I, Yalesha, will never fall into his hands as long as I keep myself in this time-space unknown to the mortals of this world with a prayer wheel ward. Hmm, I've heard some strange things. Gwyn said, but since his mind was originally free and untroubled by the mad desire to understand the incomprehensible, he shook his leopard head and continued to lose interest. Well, good. Wherever I am, it doesn't matter compared to the fact that I'm here. Yalesha, I'm in a hurry. While I'm doing this the Black Death is ravaging the silence and my subjects are dying in agony. And there's nothing I can do about it. I am the king of Chironia. And yet my people, in their fear of the sickness, are acting like madmen, parents squeezing the blood of their children, husbands their wives, husbands their slaves and eating their flesh, and I, the king, cannot do anything about it. Tell me, Yalesha. What wrong has caused the silence to suffer such misfortune? Who has committed what crime and for that the silence must pay? Wait and see, my king. Eurasia waved his hand soothingly and sat down the king who was about to claw him, and he himself left his wooden bed and sat down directly on the floor. Well, this is not going to be as easy as it looks. He muttered to himself and turned his face to the stars peering through the slanted skylight cut into the roof. What is it, Eulatia? I'm well aware that as a mage you possess both the black magic of Dahl and the white magic of Janus and thus have unprecedented magical power. I have not forgotten that I was saved by your power, and that is why I have come here. I don't have unlimited power. Even witchcraft does not mean that I am capable of tremendous prowess or unlimited supernatural power. It is merely a system of power established by the laws of operation that are different from the laws of the world. And even more so in this case, King Chironian, because the answer you are looking for is probably not there in this case. It's not destiny that has struck the silence. It is also not the fault of anyone who has caused this to happen. Gwyn glared at the mage with sharp eyes. With clawed, brown fingers, Yalesha fumbled with the purse string across her chest. I see the silence. I see a proud city of gold and black, ruled by a leopard with a crown on its head. Yalesha murmured. His eyes were half-closed and his voice had changed color. The king and his companions knew that the mage had fallen into a hypnotic trance and watched with bated breath. Oh, leopard-head king, I see people dying. The black mask of death has been lifted. Young children, women, old men, and finally Chuang Tung are falling, their skin turning black. Look, 
The black cloud that hangs behind the calamity. The black cloud is clearing, I see a face, a huge face breaking through the black cloud. Oh, my God. Yendar Zog. Yelisha's voice suddenly rose to a scream. The three of them held their breaths. Yelisha. Yelisha. An uneasiness suddenly rose in Gwyn's heart, and he suddenly jumped and tried to grab the mage by the shoulders. No, my king. Ars, suddenly awakened from his spellbound astonishment, cried out, and ran to the king and seized his hand. Why, don't stop it, Nezit Lumik. Oh, you said you were touting a gypsy prophetess before. Ars was talking too fast. A possessed fortune teller like this, if you suddenly make him come to his senses, he'll either go mad or die. Yelisha is not like those fortune tellers. Look at her face. Gwyn yells and pushes Ars away. The little man flips over and rubs his hips reproachfully. Without looking at him, the king grabbed the old mage by the shoulders and shook him violently. Eurasia's wrinkled hands rose up gradually. As if a great battle were going on in his heart, his aged face turned to the color of earth, his eyes were fixed on nothing, and his face was twisted and trembling. A moment later Gwyn grabbed his wrist, knowing that his hand was turning against him, and that he was about to throttle his own throat. Yendar Yendar Zog Oh, please help me, Yendar Zog is killing me. A painful murmur came out of Yelisha's poor mouth. He was thin and skinny, but his hands were full of strength, and in order to prevent the powerful leopard-headed king from strangling him, he had to exert all his strength, his arms as thick as the roots of a tree, his muscles bulging like rope. To prevent him from being strangled. Yelisha. Come to your senses. Gwyn barked. You are Yelisha, the man chased by the doll. Come to your senses. Yelisha's body stiffened. The next moment, in Gwyn's hands, his old, shriveled body slumped. Yelisha. Gwyn shook him. The mage's eyes opened and just as he had when he had fallen into the trance, without any warning at all, he had come to his senses completely. Oh what a surprise, the mage said, letting out a hideous, meaningful sneer. Caliban, if you are around, bring me a bottle of Moorish ale. And when he had brushed off the king's hand and raised himself, he said to him, out of nowhere, what is this? At the same time an unglazed jar appeared on the table, and it rose as if an invisible hand were handling it, and a copper cup was filled with malt liquor. How can a man like Yelisha be fooled twice in one day in all eternity? Yelisha sipped carefully at the wine, which had a hint of wheatgrass in it, and said with a wry smile, You, you can't keep me. Not at all. But thanks to you, I know. I know everything that the stars didn't reveal to me. It seems that your country, Chironia, the silent city of gold and obsidian, has been targeted by the God of evil. For a while, no one spoke to each other. After a while, the leopard king slowly pushed the chair which had been disturbed by the current commotion, back to its original position, sat down, and muttered in a meditative voice. What's that you say? Yes, indeed. Yelisha nodded and put down the cup. It was known to me from the beginning. It was known from the beginning because in the nebula I was looking at, there suddenly appeared some dark stars, which gathered together to form a nebula and passed over the lion's palace like a cloud covering the face of the moon iris and extinguished its light. The lion's palace, with its leopard star, was the symbol of Chironia, and it was known from the beginning that the calamities that threatened Chironia were not the result of the weaving of the yarn spinning wheel or of some unavoidable law of cause and effect. This, in a nutshell, means that Chironia has become the target of a dark force, a dark power. The dark powers are those who have strayed from the law of cause and effect in yarn, those who have joined the ranks of the dolls. I had read that the dark powers had each set their fingers on the fertility and peace of Chironia, and then, as the dark star scroll announced the time, they all converged on the silence, and one of them, in his haste to win, took the forbidden step of blowing the winds of the Black Death. I had read that. This is true. And if that were all, it would have been enough for me to give him the power and teach him the spell to blow the winds of the Black Death away from the silence. But, but what is it? The king shouted in frustration. The mage shook his head slowly. 
I can't tell you that. Oh my god. The king of Chironia slapped his knee. In frustration, he slammed his knee again with his fist and leaned forward. After all I've told you, you're still trying to be nice. Ho. Oh. This is why I can't stand mages and soothsayers. Oh king. They always say things that are strangely suggestive, and never say anything that can be used as an excuse. They always say things in a lukewarm and indifferent way, and later say that we didn't understand them correctly. Yalatia, what is the source of the evil that befell the silence? Who is Yendar Zog? Yendar Zog. Yalatia murmured. Suddenly, his face tightened, and he stared at the leopard king with piercing eyes. Did he speak such a name, O oh king? I didn't say it or anything. Yendar Zog Yander. Right. So, it all makes sense now. Who is it, Yalatia? Gwyn folded. I can't tell you what to do. Was the mage's reply. Yalatia, don't blame me. I don't know. I think in the near future I'll be able to tell you what it is. The words are familiar and at the same time they carry a very vague, foul and sinister ring in my heart. But it's also certain that I don't know it now. So that's the key to unlocking everything, and when it's revealed, I'll be able to rid myself of the dark power that threatened the silence. You see, magic is a strange thing, my king. Those who engage in it don't always know what they know and what they should do. There are things they know but still do not know, things they do not know because it is right not to know, and things they do not know but know that they will know in time. This is all I can tell you, King Chelonia. But don't be dissuaded by the uselessness of my divination. Before you were king, when you were still called the leopard-headed general of the silence, I gave you some very useful advice and assistance and you didn't realize the usefulness and rightness of that advice until it was all over. I'm sure you still remember. Therefore, O oh king, do not now make me tell you what I do not know and do not try to extract more from me. I see the colors of the plague that covers Chironia. And I know why it has come. I tell you, my king, it is for your own good. I am the one. I'm the one who brought the Black Death to my country. Gwyn cried out. The sound of her voice made Verousa cover her ears and even ours tremble. But Yulatia was unmoved. It is not that your hand has opened the gates of death and brought the winds of the Black Death. Rather, O oh leopard-headed king, your very existence, your unique soul, is born in such a way that it invites unusual things to come into your life, whether they be bad luck or good luck. This is not your fault, and it is for this reason that you were born to do something, so do not blame yourself for this. But even so, for some ambitious and demented minds, your vitality, your noble union of leopard and man, and yet that certain power which is neither, is as irresistible as a flame that sucks in an insect. You can't tell the king where you are from a mile away, Gwyn wherever you are in time and space, even in another space-time continuum like mine, you can't help but notice where and in what place your all-too-powerful life energy is shining its incandescent light. I told you before, your soul is in the shape of a leopard, Gwyn, and a flame. You are a star in the shape of a leopard, one of the few stars in the world that emits its own light and whose light will never run out. If it had not been so, you would have been a very gentle, if turbulent, man, but in the end you would have been called a clear sovereign and your country would have been able to live a peaceful life with you. But the incandescent light that is hidden within you is too intense. It attracts those who are born of the dark, those who have grown accustomed to the dark, like ants to honey. Listen, Gwyn. This is advice for a friend from Eulatia. Listen to it carefully. You are the source of all the silence bad luck and their good luck. But instead of blaming yourself, listen to this. Because you are the source of all, you are the only one who can dispel the darkness and bring back the light. The mage kept his mouth shut. For a long time, no one spoke. Verousa tried to regain her footing uncomfortably, but she sagged awkwardly again. Gwyn shut the leopard's eyes and leaned his head on his breast, as if he had fallen asleep. Outside the window, a huge red satellite, not visible from any other country on earth, is gently moving across the sky. 
Even the small sound of the prayer wheels turning, the crunching of the wheels, caught my ears so loudly that it startled me. Eventually, finally, Gwyn looked up. His yellow, leopard eyes shone with a disturbing intensity. He said in a voice devoid of emotion, So, if I forsake the throne of Chironia and go down into the wild alone, evil whatever it may be will follow me like a dog. The Black Death and its dark power will pass from the silence. Is that what you're saying, Yalatia? No, it isn't. Yalatia flicked the prayer string with her fingers in frustration. So I'm telling you, if it's you who attracts the darkness, it's you, my king, who brings back the light. Now that you've given up your throne, it will only make it easier for the dark ones who want the silence to get their hands on them, now that they've come out of the depths of the unholy darkness, you'll have no choice but to fight. The Leopard King. Fight all you want, that's what I do. Gwyn sounded angry. But I am a warrior. How can I stand against the Black Devil's pestilence with a sword? Don't worry about it. In any case, when you came to Terid, they knew it was time for you to go. By the time you leave Yulaisha's house, the cool breeze from the west will have blown away the winds of the Black Death, and the silent people will have paused to make offerings of thanks to Cassis and Dole. Soon, though, they will be at ease, and soon they will be exposed to the true designs of these men. Will the Black Death pass? And since you say so, at least the plague that will follow it and plague the silence is one I can face with my sword. Gwyn said happily. I'm relieved to hear that. I'm not a bad king, but I can't cut off an epidemic with a sword. And what is Kaitsura Kaitsura, then, Yalatia? He is a fool who is kept alive by the darkness, but thinks he is giving life to it. He is a fool who sells his soul easily to the darkness, but thinks he has bought it for a price, was Yalatia's answer. O oh, king, the leopard can see in the dark. You have nothing to fear from them. I'll help you if you need it, after all, I'm the man chased by the doll, and it's directly in my interest that the silence become a ward of the dark forces. Most of them are too stupid to reveal their fatal weaknesses in their names. The name is the reflection of the body. Gwyn, you should remember this old truth. Therefore, there are only two, or two things, that you really need to watch out for. The one you once gave something to, and the one. I can't yet see. There is a dark, powerful nebula, blocking and blocking all light. A terrible and powerful malice, an enemy. Take heart, warrior. That's all I can say for now. King of Chironia. This time, the mage had truly finished his story. Knowing this, Gwyn nodded softly and silently. There was no longer a disturbing light in his yellow eyes, but something clear and understanding. Very well. He kept repeating it as if it were an inscription. What I once gave you something, and what you cannot yet see, are the two things you need to pay attention to. That's right. By the way. Yalatia has changed her mind. I think our guests must be hungry by now. Speaking of which. Gwyn laughed in a thick voice. Will I be able to behave? Once upon a time, when you, the leopard-headed general, came to Terrid to ask me to tell the fate of the daughter of King Achilles, I served you barbecue and wine not of this earth. Since then I've moved my home to another planet. I can't do anything for you, but I'll treat you to some of the rare products of this planet. It's Caliban. Yulatia snapped her fingers, and an invisible hand brought a wooden table between the chairs, on which were immediately placed a number of plates and baskets, as if taken by an invisible hand from an invisible cupboard. A delicious smell filled the air, and the three looked at each other as if they had suddenly realized their hunger and thirst. There appeared strange cactus fruits full of thorns, strange fluffy chunks, huge red berries, what seemed at first glance to be mere leaves, and cheese-like chunks. Its thorny fruit is nothing but roasted meat when peeled and eaten. The white fluffy stuff is the nectar of this world which is extremely nourishing. And the fruit of the red mill tree, when peeled and eaten, refreshes the body and soul. However, if you take too much of the food of this world, you will become like that huge shadow I saw earlier. Yulatia let out a crusty laugh. If this is not enough, 
I will also bring you the flesh of a thunder fish from the third planet and a two-headed bird from the fifth planet of Antares. No, let's not. Gwyn groaned, pried the skin off the cactus with trepidation, put it in his mouth, and was amazed at the juicy, flavored meat that tasted like it had been roasted by a very skilled cook. And he began to devour it as if he were devouring it. Seeing this, Varousa also ate it reluctantly. But ours. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry, sir, I'm old-fashioned. He mumbled something to himself and stared at the inscrutable food in a weird way, but did not touch it. The leopard-headed king is unconcerned, feeding his appetite with leopard-style manners that never change even when he becomes king. It's a witch's path. Um, it's definitely a magic path. He murmured as he felt it. Yalesha, I know it's useless to ask, but where is this place that produces fruits that taste like meat and leaves that taste like bread? How is it possible for you to stay here and take things from other stars at will? It was once called magic by those who knew nothing about it, and at one time it was even called super science. Yalesha replied. But, my king, magic is something quite different from what you think of as the art of illusion. To put it in a way you can understand, we, I and my servant Caliban, make clever use of the overlapping dimensions to get around through the distortions of time and space. Let's say. Of course, that's not all, but by the way, Leopard King, I offer you this special drink. Drink it. It's a little strong but it'll do you good in time. In the meantime, I'll tell the fortunes of your companions. When Yalesha's eyes narrowed as she stared, both Ars and Velursa squirmed, feeling strangely uncomfortable. He was seized with fear and trepidation, as if his piercing, all-seeing eyes would mercilessly expose the dark secrets and unworthy emotions that were hidden in the depths of everyone's soul. Although Yalesha's eyes now contained a soft old smile, they still gave a shock as if they had been touched by an electric current. The only one who could remain calm in front of his eyes might have been Gwyn. This is a rare thing to see. Yalesha said slowly, and pointed at Varousa with her clawed finger. The dancer shrank back in fright. You are unaware of your own destiny. I see the Temple of Iris and the slave market of Thessos where you were sold. You are what your name implies, a golden shield. More fitting than the silks of your palace is the robe that surrounds your child, daughter of Come. And you. Yalesha's fingers fell on ours. Ours twitched. You you can see your soul struggling in the dark. It's crying out to get out. You sell and buy and commit other sins, but your heart is not dim. In any case, your hen verouses and your and ours, your stargazing has been changed by the leopard star. Go straight where your heart believes and your thoughts desire. It's the only right way. The brightness of the leopard star melts the ice, stirs the flame, and makes the tide rise. Cherish this chance meeting. The time will come when the leopard star too will need the golden shield. Oh leopard-headed king, how do you like the taste of Ishtar's wine? Yeah. Gwyn twitched and replied. It was as if the old blood and the new clear blood were engaged in a struggle within my body. The taste pierced my tongue and burned my stomach, but it was also strange and comforting. What is this an imitation of, Yalesha? Have I ever done you any wrong, my king? was the mage's absent-minded answer. No. Gwyn, think about it. No, I don't think so. That's why. I am the man the doll is after. I know I'm betting on your star as a light that can stand against the doll. Be that as it may, my king, it seems the time and the hour for you to be here have passed. The hand of the Lord of Hazos fears for your life. The black winds of death have been blown away. Go, my king, the dimensional path is open to you for one moment only. And. Yalesha takes up the purse string. He approached Gwyn, groping her and grasping her firm arm with his other hand. Quickly. Be mindful of what the Kumu-born dancer has told you. And do not neglect the bandits of Ifrikia. Good. Gwyn stared at Yalesha. The mage nodded and his bloodless eyelids fluttered down over his glassy eyes, obscuring all expression. The journey home was easy. 
They had already become accustomed to the strange experience of passing through the darkness of the dimension, and the demon fire that the wizard had given them as a guide. Yalatia did not say farewell, and Gwyn did not try to say an ordinary greeting to the man chased by the doll. They knew that they would meet again by the guidance of the stars, or they would not meet again. Tonight, after having been subjected to such strange experiences as the Spider of Darkness in Arachne, Tamiya the Black Witch in Landergear, and Yalatia the Wizard, the Dancer Varousa and the whole Mouse Aruz were somewhat dismayed, and wished at all costs to escape from this strange other dimension. They were happy to be able to return to their usual world from this bizarre other dimension. They were led by the fire to a room with a familiar wooden table, on which the head of Eurasia had been placed the first time they had seen it. As soon as he entered the room, the demon fire vanished. Demon's way. Again, Gwyn murmurs as he sinks into thought. Behind them the darkness has closed in, and there is only a wall of wood, and they can no longer find their way to that red desert, that other dimensional home where shadowy behemoths roam slowly, and where the stars have forms never before seen on earth. Bearer. What a horrible experience that must have been. Ars shouted, cut the sign of Janus, and fumbled with the spell strings that were still tied to his arm. Then he pushed fearfully at the door of the Eurasia, as if he were sure that something new and strange was waiting for him there. And he shouted in amazement. Yeah, this is Talus Street. The sky was beginning to turn white. The stone-built town seemed to be drifting in a peaceful and tranquil sleep in that dim and refreshing dark blue as if they were people who had been called back to life after a serious illness. The streets and the lack of people had not changed since their encounter in the night of the Terrid, but somehow the air was sweeter, and there was a faint sense that the wind had lost the sticky stain of death. Somewhere, a bird was singing. Why did you go into the spell alley, but when you came out, you were like. That's when ours said it. Ah, oh, that's what the old man said. Suddenly there came a low, urgent voice, and round the corner appeared a company of dragon riders charging towards them. At the head of them, a stout, aristocratic man, with tears in his eyes, knelt down before the king, wearing a black helmet in the shape of a dragon, and a dragon on his breast. Your Majesty, how can you be in such a place how can you be safe? Hazos, I told you not to worry. The leopard king nodded to the handsome face of Marquis Langobard, one of the twelve electors. By order of his majesty, sir, but I have good news to report as soon as possible. I know. The Black Death has passed. Yeah. The Marquis of Langobard looked at the king. Did you know that his majesty's illness was miraculously reversed? I see. The king of Chironia nodded and mounted the horse which the dragonborn had sent him with an agility that belied his great size. By the way, you guys. Tonight, by chance, I'm about to speak to my two companions when I suddenly realize. The only one there was Veluka. The king smiles. Ours has fled, good. By the way, Velursa, you have nowhere to go. You can follow me if you like. There's plenty of room in the Obsidian Palace for you alone. Verousa put her hand to her mouth and looked at the king, and tears began to well up in her eyes. And ours, you don't even have to run away. Well, Yalatia says that the three of us are apparently destined to come together again. Good luck, said the leopard king, and signaled his return. At that moment, the leopard-headed king did not realize how true his words were, and how much sooner than he thought they would come true. The black fog of the silence seemed to have lifted. But it was only to reveal the greater evil that lurked behind it. The true horror was just about to begin. Chapter 2 The Face of Rule Ba The fog of the Black Death that had overtaken the silence had lifted for the moment. However, the city of gold and obsidian, ruled by the Leopard King, had not yet truly regained its peaceful days. The Black Death had left too many scars on the stone city in such a short period of time. The militia were busy clearing away the bodies of the diseased, and the seven hills were filled with the smoke of the dead, encouraged by the hope that there would be no more. The people who had survived the disaster formed long lines around the temples to make offerings to Cassis, the god of medicine, and Janus, the god of life, 
and the evacuated nobles began to return one after another to the capital of the Seven Hills, with the exception of Queen Sylvia of Cylonia and her entourage, who were attending to the prognosis of Achilles the Great. They began to return one after another to the city of the Seven Hills. The Cylons seemed to be trying to recover from their ordeal, but... Your Majesty! Your Majesty the King! Your Majesty! Somewhere, there was a persistent call from a young voice. Gwyn looked up and lifted his well-developed jaws as if he were a beast trying to detect a bad smell. The crown on his forehead gleamed in the bonfire of the garden. At the Obsidian Palace on Windward Hill in Cylon, a grand banquet was being held to thank Janus that the city of Cylon had finally escaped the plague of the Black Death. All the musicians were gathered, the storehouse was opened, and all those with even the slightest rank and fame flocked to the wind hill. Smooth, thirst-quenching honey wine and fire wine are poured out of the tartar incessantly, and waiters carrying silver trays of barbecued meat and pies walk down the corridor incessantly. However, the leopard-headed king, who was the master of the feast, saw to it that the feast was in full swing and quietly withdrew so that the guests would not notice him. He was not drunk or tired, for he had always been a bottomless drunkard, but he had heard the prophecy of the mage Eulatia that the real disaster was yet to come. I wanted to think about the fate of his city in a cool breeze. Since those who seek the silence have come out of the depths of the unholy darkness, you have no choice but to fight them, Leopard King. The words of his ally, Eulatia, which he heard that day on a strange star in another dimension, have never left his mind since then. Now that you mention it, this piece of the silence, this moment of relaxation after a hard day's work, has a strange undercurrent of anxiety. I sent a group of militia into the city to see if there was anything strange, and most of it was trivial, but was it nothing more than a clear sign that I couldn't see because I didn't have eyes like Eulatius? Or, the moon was strangely reddish, and it seemed to be constantly frightened by the wind and the clouds that blew too much. The night was filled with the haunting smell of perfumed myrrh, the buzz of the feast, the faint tunes of the musicians blown away by the wind, and the city of Cylon, far below the hills, was black with sleep. Who are you? The king shouted sharply. The leopard's eyes blazed in the darkness. With his strong hand on the sword at his hip, the leopard king stared at the lunaria bushes, their red and white flowers floating in the darkness. Come out or you'll be the assassin. I say again. There was a faint answering cry, and the bushes of Lenoria rustled, and a slender figure appeared even to the night eye. A woman. The king, not yet fully relaxed, removes his hand from the hilt of his great sword. She was still young. Her hair is glossy and towering, and in her jet black, shinier than dark locks are twirling pins of starry jewels. On her slender, but nowhere sagacious or pliant, agile body, she wore the garments of a courtesan, a loose-fitting pantalette reaching to her breast, a silk sash wrapped in many coils and draped along the middle of her body, a short, transparent overcoat, and copper rings fastening her sleeves and ankles. On her feet, she wore a cloak of silk. On her feet she wore shoes made of cloth with wet patches, and on her forehead she wore a ring. Like a star, the glittering eyes of the leopard-headed king, which shone with the glittering jewels of his forehead, ears and throat, looked at him. His lips, wet with red and shining, were tightly drawn, and his egg-shaped face, as if he were from Kumu or thereabouts, seemed to show a strong and determined temperament. Good. I'm lucky to be here, to see the king, she said. Her bright eyes never left the leopard-headed king as if she were searching for a sign. But when she met the king's reluctant silence, tears of disappointment welled up in her eyes. You don't remember me anymore, she said in a tearful voice, and before the king could stop her, she raised her hand, pulled out a shining pin, and quickly wiped her head. Immediately her dark hair covered her shoulders like a waterfall of dark colors. She threw away the pin, and took off her transparent bolero and released it. Her round, firm shoulders rise up like white rocks in a sea of hair. The king burst into a low laugh. Veluka. You've changed so much I've mistaken you for someone else. 
At the raid and at Yulacia's house you wore nothing but your ankle chains and your hair was a mess. Whoa, it suits you very well. How's it going? Have you gotten used to living in the Windy Hills? That's it, the Arachnean dancer said, looking up at the king sulkily. And then he lifted his feet, took off his soft cloth shoes, threw them off, stripped to his bare feet, and thumped happily on the ground of the garden lined with boulders. Then, she began to pull on her embroidered sash, followed by her rustling pantaloons, which she pulled down with a flick of her fingers. The only thing she wore now, apart from this and that accoutrement, was a breastplate dipped in red jade. Verousa bent down, picked up the sash which she had once thrown so gracefully, and, with an effortless motion, drew it around her lower abdomen, then drew it underneath and let the excess hang down in front of her. Oh, my God, that felt so good. He brushes his hair with his hands and says like a spoiled child. My king, I hate to break it to you for saving me from the arachne and putting me here, but I think I'm going to leave the hill and go to the silent city. Is this place boring? Well, it's true, for the first time since I was sold at Thessos, I don't have to take customers, I don't have to dance around snakes, I wear silk and satin, I have food and drink and a soft bed to sleep in, but I'm a helpless dancer, Verousa. I've always wondered what the dancers of Arachne are doing in their palaces on the Seven Hills. Did someone say something to you? No, I like it here. Kumu's daughter stepped closer to Gwyn and looked into the leopard's eyes with her bold, shining black eyes without fear. But the king, when you told me to follow you on that lid, I cried, but the king didn't treat me the way I thought he would. But the king never treated me the way I thought he would. Is there a shortage of something? The leopard-headed king asked back in utter astonishment. He was astonished to find out that he knew absolutely nothing about this dancing girl he had picked up on his strange adventure. Verousa did not falter. Her limbs were full of the spontaneity and vitality of a strange wild cat, and her eyes flashed like fire as they latched on to the leopard-headed man whose fate was unique in the world. She seemed to have a manly and decisive soul, which was never found in the gentle ladies of the palace. Hey, king! The dancer stands on her tiptoes and makes a gesture to the king. Why why did you bring me back to this windy hill when I had nowhere else to go, riding on the dragon trooper's horse? I wonder why. Hey, king will you watch Verousa's cursed dance, the curse-busting dance of the first Kumu dancer? Mmm. -hmm. I don't want to see it. Valersa questioned. The leopard-headed king looked puzzled. Valersa. Hey. Verousa closed in. I want the king to see me dance with Verisa. Of course it's. Gwyn, unconsciously flinching, was about to say something inexplicable. But he suddenly stopped talking, and looked at the dancer with astonishment in his eyes. Verousa's eyes are wide open. Her eyes have passed over the king and are staring madly at the night sky behind her. The blood drained from his face as if he had been confronted with some unbelievable wonder and he put his hand to his mouth and his mouth opened wide as if he were about to scream. Valersa. The leopard-head king whispered in a soothing, rather annoyed voice. Verousa. Valusa didn't even hear. She shook her head helplessly, not even realizing she had done so. The king's yellowish eyes narrowed sharply, and a low, beastly roar came from his throat. As if afraid of disturbing the flow of air, the king raised his hand and stretched it out to the bare shoulder of the dancer. When his hand grasped her warm shoulder, the dancer recoiled, but her eyes were still fixed on the king's back, and she would not move away. The king tapped Verousa on the shoulder reassuringly, and quietly moved his hand to the hilt of the great sword at his hip. Whatever danger it was that had frightened and frozen Velusa so much, he tightened his muscles so that he could react immediately, and at the same time, as smoothly as possible, so that he would not bring about his own destruction by moving too quickly. Sink your body. The king threw the dancer's body into the safety of the corridor and turned her around, bracing herself for the explosion that would follow a moment later. Is. That's when. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. A shout from the other side of the corridor, and some of the attendants and aides rushed to find the king. Your Majesty, it's a terrible. Your Majesty. Come in. 
It's an emergency. It's an emergency. A messenger from the silence. What's wrong with the silence? King Chironia howled. The sound was so terrible that it made people shiver. At the same time, the king's hand plucked off the annoying toga. He noticed the grimaces of his aides who were running towards him. Hazos. Malone. Speak calmly. What about the silence? Ishtvans attacked us. Yes, no. Marquis Langobard and Atiyah looked at each other. The Marquis of Langobard opened his mouth to gasp. A strange creature has overtaken the silence. It must have taken advantage of the fact that all the protectorates were packed into the wind hills for tonight's feast. Hazos raised his hand and pointed in the direction of the silence. Gwyn twitched, perked up his ears, and growled. There's a strange voice. There's a tremendous amount of people screaming like crazy. The silence are asking for your help. The young Marquis of Atia ranted. Your Majesty. I've sent 300 protectorate troops to the silence immediately. Protector Athos is in command, but I think it would be better if I led my cavalry down the hill. Hold on, Malone. The king had suddenly regained his composure. From here, as far as the eye could see, there was no sign of another fire in the silent city, and even the screams that rang out in the night wind from there were something subtly different from those of a massacre or a battle. And there was nothing in the world that would have made the leopard-headed king of Chironia recoil for so long. Just calm down and tell me, Hazos, what is the anomaly? What's happening to the silence? How much damage has been done? What's the situation? Just saying it's a monster doesn't tell us anything. Well, that's... Although the Marquis of Langobard was an agile, brave, and agile nobleman, who was said to be the right-hand man of the Leopard King, he hesitated to speak, as if he was afraid of being laughed at if he spoke of it. That's what's so hard to believe because I'm looking at it like this. Ah! Suddenly, the Marquis of Langobard exclaimed, his face scrunched up in astonishment at seeing the same unbelievable thing that Varousa had just seen, and he pointed to the night sky above the Obsidian Palace. Oh my god! There's another monster here. Oh my god! The king howled. The Margrave of Langobard, the Margrave of Achaea, his attendants, and Varousa, they all stared up at the sky, frozen, as if they were standing in a crowd of fear and disbelief. The leopard-headed king turned around with tremendous energy. And I saw it. Oh what was that? A grunt of disbelief escaped from between the leopard's clenched jaws. He was not afraid of the apparition as his men and Varousa had been, nor was he overwhelmed with astonishment, but only stiffened his strong body in horror at the sight of something so incredible, and stood there clutching the hilt of his sword. The true evil is yet to be revealed, Gwyn. The words of the prophet Jeresha come to my ears. He stood facing the monster with eyes that seemed to burst into flames, with the fury and will of a noble king, glaring at it as it tried to ravage his territory and airspace without any right to do so. It's. It was a huge, a tremendously huge, hideous face. The face of a man who might be as tall as ten tars by my reckoning is spread out across the night sky where the stars have all but disappeared. The people could not believe their eyes and did not know why such a strange thing had happened. Hearing the cries from every room and wing, the inhabitants of the palace came out in droves. Among them were musicians with their musical instruments in their hands, noblewomen with their masks, and even the cook with a leg of lamb and herbs for poultry in his hands. They could not look away from the horrible vision. What a huge and what a disgusting face it would have been. It had a misshapen, distorted mouth, squashed eyelids, and a nose that looked almost like a skull with only a hole in it. His toad-like face looked even more disgusting and horrible because of the reddish-brown hair that was tangled from his narrow forehead to the top of his puffy eyebrows and eyelids. It has its eyes closed, and from its puffy eyelids to its flattened ears, it is covered with filthy splotches. It disappeared into the darkness as if it were blending in from the neck down, so that no matter how he rubbed his eyes, no matter how many times he looked at it again, it still looked like a huge, disgusting, headless creature loosely covering the sky above the silence. But it wasn't even those things that were really the most frightening and disgusting. It is so huge that it covers the middle of the night sky, its lips reach from one hill to another, 
its forehead is bigger than the silent square, and yet, its overall balance and appearance is still a distorted and awkward face that could fit in the palm of your hand. What was particularly frightening and horrifying about this horrific event was the fact that it was indeed the face of a dwarf, grotesquely magnified to a degree that no imaginative Katara playing sculptor could have imagined. And no matter how many times the kings doubted that it was only an illusion, a mere trick of the eye, if not an illusion of some kind, it came with a horrible and terrifyingly real and lingering massiveness, as if the stars had just been striking the silence. It occupied the night sky of the silence, where the stars had been straddling until a moment ago, and turned its blind and unhappy face toward us. Looking up at the apparition aroused in people an inexplicable sense of anxiety and fear. The fact that it is just there, looking down at us, and does not seem to be attacking the earth or having any kind of harmful intentions, on the contrary, elicits an unfathomable shiver. The people looked at each other with frightened eyes and looked around for something that could save them from their anxiety, something that could support them against this monster, a monster that no mere human could stand against. And when they found themselves, they had unwittingly begun to move in a frenzied manner from the cloister towards the Lunarian bushes, in order to get as near as possible to their king. The people of the Palace of Obsidian, from the dignified ladies and nobles of the palace to the lowly errand boys, found the support they sought in the figure of their king, like a mythical hero, who stood majestically in front of the Lunarian bushes with his hands on his hips, his strong chest turned away as if challenging them, and his leopard face turned toward the dwarf in the sky. He found the support he had been looking for, and felt some relief, and even the consolation of being protected and sheltered. They felt that since the king stood here, with his hand on the hilt of his sword, perfectly sane, with his feet planted on the earth, whatever might befall him, the silence would be safe, and they leaned on him like children. Like children. The leopard-headed king spread out his hands as if he were trying to protect his anxious people from the sky monster with his strong body. His eyes glittered in the darkness, showing his determination not to give in, no matter what the blunt, blind face of the sky was up to. For a while, they faced each other, so to speak, on the ground and in the sky, and neither of them moved a muscle. The face of the sky closed its eyes like a huge sleeping moon, as if it were completely oblivious to the threat and fear it posed to the people of the earth. But, ah, someone screamed, and it soon became a cry of terror that came from the mouths of all the people. Slowly very slowly their puffy eyelids are being opened. Caw. Some of the noblewomen fainted and fell, and their knights rushed to help them up. My eyes. The Marquis of Atokia screamed. And he held his eyes with both hands as if his eyes were hurt. It was so horrible that even the weak-minded, not to mention the Marquis of Atkia, could not bear to see what was revealed there, and turned their faces away or closed their eyes. But the leopard king won't budge. His eyes looked straight at the monster that threatened the silence, and he continued to look straight back at the Confucian eyes that were slowly opening up without fear. And it finally opened. Now it could not be any illusion, nor could it be a trick. When I looked into the eyes of the giant dwarf, the eyes that resembled two cracks through which only the wicked, the cruel and the twisted mind could look, I saw that it was alive, that it was unmistakably real, that it was the most wicked, the most cruel, the most twisted mind I had ever seen. And not a single one of them would have doubted that it was such a being, with more evil and terrible darkness surging in its soul than they had ever seen before. It was no longer blind. On the contrary, its white eyes, which seemed to reach from one end of the obsidian palace to the other, stared down at the king and the silent people who followed behind him with a sly malicious satisfaction and mockery. The fear of the people was such that even the majesty of the leopard king could no longer quell it. Panic spread among them like a wave, and again some of the officials fainted and fell, and this time there was no one to help them. And. Help me. Someone shouted and suddenly fled into the depths of the palace, causing the people to stagger and run ahead of him to a place where they could not see his disgusting face. It's the curse of the doll. The doll wanted the silence. Oh, Lord Janus. In an instant, the frozen silence of before was replaced by shouting, and the same screeching and hysterical laughter that had been heard from the direction of the silence earlier, like a group of madmen, filled the chambers and corridors of the Obsidian Palace. 
The giant dwarf in the sky was just hanging in the middle of the sky like a horrible moon, strangely satisfied, as if it was licking its tongue and savoring the panic it had caused without doing anything about it. But there was also a brave and faithful man who, like the frightened Mendori, did not move even after the screaming people had fled indoors. And, of course, the leopard-head king stood staring at the sky during the disturbance, not moving an inch. When he had ascertained that the huge face, though horrible, seemed to have no intention of doing anything except opening its eyes, the king gently removed his hand from the hilt of his sword, and turned around behind him. Now, the only ones left were less than twenty courageous nobles and generals. The Marquis of Langobard, the Marquis of Atosia, the Thousand Dragon General Xenon, who led the Dragon Cavalry, the Guard Commander Curlin, the Thousand Dog General, and the other five generals of the Twelve Knights who were in the palace. Count Paulin, his aide, and Count Gro, the Protector General. And the leopard-headed king's eyes suddenly lit up with an unexpected smile. He saw a slender figure of a woman standing behind the bushes of the Lenoria, biting her lips and holding her naked shoulders with both arms. Verausa. The king approached and put his hand on the dancer's shoulder as if the face in the sky had never existed, and whispered to her. You didn't go. Go to your room, you must be scared. No, it's nothing, my king. The dancer said in a somewhat shaky voice. The king laughed lowly, put his hand around Varousa's body and embraced her as if to reassure her. Then you look around at your loyalists. Someone call the mages. This doesn't look like something that can be dealt with by a sword on earth. I commanded it sharply. And then, Count Gross. Ha! You have sent three hundred guards to Silen. Tell all the guards in the court to lead their troops down the hill and go to Silent City as soon as possible to calm the people's fears and protect the peace. The apparition that appeared in Silent is the same as that one, he said, pointing upwards. Well, sir, let them wait for the morning without being unnecessarily agitated, and let them wait for the morning, and let them not listen to false rumors, and let them cut out their tongues on the spot, and let them walk about touching the towns, whoever disturbs the hearts of men by spreading them or by false information. Disturbances are easy to cause on such a night. Be careful not to let your guard down. Yes, sir. Well, then. Go. The Protector General Gross runs out. The commotion from inside the palace had died down somewhat. Send out an order to all the knights to mobilize immediately. Is. It may be some deep-rooted plot to disturb the minds of men and invade the heart of Chironia in the meantime. Is. Even as he gave the order, the king's eyes were fixed on the sky, and his hand was so tightly clasped that he did not even notice that his daughter was holding his hand in pain. But Varousa did not dare to beg the king to loosen his hand, but gently rubbed her pretty head against his thick shoulder, frowning a little but happy. And do you have a son-in-law? Ha! It's alcohol. The king stretched out the hand that was not holding the dancer, and without looking at the silver cup that was hurriedly offered to him, he took it and held it to his mouth. As he was gulping down the fire wine, throwing down the cup and wiping his mouth, Count Paulin came with three fortune tellers from the palace. Why didn't you come sooner? The king sharply rebuked the fortune tellers but immediately waved his hand. How's it going? I asked you briefly. Is is. The three fortune tellers looked at each other, and then one of the older ones stepped forward and fell on his knees. I don't mean to mislead you, but as soon as we saw the apparition, we retreated to the fortune telling room to find out what it was. We used the Ouija board, the Ouija ball, and each of the three methods to tell our fortunes. Enough with the rhetoric. Just say it. Darkness is sweeping over the divination sphere, sir. The fortune teller looked up at the sky as if frightened and turned away in a panic. I'm afraid that's all we can tell you. This may be an excuse, but when I did my daily horoscope at midday yesterday, there was no sign of any movement that could have heralded such an event. What's more, the stars indicated that the winds of the Black Death had died down and that the silence would finally be illuminated by a bright light. That means. Which means what? This anomaly is caused by that demonic power that can camouflage the movements of the stars that reveal everything at will. Dark power. 
The words came out of the leopard-headed king's mouth, as if he had not thought of them. The fortune-tellers shuddered. They looked at each other again and one of the elders said, With all due respect, I fear that this is an intervention of such immense power that it cannot be dispelled by our spells and curse-busting methods, look at this. What he took out was a prayer stick that had been broken into two pieces. It feels to us as if an evil will is covering the silence in a tremendous fever. The only way to get rid of this noxious miasma is to call in the greatest exorcist of them all. Enough! Gwyn yelled. I know what you're talking about. Why didn't you tell me this in advance? Paul Ann, Paul Ann. Ha! Pull the horse, pull the horse. You're the fastest and the smartest. I'm going to the silence. How dare you! Count Pollen exclaimed in astonishment. An exorcism won't cut it. All you have to do is find out the reason for the mutation, slay whoever is responsible for it, and if it's a curse, stop it at its source. Yalatia, you knew this would happen, you said you'd see me again soon anyway. Yalatia will give you a good idea what to do. If it won't do anything for a while, don't shoot arrows at it and forget about it. Just think of it as a somewhat unsightly moon. Hazos, you take care of the rest. Yes, I understand that, your majesty, but... Like Pollen, the Marquis of Langobard also had a worried look on his face. The leopard-headed king's bizarre appearance was also a relief to be with the mythical guardian god. The king did not care, but gave one last glance to the dwarf Confucian in the sky and quickly walked into the cloister with Verousa in his arms. His confidants rushed to follow. The horse is ready. Right now, gather as many mages as you have, though they will be of no use to you, and give them prayer wheels, prayer sticks, and whatever else they ask. If I'm not back by dawn, send for the rid. The age of this cat will be the most famous story in all of Chironia. The leopard-head king seemed to have finally realized that he was grabbing Varaus's torso. She had been pounding on the king's arm, but now that he was finally paying attention to her, she began to choke up and speak. King. King, I'm coming with you. Take me with you to the the rid. Okay, what do you say? The king chuckled at this. It's nice of you to be concerned, but no matter how much of an arachnid dancer you are, you're just in the way in this case. The way to Yalatia's house is clear now, or if you don't. Like it here and want to return to Terrid, just be patient a little longer. I'm sure by the time I return, I'll have restored peace to the silence and put this monster to rest. No, it's not. Verousa said, puzzled, and stomped her bare feet on the floor. Give me your ear, my king. What the hell? The king said, but he had no choice but to put his ear close to Verousa's mouth. Verousa looked nervous. You know, I'd feel bad if I wasn't. Thinking about it a lot, but I know that little guy. What? This time, the king howled. He grabs Verousa by the shoulders and picks her up. She screams in pain. Is it true, Valersa? I think. You're a resident of the Spell Alley on the Terrid. I don't think it's any surprise that a dwarf who can play tricks like that would pass through the spell path at some point. That's reasonable, too. Growling, Gwyn admitted. Can you remember where and when you saw him? I'm trying to remember, Verousa said. But since we're wasting time, put me on the king's horse and take me to Terrid with you. I want to help the king, and in this case, it's much more useful to take me alone than ten soldiers. The king groaned. But he nodded right away. Yalatia told you. You are the golden shield, and you will do what you feel is best. Now, follow me, what is it, Hazos? What's wrong? No, your majesty's thoughts are always right. The Marquis of Langobard looked at the dancer in disbelief. Voluka didn't care. Come on, let's go. And can I have the dagger, too? You can't do that. You're new here. Don't you think it's possible that he might try to kill you? But the king laughed and snatched the ornate dagger from the guard and threw it to his daughter. She caught it dexterously in the air and put it in her sash. I need a hooded cloak. And are you ready for the horse? It's all in order. 
Guided by his attendants, the king walked along, fastening his thick cloak to the shoulder braces, putting on his hood, and buttoning the braces in front. For this king, the only way to be secretive was to wear a hood, even in the middle of summer, which made any disguise virtually impossible. The group hurried through the palace and went around to the back entrance to avoid being seen. The palace of Obsidian seemed to be shaking with some kind of uneasy creeping and whispering. The feast was over, of course, and the people had returned to their rooms and their posts, but there must have been few in all Cylon, let alone Obsidian Palace, who were sleeping peacefully. Looking up from the window, there was a huge, ugly face staring straight down at them, and though it did nothing, it could do anything at any moment, and the feeling of defenselessness, that they could do nothing about the threat above them, aroused an inexplicable anxiety and hesitation. And that feeling of defenselessness, that they could do nothing about the threat above them, aroused unutterable anxiety and hesitation. Therefore the women embraced one another, and the men gathered together everywhere, and they were anxiously looking up at the roofs, and whispering to one another in secret. Some of them, though they had been forbidden to speak in tongues, would say falsely that the Confucian dwarf in the sky was a ghost of the past, whom their king had killed in his long wanderings, and that he had now come at the right time to revenge himself on him. Or, more directly, that it was a calamity caused by the fact that a leopard-headed man, half-beast, half-man, had taken the holy throne of Chironia. But when the king led his entourage and the Arachnean dancers down the long corridor, the whispering ceased immediately and the people stood still and watched him go. In the Obsidian Palace, which, as the name implies, was a beautiful mosaic of black and white, there was not a single person in the palace who, even if they really believed in such a falsehood, doubted that it was the king, the only leopard-headed king, who would dispel the evil. A fine saddle was placed on the horse, and in front of the saddle was a woolen rug for Varousa to ride upon. The leopard-headed king nodded to his entourage, who wanted to follow him, and waved his hand to reassure them. I'll be back by dawn, but in the morning light it will be gone for good. That sort of thing belongs to the night. The king said and jumped on the horse with an agility that belied his great size. Take care of it, Hazos. Again he calls out to the Marquis of Langobard. The trusted aide graciously places his left hand on his chest. The king stretched out his hand, grasped Varousa's hand and pulled her up to the saddle. He made sure Velusa was calm. All right, open the gate. Just as I was about to give the order. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. Someone came rolling in. It's the runt of the litter. What's wrong? Your Majesty, that's... The sky. What about it? It's gone. Yes, no. Even the lips of the peasant had lost their color. The king jumped out of the horse and ran to a room with a window, where he could see the sky. His aides followed him. Take that, take that. Ran seemed to be on the verge of losing his self-control. Frantically, he pointed out the window and ruffled his hair. At first sight, the entourage stood still. And King Chironia. Your Majesty, oh, Majesty. Have the silence. Have the silence gone mad? What on earth what on earth has possessed the silence to make such a such a mad place? The people hardly even heard the muffled, trembling whispers of the peasants. Oh, now there's a strange face between them and the silent night sky. If the face of the dwarf stretches to the east of Cylon, the tip of his chin to Windhill, and his forehead to the center of the city, the face of the new dwarf stretches from the west end of Silent to the south, from Water Hill to Bird Hill. The new face occupies the whole area from the west end of Silent to the south, from the Water Hill to the Bird Hill. It was almost as large as the face of the previous dwarf, but this one was clearly not a dwarf or anything resembling one. In fact, as a face itself, it could even be said to be well formed. But people looked up at it with a disgust and horror more serious than that of a dwarf. It was the face of a pale, bloodless man of mature age or early old age, like a dead man, and if it had not been so tremendously magnified, the beholder would have said that the man was probably born in the east, in Hainam or Katai. It was a well-balanced face, almost aristocratic, with long, thin white lips, a long nose, 
and a chin that was slack in a way that indicated apathy and malice. On his head, unlike that of the people he faced, hung a head of dark hair, neatly trimmed. On his forehead was a thin copper ring, which seemed to be engraved with strange, non-human hieroglyphics. But the people were not distracted by those features. For they were so completely absorbed by the greatest and most blasphemous feature of the face, which anyone would have noticed if he had seen it, that they could not look away from it. That monster face had no eyes. Literally, he has no eyes. In the place where the eyes should be, there are only two empty eye sockets, black and open as if they were lingering scars. It was a feature that made the owner look even more miserable and distorted because he had such a full face. And that's not all, in place of the two lost eyes, as if to say, there is a vertical cleft running between the holes of the dark eyes, between the eyebrows where the thin bridge of the nose ends. And then, suddenly, just as when the dwarf's eyes had opened earlier, but because they were upright, they opened like a wound with the skin spreading to the left and right. The king gasped. It would have been less astonishing if a third eye had appeared there, with eyes and a gleam in its eye, staring at him. But what appeared between the eyebrows of that eyeless face was nothing more than a grotesque prosthetic eye painted in stone. It looked like the eye of some kind of divine statue, with its clumsily carved features and even the hole for the iris, but as the only prosthetic eye in a face with no eyes, it seemed to me that it would be the most useless of all. However, people noticed that the eyes, which looked like toy eyes made of stone, were obviously different from what they appeared to be, and if they had proper eyesight, they could even move and chase after moving objects. If it had proper eyesight, it could even move and chase after moving objects. For, when the new face opened its eyes, the face of the miserable dwarf, which had previously loomed in the eastern sky, changed its expression as if it had been struck by something, and seemed to recede somewhat to the east. At that moment, the eyes of the stone followed the face and moved in a dizzying manner. That was the final blow to this disgusting apparition. The stone eyes moved, and under the swollen eyelids of the people who until then seemed to have been amused by the sight of the people below them going right and left, the bloodshot eyes moved as if in a panic, and when they glared at the stone eyes as if they were snakes, a moment of madness broke out in the people. Immediately, the obsidian palace was filled with mad screams, muffled laughter, and screeching voices that could not be controlled by themselves. A lady with disheveled hair came running out of her chamber and pulled on a costly nightgown, and people fanned the sky and threw themselves to the ground, begging for mercy from those two disgusting monsters who had covered the whole sky. Help me. Help me. Judgment. The final judgment is upon us. The silence are doomed. A frenzied scream passed from mouth to mouth, and the guards, quiet. Silence. And quickly spread throughout the palace. They were in a panic with no way out. If only someone had pointed to Gwyn or someone else and shouted, it's all his fault. The panic would have easily turned into a riot. In fact, at that moment, the king and his entourage were frozen in place, and the guards came pouring in, drenched in sweat. There is a riot in Silen. Incited by Miguel's followers, who claim that this outrage is the work of the Myrox, roughly 2,000 to 3,000 workers and women are throwing stones at the Temple of Miroku and setting it on fire. He screamed. And all the men below the king ran to the window that overlooked the Silen city. And they saw. The silence are on fire. Although the fire had not yet spread to any great extent, the king saw the fire in the darkness as the screams of his people and the joyous dance of the devil. Oh my god! The leopard-headed king roared. The rage of the wounded lion turned his eyes, which had gradually turned yellow, into blue fires of white-hot anger. He looked back sharply. The two faces, like monsters, glaring at each other in the eastern and western skies, stared at each other as if they were not even concerned at the moment with the disturbances they had caused on the earth, and their eyes, one like a serpent's, burning with shade and fire, the other carved in stone, were filled with hatred and enmity that they could not even look into. Their eyes, one of which was like a serpent, burning in the shade, the other carved in stone, seemed to be filled with hatred and enmity that they could not bear to look into. Gwyn barked suddenly and loudly. 
He grabbed the dancer by the waist, threw her behind the horse and, without even using the treadmill, mounted the horse. Without even looking back at the panic-stricken lords of Langobard, he kicked the horse hard in the side. Open gate. Silence. The king's roar rang out in the darkness. It must have been one of those strange and frightening nights that can be counted on the fingers of even the longest and rarest of adventures of Gwyn the leopard-headed king. The night was deep and the road went down from Wind Hill to Silen. The road from the Palace of Obsidian to the city of Silen, which was usually crowded until late at night with mules of the guardians and the merchants who delivered goods to the palace, did not carry a single person on such a strange night. There is no moon or stars in the sky, and if you look up, you will see only two huge, deformed faces looking down at you with a devilish sneer. It was a nightmarish sight. The reed-haired steed carrying the leopard-headed king and Varousa, who clung to him, rode on, watched by the huge dwarf and his stony-eyed face. The king's cloak fluttered in the wind, and Varousa's long hair swept behind her like a beautiful stream. The king's cloak fluttered in the wind, and Varousa's long hair waved behind her like a beautiful stream. No matter how far she went, the huge face did not change its position, so that no matter how far she went, she felt as if she had not progressed at all. In Gwyn's hand was a wolfskin whip, and he struck horse on the side of the head incessantly. The horse was running at a fearful pace, but it seemed that it was not enough. The wind whistled in the ears of the girl who clung to him and behind him, and it seemed to them as if they were riding on a cloud, with the wind at their feet. It was a gallop that would have thrown him off if he had let up even a little. The princess of Terid, her bare arms wrapped tightly around the king's strong waist, her long black hair fluttering behind her, her cheeks flushed as if she were the poster child for speed and wind, leapt up in triumph, put her mouth to the king's ear, and cried out, My king! Awesome! This is amazing! This horseman looks like Dagon the wind god's favorite horse. It's already so far away from the palace lights like that. Hold on tight, if you fall you won't have time to come back for it. The king shouted back angrily. Varousa laughed aloud, and finally clung firmly to the man's torso, rubbing herself against him. The king did not even turn his head, wondering if the warm, smooth, firm touch of her skin washed over his sunburned back. Hey, king! And Varousa cries out in the wind. I'm about to go on a great adventure with the king. What? What did you say? I can't hear you, Gwyn yells. With enraptured eyes, Varousa gazed at the deformed warrior she clung to. I said it's great to be with you. What? Gwyn listens again. His round ears flattened against the skin of his head in the wind, and his eyes narrowed. Varousa laughed in a throaty voice and rubbed her cheek against the king's back. It's nothing. She whispered to the leopard head king's back. In the meantime, Horse had crossed the dark road down the hill and entered the city of Silen. Silen, commonly called the City of the Seven Hills, has seven great gates leading to the city through the roads on each hill. Their horses were immediately stopped at the gate of the city. Wait, where are you going? A group of militia guarding the gate of the wind came and intercepted them. The Leopard King's orders are not to let a single peep into or out of the silent compound until tonight. Or you'll have the bill. No, I don't, but... The king pulls off his hood to reveal the face of a leopard. It's me. Ah. This is your majesty. No need to thank me at this time. Do you need a replacement horse? Water this horse and let it rest. Ha, I'm home. Which protector guards the wind gate? I am Viscount Lopas of the Fourth Protectorate. Where are you? Here. A protector, armed and with a sword in his hand, came running out and kneeled down. With a wave of his hand. What's the situation in the city? The king asked. The protector said in a sorrowful voice, It is not good. The protectorate has managed to stop the fire at the Temple of Miroku, but the people are in a state of unrest and we cannot subdue them alone if there are more outbreaks. In fact, men and women of all ages, clothed and unclothed, shouting that the Silens are cursed and desperately trying to flee the city, have flocked to the seven gates, and a considerable number have already disappeared into the night. If your majesty had known that we had arrived and closed the seven gates a little later, 
Silon would have become a dead city with no inhabitants. Are the seven gates well guarded? For now. But I fear, your majesty, if the people once again attempt to flee the seven gates and the cursed city, the guardians, so few in number and divided among the seven gates, will not be able to stop them. The protectorate alone, divided into seven gates, will not be able to stop them. I hope that the twelve knights will go into battle as soon as possible. Bollocks! The king said in a sharp voice. From the dragon knights, the finest in Chironia, to the swallow knights, our messengers, the sixty thousand elite of the twelve knights are dedicated to defending Chironia from foreign enemies. We cannot turn that army against the people of Chironia, but if we don't, don't worry about it, the king said firmly. I have come down through the night to the silence to rid the world of this evil and to put the hearts of men at rest. All right, let's go. Which way? Tear it. The king replied with a single word, and then dismissed the ravings of the dismayed protector, who said that the crowds were most dangerous and that he could not be responsible for them. The horse is here. Good. She jumps on the new horse and pulls Velusa up. Put your hood back on. Protect them well. The leopard-headed king and his companion, who had given the horse a warning and whipped him again, immediately disappeared across the street, the sound of their hooves echoing on the cobblestones. As I entered the city, the apparition above me became even more apparent. Hey, king, Verausa says uneasily. They they look like they've come down a lot more than before. It must be the eyes. It's not. Look at me. The king looked up as Valersa pulled him to his feet and a low growl in the back of his throat. Indeed, the two faces seemed to have descended much closer to the roofs of the houses than when I had looked up at them earlier in the gardens of the Obsidian Palace. Now its malevolent narrow eyes and thick lips, its unspoken stone eyes and delicate face, will soon cover the entire silent city and swallow it whole. We have to hurry, the Leopard King said firmly. What are we gonna do now? Go to Magical Alley and find Yulatia. Hmm. She made a noise she didn't like. But I'm sure you won't have time to find out. What? Why? I have a feeling. We won't know that until we try. Anyway, Valersa, do you still remember where you saw the dwarf in the alley? I'm trying to remember, but there's a lot of strange things living in Magical Alley, and there's a constant stream of people coming from far away. Verausa said absent-mindedly. How about that stone I face over there? Hmm. I don't know. They rushed horse. Gradually the road became narrower and more tortuous. They went from back street to back street, avoiding the wide streets as much as possible, lest they should run into the mob of frightened citizens. At length, as they were about to enter the neighborhood of Terrid, they dismounted and took up the reins. It seemed as if Silen had become a dead city. The people have turned into rioters and threatened the temples of paganism, or flock to the seven gates to escape from the city, and those who have not already done so have fled to the stone cellars to avoid seeing the monstrosities in the sky. They must be praying to God. There was not a soul to be seen passing through this area near the center of the city, and it looked even more desolate than when the city was ravaged by the Black Death, as if all men had died out. And in the sky was the face of a monster. The king. Valersa twitched and stopped in her tracks. Hey, can you hear me? Or, or that racket in the distance. I think it's the protectorate holding back the people who are opening the seven gates and begging to be let out of Silen. No, it's not. Verausa looked like she was starting to get scared. The king was about to open his mouth to pacify him when it was heard. Rules. B.A. Lu rules. Ba. It sounded like a woody spirit on the wind, coming from a terrible distance, but soon the woody voice was heard again, and this time it sounded much clearer and closer. And at last it became a fearful, voiceless voice that rang out above them all. Rule ba. Rule ba. Don't you hear me, Reliba? My king. Verausa screamed and jumped at Gwyn. Her shrill, voiceless voice was like a thunderclap, and seemed to strike their ears with a tremor of air rather than an echo. My king. What's that? Mm. The king looked around, and suddenly stood stiffly. Verausa followed the king's gaze and put her hand over her mouth. The face of the sky the face of the giant, 
hard to see dwarf has come back to life. Its sideways mouth, like that of a toad, opened again, and the same thunderous voice that had called out earlier poured out from it, shaking the silence loose. Luluba, Luluba, blind fortune teller of Katai, unskilled pupil of Gracious. Are you deaf, or are you asleep? I. The face with the stone eyes, the pale eastern face, opened its mouth. Their voices, emanating from their pale lips, reverberated around them as if they were surrounded by a wall of stone and not the vast night sky. Who is it that calls me? Who calls my name? Oh, I see you. It's Iraha. The filthy kitchen rat, the cheap sorcerer of Bud Gaia. So, I lack, why do you call my name so knowingly? Iraha. Ilaha. Suddenly, Varausa gave a small cry and grasped the king's arm in a tense manner. The two faces facing the sky seem unconcerned with such earthly events. How? This is Rolba, the eyeless one, the stony-eyed one, the beholder who cannot see even the butterfly under his nose, you accuse this Iraha of being a cheap sorcerer, but why do you also come here with your unabashed scowl? Oh, Iraha. In this day and age, there is no other place for you than in the muck of Canaris, the cursed city of the crippled Ferrara. But you, you dwarf Iraha, why do you stand before this Rolba and dare to be so arrogant as to use your false magic? Oh, Lulova, Lulova. The dwarf Iraha seems to have gone mad. If he had arms and legs, he would have wielded them. The little man clenched his teeth in anger. Foolish magic. You maggot, you're nothing more than a fragment roasted in the fire before my magic. Iroloba, swine of Katai, you incompetent louse who disappointed Gracious the Dark Priest. I asked you first. Normally I would never speak to a lowly servant like you, let alone a great sorcerer like Iraha, but at this critical moment I'm glad you're willing to turn a blind eye. Now I ask you once more the question of Ilak, ruler of the darkness of Budagaya, high priest of Dole, ruler of the seven-colored night. Answer with patience, you worm of the east. Why did you choose this night to show up here? It's a silly question that doesn't deserve an answer. The rule of the stone eyes entered the room. His voice rang out over the seven hills. In the first place, you have eyes, but you can't see in broad daylight, just like the triple-strength emperor of Canaris. But before I give you the answer, let me ask you something. Why are you here? Rule B.A., Rule B.A., Rule B.A. Iraha's face twisted into a frown of anger. You coward. You dare to steal the sacred secret from my mouth. You're born and bred in the thieving city of Khotan, a thief, a swindler, a ruiner. You can't tell me. You can't tell me no matter what. Of course you can't understand the sacred secrets of the moon and stars. You've only been following me around, hoping to take advantage of me. You shameless, corrupt nobleman, assassin of Kitai, dog of Thessis. Well said, you ear-splitting monster of a mouth, you crook of Bud Gaia. Roba laughed in a hushed voice. The stone's blind eyes fluttered. If you want to get it out of my mouth so badly, I'll go along with your cunning scheme knowing everything. Who in this world, who calls himself a magician, who knows the mystic words of the stars, who does not know what the last day of this month, the year of the cat, the blue moon, is like. If there is such a thing, I lack, it is only a creature like you who cannot be seen. Because I am kind-hearted and pity you, let me tell you this, on this day, not far from now, the seven red stars, commonly called the seven stars of the north, will enter the temple of the lion. This is the sign of the great synod of the six hundred years and the lion's palace is the land of the leopards in Chironia. Well, I lack, if I tell you this much, you will know that it is you and I who have been so ignorant as to come to the lion's land to take advantage of it. Hurrah! Well said. Iraha shouted. Apparently, there was even a crack of triumph in that cry. The Lord has read my star map in vain. Bandits of Khotan. There are many mages in the world, but not enough to know about that coven on the fingers of both hands, because that coven is known only by recording more advanced movements that never appear on ordinary star charts. 
The reason is that the meeting of the seven stars is known only by recording more advanced movements which are never shown in ordinary star charts. A gigantic dark nebula stretches between the seven stars, which are now heading for the lion's palace, and the eyes of the earth, obstructing our vision. Therefore, most astrologers and mages should be blinded by that dark nebula and not be able to see the meeting that is taking place behind it. Most of them are. The stony-eyed Rolba cried out with great malice and mockery. But I'm not like most astrologers and mages. I am a disciple of Gracious, the dark priest, and the only true heir to him, so that the dark nebula is no longer dark to me, and any movement of the stars means as much to me as a heart. Then I realized at once. The meaning of this once in six hundred years anomaly in the stars. It is the gathering of the power of the stars in the here and now, and the finding of the one being who represents that power, who is that power. Suddenly, Aryuelba stopped talking as if in a panic, and then suddenly cried out in indignation. I, you miscreant, you tricky sorcerer, you devil-may-care hoarder. You want to seduce people, get them to talk, and then snatch the power from my hands without effort. Iraha, just because you have such a crooked face, I didn't expect you to have such a twisted nature, you iron-fisted scum of the dole, the dark horse's dripping black shit. What do you mean, you've read my star map? On the face of the sky, Rorba and Irak cursed each other foully for a while as if the other had stolen their plan, and hurled words of curse and attack at each other. For a while the mob forgot to raise their sticks and weapons, the frightened children ceased to cry, and even the guardians could not even think of shooting arrows at them. I lacked the dwarf and Ruba the stony-eyed, the two headless mages. It was a strange world, beyond the reach and understanding of the peaceful people of the earth, and they could do nothing to help it, even though they knew that it was deciding their own fate as if they were the rhinoceroses of yarn. Whether they knew it or not, the silent citizens on the ground were stunned and bewildered, and after a few moments of foul-mouthed bickering, the two mages, or rather, their heads, suddenly stopped bickering. They suddenly stopped shouting at each other. No matter how many times we repeat this nonsense, it's a waste of time. We both know what we're capable of, don't we? Iraha says, moving her toad-like mouth. This is not the quarrel I started. But it is somewhat childish. Iraha, Iraha of Buddhagaya, it seems that you are right. We have both read the same stars and flown from our respective homes to this land of lions with the same goal in mind. And as long as that is the case, we both know very well what the rare power that caused the meeting of the seven stars is, and why obtaining it means that we will be the first silence to take possession of Nakahara itself, and thus the entire world. I'm sure you're well aware of that, aren't you? I. But Iraha, that power cannot be shared between two people, and we do not need two masters for one darkness, even if we were to take this sweet, juicy fruit, the silen, and eat it for starters. That's a story for another time, Rorba. At any rate, isn't it important for us now to turn this silen into a city of darkness worthy of us? Oh, there's no doubt about it. So be it, for the dark horses of Gluck are not so easy to ride as they seem. Let us unite our forces, summon the horses of Grak, take possession of the silence, and then fight to see who will take their place on the throne. H.M. Very well, as long as I am the one who will be the final victor. I say, I say. But no matter. The silen is a tremendously sweet fruit. It's here, ripe and ready to be plucked. Rule bar, there's no law against plucking it. Not at all. The stony-eyed Ruba replied. But the eyes of the stone, which were cut vertically in the middle of his forehead, were slowly being squeezed out, and the outline of his face was also slowly being obscured by something like a cloud. Seeing this, I lack the dwarf's puffy eyelids began to droop a little. And when the mouth of the dwarf was shut, and his swollen eyes were shut so tightly that it was impossible to tell whether or not there was a bloodshot eyeball beneath them, and neither of their heads spoke any more, a terrible silence fell upon the place. A horrible silence fell around them. The people of Silen could not believe their fate, so clearly foretold by the horrible demon in the sky, but when they lifted up their eyes, they saw two horrible faces, as they had been when they first appeared, eyes closed, mouths closed, speaking as if they had never spoken. 
They hung in the sky to the east and west of the silence as if they had never been there before, as if some nightmarish action had turned the pale moon of Iris into such a huge, swollen face. Only a deadly silence reigned in the city. The people of Silen, mothers and babies alike, looked into the eyes of the sacrificial lamb, and those who had the least faith chanted the name of their god with trembling lips, praying that he would rid them of this evil, and cursing Dole. The two faces did not open their mouths again, but floated and drifted in the hollow, as if they were preparing for the coming hard labor by devouring the sleep of the black lotus, scaring the silent sleep. King Verausa, the Arachnian dancer, cried out in astonishment. She finally noticed that her companion, an exceptionally tall and strong man with a hood covering his face, was holding her arm, and that his hand was shaking violently with a terrible force in his thick fingers. My king my hand hurts. Oh I'm sorry. The leopard-head king of Chironia noticed and removed his finger from his daughter's slender arm. Verausa's arm was bruised with the marks of the big finger. What's the matter, my king? The daughter furrowed her brow and peered into the hood. The leopard-headed king shook his head, his voice trembling with the fierce and deep anger that only the rightful and destined heir to the throne could have. I will not let such a disgusting, wooden messenger free even a single rock or blade of grass in Chironia as long as I am here. He said it in a stifled voice, but his eyes, peering out from under his hood, were blazing with fury, like those of a wild animal. My king. A reminder to you all that the king of Chironia is here and will defend the silence. You filthy little demons of darkness. My king, my king. Voluka is trembling. Of course, a king wouldn't lose to a ghost like that, but... What's that noise? What? The king lifted up his head and inclined his head in the hood to hear better, and growled low in his throat. There's a strange sound filling the silence. The sound came from somewhere, or rather, it sounded like something that had been lurking in the depths of the earth, in the air, and in the sky from the beginning, summoned by some unworldly evil spell, and gradually increasing in intensity. It's... It's not a sound that can be described as anything at all. But in the air, there are a lot of invisible and frightening things, disgusting creatures and non-living things that are moving around on their own, and the strange sounds that they make by themselves come together and become a sound that evokes a monstrous fear that nothing in the world can create. That's what it sounds like. It is the kind of sound that makes you indescribably anxious, afraid, and disgusted to hear it. There is a sound as if something long and fuzzy were crawling along, slithering, slithering. And then there was a sound like the tip of a long, sharp beak boring a hole in a rotten tree, and a clattering, clattering sound like a man dragging a chain around, and a sound that could not be described as dragging a very soft, rotten thing around. The sound of sobbing, fur brushing against fur, and the sound of a hyena-like animal deep in the throat. The sound of wind, wings, and footsteps, together with the incessant moaning, whimpering, squealing, and gasping, and the most horrible screams in the world, constantly stirred my nerves. But these horrible sounds were like waves of sound, rushing to the left, rushing to the right, and rushing back at you when you thought you were going to fall. Their very changeability stirred up fear in people as if they were aiming at them as if they were alive in themselves. Therefore, the silent people were immediately chased by the sound, and began to run away in disorder, easily losing even their last reason, even the militia was not an exception. And they fled from street to street, screaming and crying out for help, pursued by the sounds of the unseen monsters. Their fear was aroused by the absence of any visible threat, and they fled from the main streets into the smaller back streets, only to be frightened away again by the loud laughter of the demons that rose up from under their feet and those who fled into the houses came screaming out at once. The silence now seemed to have gone completely mad. A moment ago, Silent had looked like an uninhabited, dead city, but now it was just as it should be, and in house after house there were so many old people, men and women, mothers and children, crying and running about as if they had gone mad, that it was hard to believe that there were so many people living in Silent. They were running around like crazy. Some of them fell down and were crushed and could not get up again, while others were so terrified that they went mad and kept laughing and laughing. 
It was a catastrophe without enemies, a catastrophe without bloodshed. My king, oh, my king. In the midst of all this, the king of Chironia stood alone in an unshaken position, as if he were a bridgehead against the oncoming enemy forces. His whole body was filled with a deep and stern rage, and he seemed to be enveloped by a white-hot electric current. My king, my king. Varousa cried out and pulled at the king's hand, urging him to leave. The king refuses to budge. The sounds of the demons from around him and the screams and exclamations of his people interspersed with them seemed to have turned him into a stone statue. My king, my king, I'm scared. Varousa screamed. The king brought the dancer to him and made short work of her. Don't worry. It's a disturbing spirit poltergeist, and they can't do any real harm. I told her. Velusa shook out her rich black hair. I know you're scared, but I'm scared. Besides, they're going to come at us. Don't worry about it. Again the king said strongly. His eyes glittered, showing that he was more angry and furious than ever at the sudden and unreasonable nightmare that had befallen his country. Varousith suddenly shuddered and hugged herself with both arms. Suddenly, she felt that the half-breed, half-human hero standing with his arms crossed in front of him was more terrifying than the screaming, poltergeist horror that surrounded her, or even the two huge faces that lay motionless when she looked up. My king. Varousa was about to say, as she hesitantly tried to put her hand on his arm. But then she was startled by a figure that came around the corner into the street, and she gulped down her words. The man, it was a man, was in such a hurry that when he saw them standing in the middle of the road, he could neither stop nor dodge, but plunged headlong. But the king dodged just in time, and like a bull that has been successfully dodged by a bullfighter, he plunged face first into the cobblestones and turned around in a rage. Hey, 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 what the hell are you doing here? He was ranting. What are you doing wandering around here growing roots in this time of crisis? Ho! Oh. A low laugh escaped from the king's throat. Then the king slowly uncrossed his arms and approached the little villain, who was still on his haunches, as gravely as if he were in the audience chamber of a palace. It's a coincidence, isn't it? arsenal of the cave rats. King, King. R's eyes rolled back in horror as he saw the unbelievable. He looked at the king and Varousa in a dazed and frightened manner, just as Natozlmik had done. What are you doing wandering around here all by yourself on this horrible night? Even Arachne's daughter, oh, really? No, but, my king. Now this is the worst place for you to be. Oh, just get over here. Just get into those houses. We were almost trampled by those madmen and we had to run here. They're all out of their minds. They're running around like elephants, trampling everything in sight, running from street to street, gasping for breath. Ours urged the king and Varousa to go to a house nearby. What, even the ones in this house are running around outside, shouting for Janus mercy. What a crazy country we've become, these people, breathing hard, exhausted, ready to collapse, but so scared that they just can't stop running around. I can't stop running around, you know. If you leave him alone, he'll keep running around like that until he collapses and dies, crying like that, being chased by invisible demons. Oh, man, I'm so tired. Oh, I got something for you. R spotted a meal for several people still on the stone tabletop. It was cold, but perhaps the inhabitants of the house had just prepared dinner and were about to sit down at the table when a strange cry arose outside and they rushed out. He quickly took up the unglazed jar, drank a gulp of beer, wiped his mouth with his sleeve, and reached for the cold meat on the table. Then he noticed the reproachful look in Varousa's eyes. It's wasted on them anyway. All food is a gift from Janus, god of fertility and life. It's only right that we don't waste it. He took the meat off the bone and began to eat it with gusto, as if he had not eaten for days. Would you like one, my king? It's quite good cold, too. No, good. What's wrong with Tina? Is the goddess Tina healed? The king, who had taken off his hood and was leaning against the window, asked him. Ars, holding the meat on the bone, suddenly began to cry. It's a shame, you remembered me, dear, 
my only goddess Tina, with hands and feet whiter than tits, had already turned into a scabby black mole by the time I got back. Although I cried out to her to get rid of her, there was no way that I could easily find a casket with such a fine jewel after losing the golden spoon, and besides, after the evil of the Black Death, no one would be interested in buying a woman. That's why, Ashia, I haven't been able to get a good meal or bed for the past couple of days. In the meantime, however, he was busy alternating between the meat on the bone in his right hand and the bread he had rolled up in his left. Veloso looked on in dismay, then ducked down and approached the king. The king, his hands on his hips, gazed out of the window at the silent streets, his jaw tightly set, his eyes piercing. My king, what are you looking at? Valersa asked as she put her hand on his arm. It's empty. The leopard-headed king was bitter. Don't you think it's funny? I've been counting on the light of morning to shine upon the earth and end this night of madness before the grace of the sun god lure. In the morning. When the light of reason and sanity fills the world, the silent citizens will cease to wander, the poltergeists will retreat in search of the darkness that is their home, and for the time being, at least until night comes again, the anomaly will subside. Then we can use that time as a reprieve to plan our countermeasures. However, I left the palace of the Obsidian after the Bell of the Ox, so it must have been at least five days since then, so the short night of the blue moon must have dawned long ago. However, the king vaguely stretched out his hand and pointed around. You shall see. Velursa, what do you think? Velursa put a strand of hair in her mouth. She chews thoughtfully on the tip of her long, silky hair. It's dark. He murmurs hesitantly. But isn't that because of those two monsters? No, there can't be that many mages in the world who can bring the fading night back to life across the entire silent city. But those two, those two. Iraha and Rolba, they sounded like great mages. Verousa said, but at once a loud, mocking laugh broke out close to her ear, and she jumped and scampered like a burned cat. It's a noisy spirit poltergeist. Suit the king. Maybe. But they also said they were disciples of Gracious. The great black magic of Brachmajitsk, which can extinguish the sun and keep some regions of the world in the long night, can be performed without any difficulty by the dark priest Gracious himself, but not by a mere disciple. It just occurred to me. By the way, Velusa, did you have any idea who that dwarf Iraha was? That's it. I forgot. Veluka coughed. You know, as soon as I heard the name Ilak, I remembered. I was at Arachne's, in the spell path with Dwella, just as I was about to say it. Wow! Arza's scream rang out. They both turned around in panic. What's wrong, Ars? Whoa! My king! What's this? There's a lot of horrible horses on my head. Oh, I'm being crushed. Help me! What the fuck? The king and Verousa stared at Ars, who had crawled under the table with his head in his hands, but at the next moment they, too, involuntarily covered their heads with their arms and plopped down on the floor. Oh, a horrible horde of giant hippopotamuses is hurtling towards the sky above the silence. And the thunderous roar of their feet, and the sound of their footsteps, and even their wild snorting, would deafen their ears, and they would come nearer and nearer. My king. You'll be crushed. Ars cried out. The king's eyes blazed with green, and suddenly he leaned out of the window and looked up at the sky. A low, a terrible roar escaped from his clenched mouth. Except for the black clouds that covered the sky, there was nothing to be seen there, except for the winged celestial horses that seemed to be galloping across the dark sky of the silence. Even the haunting faces of Rolba and Ilak were no longer visible, as if they had melted away in a cloud blacker than the ink of a raft. And then, just like a herd of wild bronchs galloping through the darkened skies of the silence, only countless invisible hoof beats litter the sky. Gluck's horse. The king heard Varouse's scream and turned. She was shaking and trembling. Arachne said. The horses of Gluck in the land of Yomi are barely held together by the hair of a dole. But once it strikes, not even the doll herself can stop it until it has crushed everything on earth and turned it into scorched earth. 
Oh, if that's Gluck's horse if it's really Gluck's dark herd of horses, then today is the last day for the silence and all the people who live there. He's from Zosik. I've heard of that, too, from the gypsy woman. Ours also shouted. Then, it began to rain. It was as if the black clouds carried by the horses of Grak had brought rain, wind, thunder, and storm. The lightning flashed and the roar of thunder shook the seven hills, and the cries and screams of the people were drowned out by the sound of the wind, which resembled the loud laughter of the demons of hell. Oh! Look! The pale Varousa clings desperately to her king and points out the window. There, in the midst of the torrential rain, a number of strange shapes are dancing about. They were pale, washed-out skeletons, and whenever they were momentarily illuminated by lightning, they would raise their bony hands, shuffle their feet, and clatter their white chins, as if they were laughing out loud. Overhead, in the midst of the thunderstorm, the horses of Gluck are still dancing in an unseen wild dance with a sound similar to thunder, but more piercing. My king! Ars let out a scream. Seeing the way he was shouting, the resolute leopard-headed king also let out a cry. In the midst of the rain and darkness, there stood something terrifyingly huge. It looked like a man, and it looked nothing like a man, but it was twice as tall as the leopard-head king. And the creature that flashed forth in the blue light seemed to have one huge, red eye, a mouth with fangs like that of a beast, and hairy lower limbs. When it moved, the sound of its hooves rang out on the cobblestones of the silence, and it happily caught up with the poor people who were running away, and put its feet down on them, turning the area into a sea of blood. Screams and sour noses were interspersed with torrents of rain and thunder. Ars crumpled to the floor in a heap, ruffling his hair and screaming curses at the doll. Oh, Lord Janus! It's the last day of the silence. We're all going to die at the hands of those fiends. Gwyn looked back at the little villain. There was a crazy red light in his eyes. Not yet, King Chironia exclaimed. Not yet. Then he flung back his cloak, jumped to the window, and ran into the rain, the lightning, and the tumult of monsters. Ars and Varousa forgot their fear and ran. Don't leave me, my king. Where are you going? I'm at Eulatius. I'm not staying here and letting the silence be overrun by monsters. I can't. Whoa, there it is. Ars let go of his hold on the king's leg and fell flat on his back. He seemed to have lost his back. The beastly monster that was trampling the fleeing people in the streets just now has appeared from where and is standing right in front of the king. It's dangerous. Varousa cried out and, as if by some miracle, her bonds were broken and she ran to the king and embraced him. But the king restrained her. The king's eyes stared into the eyes of the red fluttering monster far above him, and his hand clutched fearlessly at the hilt of the great sword at his waist. And the eyes of a huge red monster, reminiscent of those of a bird, also cannot be removed from above the king. I.G. And when they thought that a strange and distressing sound was coming from their heads, the king and his daughter heard the voice of something clear and loud in their heads. I am I.G. Sog hoofed I.G. Sog. Who has been looking for you, leopard-headed warrior? Now, come with me. Gwyn ducked like he'd been hit. Then he looked up at the huge, deformed thing with suspicion and tried to open his mouth. But then, wait, Gwyn. A single voice rang out over the thunder. Don't be fooled. That's what they're trying to do to you. At the same time, the darkness gathered in front of them and began to take shape. And at last it has shown its full face. Chapter 3 The Seven Mages Tamiya Gwyn's roar, struck by surprise, pierced the darkness. Tamiya, the Black Witch. Yeah, that's me. The darkness cried out. And at the same time, all the darkness that had almost congealed into a person's form finally revealed its form. There stood a buxom lander gear woman, her body jet black from top to bottom, as if the night had literally congealed into a man, with only her eyes and teeth gleaming bright white. Her black arms are folded across her bare, ample chest, and her lips, which resemble those of a large frog, are filled with a mocking smile. Haven't seen you since, leopard-head Gwyn. It's good to see you. 
The lander gear witch said in a hushed voice, leaving the empty air from which she had just emerged, and slowly walked towards Gwyn. Looks like you're no different, Tamiya. Thanks to you. E.I., this rain and thunder is so loud, I can barely talk. Shut up. Tamiya raised her hands menacingly to the sky, and immediately the sound of the torrential rain, the rumbling of the thunder, and the cries of the people disappeared as if all sound had been drowned out of the world, leaving the rain still falling and the thunder still fluttering. Okay, here we go. You know, Gwyn, I told you then. I'm gonna see you again and you're gonna be mine. I hope you haven't forgotten that. I have not forgotten. Gwyn replied with a stern face and stepped toward the witch, protecting Velusa who was cowering and clinging to her. But I didn't say I understood it, and I'm sure you haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten. The witch Tamiya teased back. Her white eyes shone with an evil laugh. Hey Gwyn, don't make me feel bad. I'm really in love with you and that's why the black witch Tamiya came all the way out here to warn you. Don't be fooled, Gwyn, he's just trying to mess with you. The witch lifted her full black arms and pointed to the hoofed figure of I.G. Sog, blurred by the rain. Her arms and tied-up head were in the same torrential rain, but somehow the rain seemed to fall only on her, and she was not even the least bit wet. Gwyn was silent. His eyes gleamed with a steely, steely light, and though they were half obscured by the rain and the darkness, his deformity was evident as he gazed at the creature with red eyes and hoofed feet. That, as you can see, is an unborn monster. Tamiya's lips twisted into a ridiculous grimace as she screamed. Originally, it was a disgusting synthetic creature born in a flask in the laboratory of Agrippa the Great Mage. Because it happened to have the intelligence of a worm, it became Agrippa's errand boy, and over the course of the years, it developed a wisdom so cunning that it saw the meeting of the seven stars. Don't be deceived, Gwyn. That monster wants to take you away, lock you in his ward, and wait for the meeting of the seven stars at the lion's palace to unleash his dark power. Shut up, woman. Suddenly, that voiceless voice rang out again in the heads of all present, and ours and Varousa were frightened again and clung to their king. The voice in my head continued with a strangely emotionless crack. Shut your filthy mouth, slave girl. I am IGG Sog the Hoof, king of all mages. It is ordained by the stars that tonight I shall meet the leopard that reigns in Chironia and I shall take him to be the rightful ruler of light and darkness in this world. To do this, I must join forces with this leopard-headed king and swear an oath that he will be the conqueror of the earth and I will be the conqueror of the unseen. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Tamiya screamed. I know your intentions, you dumb brute. What you need is Gwyn's heart, a red-blooded heart taken from the chest of a living leopard, don't you think? Isn't that the same with you, witch? YGG Sog pointed out. The red eye, high up in the sky, glittered fiercely, like a sinister lighthouse guiding the rainy night. Don't you need a leopard's fresh blood and its special heart for the ancient black magic broadwurst rituals you are so good at? Say what you will, but stop that cow's mouth. The witch of Landergear shuffled her feet in fury, and as if in response, a bolt of lightning flashed across the sky, clearly illuminating the monstrous, horned IG Sog and the black woman who stood facing him. Gwyn, don't believe a single word she says. Tamiya turns to the leopard king. That's right. When I rescued you when you were having trouble in the alley with that rat man and that dancer, I couldn't help but think that I should have locked you up like that. But then, Gwyn, the more I looked at you, the more I changed my mind. Gwyn. You're the only real man in the world. After seeing you, even an incubus embrace seems insufficient, and even Lontego's. Caresses seem too powerless. Oh, Gwyn. I'm serious. I already know that your heart is the secret that brings together the power of attraction of the seven stars and releases it to the earth as a catalyst. But Gwyn, I want you alive and by my side. Oh, Gwyn, receive the kiss and embrace of my Tamaya, the Black Witch of Landergear. Rule with her over Tamria's bed and Tamria's throne and Tamria's kingdom. I can give you pleasures you've never imagined even in your wildest dreams. Oh Gwyn, come here and take my hand, come on. 
Then the witch quickly tore off the petticoat she was wearing, thrust out her black, shiny breasts like cannonballs, and held out her plump hands to the king. A hot pink tongue appeared through her teeth and licked the witch's thick black woman's lips as if she were an independent living thing, a pink-colored mollusk. Varousa's pretty face immediately took on a grim and dangerous expression. The Arachnean dancer wrinkled her nose, twisted her lips, and tried to say something, but when the king, who had sensed her presence, quickly grabbed her wrist and held her back, she did not dare to open her mouth. It was as if he wanted to be the anchor that held the king in place. Three times, IgG Sog's telepathy sent a great, malicious sneer into the hollow of their heads. You're a good one to woo, Tamiya. But look, the leopard-headed warrior seems to be a nuisance. Look at the leopard's red-hot eyes. No wonder Yarn, who guides the stars, has chosen him as his one and only. He's already seen the viper lurking in your foul tongue. In the end, no matter how you put it, you're no different from me in that you also want to win over that leopard. Come on, leopard, time is precious. There's not a moment to spare before the meeting and these interruptions are making that precious time slip away. Now look into my eyes and come with me, leopard with eyes of fire. Then the long, hairy legs, bent like those of a goat's, with the hooves of I.G. Sog rose up, and the monster stepped forward towards the leopard king and his companions. Its huge red eyes glittered, and it stretched out its hand toward them, but the hand was unusually long and covered with long hairs to the joints, and yet its three fingers were covered with fine scales and long claws like those of a bird of prey. Velusa screamed. She drowned it out. Shut up, shut up, shut up. You flask-born monster. The witch screamed. If you can touch my Gwyn, touch even one of his nasty claws. You'll be condemned to a death so horrible that even Job Hagos will be afraid of you, you foul-smelling laboratory mud. Come on, you'll burn in the fires of Tamaya. You're a pagan slave girl who worships an impure ancient god. IgG Sog answered. His hoof fluttered, revealing an ugly face with one eye, but ears, nose, and mouth that resembled a cow or a goat with one horn. The monster opened its ear-splitting mouth, full of spiked tusks, and let out a voiceless laugh. Get out of the way. Unless you want to be crushed by my hooves. Inga Reg Lure. This was the witch's response. The witch turned her face away, pulled out the pins with both hands, threw her black hair down her back, and called out again a horrible incantation of ancient times, the sound of which no one could pronounce, and the meaning of which no one could understand. Instantly, all sound returned to the world. It was as if water was rushing into a place that had been blocked until now. The sound of torrential rain, the rumbling of thunder, the regular thundering of the hoofs of Gluck's horse, and the laughing and shouting of the poltergeists, the loud laughter of some non-human creature, and the screaming and crying of the silent people, who form a distant and faint bass part of these sounds. And wailing of the silent people. Oh, my God! An uncontrollable rage rose up in the king of Chironia. The king roared as soon as he stepped forward, pushing Varousa aside. You! You filthy wizards! What do you want with my silence? What have you done with my people? Get out of Silen! Get out! I will not be used by you! I.G. Sog looked at the king with red eyes, and laughed again without speaking. His forked hand came down on the king from above, as if to seize him. The king tried to pull out the great sword from his waist. But just as the monster's hand was about to fall on the king's body, it was swatted away by a black whip, and IgG Sog staggered back, making a tremendous noise with his hooves. Tamiya laughed as if she was about to explode. Just as she thought that, a huge black whip attacked IgG Sog again. It had grown directly from Tamiya's head. The whip was the hair of a witch. A strange cry of K escaped from I.G. Sog's mouth. It raised its hooves and aimed to kick the witch down. Tamiya jumped back, her hair also twisting like a thick spotted snake. It's dangerous. The king noticed that Ars was tugging at his arm furiously. The little rascal was white up to his lips, shaking and clinging to the king. It's now or never. 
Let's get out of here, my king. The king turned violently. He saw them facing each other in the rain, saw that they had forgotten to pay attention to him and were completely preoccupied with each other, nodded, and suddenly grabbed Varousa by the waist. My king. Ours, come on. In the midst of the lightning, IgG Sog's body is gradually levitating. It was his plan to strike a kick at the black witch from above. And when Tamiya saw it, she flew up into the air as if she were riding an invisible bird. Then she stretched out her hand, grabbed the Inazuma, and threw it at IG Sog. IG Sog didn't even dare to dodge. Immediately, the monster's huge body was engulfed in a crackling electric shock. Leaving himself in the midst of the sparks, IG Sog smiled triumphantly with his mouth open. Wow! Ars, who had stopped in his tracks, exclaimed and rubbed his eyes. That monster has grown up. No matter how many times I rubbed my eyes, it was still true. As if it had absorbed the energy of lightning, Igisog's strange form began to swell up in the midair as he watched. Petulant, the witch of Lander Gear screamed. Rock, stone. When the witch raised her hand, a huge rock rose up from the ground with a terrible rumbling sound, and flew high and fast to IgG Sog. IG Sog rebounded without a care in the world. Like an invisible barrier, the huge rock swooped apart just before it touched IG Sog's body, making Tamiya grit her teeth in anger. Let's run! R surged again. The three humans on the ground were frightened by the Inazuma and tried to sneak away from the horrific fight to the death between the demonic beings unfolding in the air. That's when. Tamiya figured it out. Hold on, Gwyn. The witch raved. You're not going anywhere. Her black hand made a strange gesture and pointed to the ground. Just when I thought I was done. Kor. Whoa. What the hell is this? A soul-splitting scream erupted simultaneously from the throats of Varousa and Ars. Something suddenly swooped in front of them from the darkness. The king suddenly drew his sword from his waist. Get back. He barks and stalks them, then faces the monster. It was a horrible thing. It was about a tar, and its whole body was covered with black, disgusting hairs, which made a horrible squeaking sound whenever they passed each other. It had neither hands nor feet. It is a hairy serpent, if anything. From the neck down, however, it was that of a wild dog or coyote, a ravenous beast with an insatiable appetite, and it opened its carnivorous mouth and swooped down, then swiftly retreated. Dog head or snake, don't kill the man, just make sure he can't fight or run away anywhere. The ranting of the witch who is now trying to hide in the thundercloud following IgG Sog is heard from above. The mouth of the dog-headed snake opened. It flicked its long tongue and slurped and slobbered, glaring slyly at the leopard-headed king with the covetous, glowing eyes of a wild dog. Next thing I know, it's flying through the air again. With a growl of disgust, Gwyn drew his great sword. His aim was perfect, and the sword severed the writhing body of the dog-headed snake, splitting it in two. Oh, my god. Whoa. The monster has turned into two. Ars cried out in grief. The very creatures of hell, the moment they were cut off by the king's sword, increased to two and stretched out as before. Now the leopard man has to deal with two monsters that are squealing from both sides and looking for an opening to jump into his throat. You monster! Gwyn barked. The dog-headed snake sprang up at the same time as if it were still one life moving its two separate bodies, and came at him with a shout. Watch out, king! Ars shouted, and at the same time, his hand slipped inside his leather shoes, and when it came out, it was holding a slim throwing knife. Holding the knife between his index and middle fingers in the manner of an Afrikia, he threw it with one motion. His aim was right, and it pierced the glowing eye of one of the snakes, and at the same time the king leapt forward and cut down the other. But. It was a waste. No. This thing seems to grow as fast as you cut it. The king groaned. Now the monsters multiplied to four and surrounded them with shuffling noises. What a monster. Janice. Ours cried out in despair. A fierce thunderous roar still rang out from above, and it was no longer possible to distinguish it from Gluck's horse or the battle between the two mages. Ah. 
A short scream escaped from Varaus's mouth. The king, who had drawn out his scabbard instead of cutting it to the right and left and had dispatched the four infernal creatures with it, was unable to restrain all four of them from moving like spurs, and finally one of them dodged his sword and jumped at the king's chest. From between the king's clenched teeth came a single, short growl. He threw out his sword, blocked the monster's sharp fangs, grabbed the hairy neck with both hands, and strained to snap it. Instantly, its chest swelled up and it looked as if it would tear even the strongest armored laces with its strength, but the dog-headed snake was stubborn. Rather, the lowly creature may not even have the intelligence to feel pain or threat. Its mouth, with its rows of bared fangs, sprays the king with the breath and slobber of a hot, stinking beast, and its fangs, even as its thick neck is bent backward as if about to break at any moment, are bitten relentlessly as if seeking prey. But that was only until the king's arms were filled with hard muscles that looked like a combination of rope, and his right hand grabbed the monster's upper jaw and his left hand grabbed the lower jaw and pulled them apart with force. At last, the leopard king's mighty power overcame the monster's vitality. The monster's jaws creaked with a horrible sound. The king ripped the monster's mouth open with all his might. A strange wave that could not be described as a scream shook the area. The king, his hands covered with the monster's sloppy gray bodily fluid, threw the monster, which had been more than half torn in half, out into the rain. Yes. Ars grabs Velus's hand and jumps up. Three more. This guy. The leopard-headed king crawled along the ground, glaring at the dog-headed snake as he looked at him, as if to buy time to catch his breath. They increase in strength when cut with a sword, but they seem to be more fragile with their bare hands. Now that I know. Ah. Oh. Varousseth suddenly gave a loud cry of surprise and pointed to the ground where the monster that the king had just thrown away should have been. The rain soaked, puddled cobblestones were stained gray with a disgusting smell, and there was nothing left to show for the horrible corpses that had been thrown out there. The king shouted at the other three, keeping his eyes fixed on them, and keeping himself low, ready to be sprung at any moment. They are not truly alive after all the dark life. Especially in the terrestrial realm, they're just pseudo-life, and that's why they show all sorts of cunning stubbornness, but there's nothing to be afraid of. Suddenly, a fearsome and agile creature dodged the king's upraised hand and sank its fangs into the bare arm between his gauntlet and shoulder. Call! Velusa screams and tries to run. R stretches out his hand to stop her, but it's too late. One of the monsters that had been distracted by the king noticed them and turned around. Oh, shit. Ars drew his dagger and prepared himself. The dog-headed snake opened its mouth and threatened him. When his now dull, glowing eyes stared at Aruz, Aruz suddenly looked as if he were being pulled into a state of unsteadiness. The strength slipped from his hand, and the dagger fell sluggishly to the ground. Velusa screamed and jumped at it, grabbing the dagger. The king saw at once the predicament of his companion. But the king, who was trying to break the neck of the one who had not left his grip on his arm with only his other arm, and who was trying to fight against the magical eye of the other, did not have the strength to go and join him. Ah! Seeing that Varousa had grabbed the sword and advanced recklessly, the dog-headed serpent turned its attention to her, and the hypnotic power on ours was softened because of it. Ars almost staggered and then realized and screamed. No, not the sword. They grow when you cut them, you know. Velusa throws away her dagger. Unsure what to do, she put her hand to her mouth and screamed as she stood there. With a horrible shout the monster tried to attack her soft breast. As soon as the king saw this, he rushed towards him without regard to the other one that was wrapped around him and the one that was waiting for an opportunity at his feet. But more and more, the giant monster sinks its filthy fangs into the king's arm. The fearful roar of a wounded leopard rang out from the king's mouth. It was not despair, but a tremendous will to fight, a wild fighting spirit that blazed uncontrollably as it was driven into a corner, and it was nothing but the roar of a wild animal's rage and challenge. It was a roar of rage and challenge from the wild beast. It was accompanied by rain and thunder and made the air around them shake. Just then, as if the king's wounded roar had summoned him, a strange thing appeared dimly in the rain. 
Its form wavered as if it were in the water, but eventually it took shape and finally emerged completely. Soon, the king and the two men had lost sight of their own predicament and were shouting in horror as the monster of hell threatened them. Wah! An insane scream escaped from Ar's mouth. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's... If you can call it a person, it must have had the shape of a person. But... If they could be called human beings, then I.G. Sog, a synthetic man with hooves, and I. Rack and Roba, both of whom had only heads, must have been included among the unmistakable human beings. It had such a bizarre, and terribly distorted, shape and form. It is apparently even ridiculous. The deformed figure, which seemed to have stepped directly out of a nightmare, seemed to emphasize the awfulness and horror of the situation because of its ridiculousness. It looked as if it had been sitting for so long that its limbs had degenerated, and it had only thin, crunchy hands and feet attached to its large, terrifyingly solid torso. In addition, the legs did not seem to be able to support the swollen torso. It also has no head. Rather, its huge, bizarre face, which looked as if it had been carved out of a rock, was completely encased in its shoulders, which rose up to its ears like a mass of flesh. The whole body is covered with a profusion of mosses, as if it were a cloak of body hair or fur. From the shoulders to the body, neck, and head, long mosses and mushrooms had infested and covered them all. They made the skin of those who saw them itch somehow, and made me want to rub my skin to see if such things were still growing on my skin. The cheeks and forehead not covered with mosses, and the skin peeking out from between the mosses, were completely dried and cracked like clay that had been exposed to the sun for too long. The earthen mound-like monster, which made me hesitate whether I could call it a person or not, began to rustle as if a pile of moss and tar were moving, and without saying a word, it held out a hand like a dead branch, which did not fit its body. Our Ganges, unholy child of Garm, the hellhound, and Crowlier, the dark demon serpent, come hither. Come hither. As soon as the cracked mouth moved, a creaking voice came out, as if it was chilling the nerves. A moment later, the king felt the fangs of the vexatious dog-headed serpent that had been lodged in his upper left arm suddenly fall away, and he saw the one that was about to pounce on Varousa and Ars, and the one that had been circling the king menacingly, and three others, rush away from them. I saw them, as if it were a loyal dog commanded by its owner, whom it revered as the only absolute god, the hairy dog-headed snake, wagging its bushy tail, which did not even exist at the moment, easily drew near to the new monster. All right, all right, pretty boy. The monster, who looked as if a pile of moss and mud had begun to move, beckoned to me as if I were going to pat him with a flapping hand, but just as I was about to do so, he turned his hand around, grasped something in the air, and then made a gesture as if he were going to throw it away. Immediately, the three dog-headed snakes disappeared as if they were scraps of paper thrown away. It literally disappeared. Seeing the shocked faces of the three men, the monster let out an unpleasant laugh. I saw that you were in trouble, so I lent you a little help, but I hope that was not too much to ask. It spoke in a squeaky voice reminiscent of an infinitely aged oak nymph or something. Varice's eyes were round. She clung to her king. Igrek, he whispered in a voice that was partly frightened and partly afraid. The monster heard it. I should be flattered that you think of me as an earthly spirit like Igrek, but unfortunately I am not a blind earthly spirit like Igrek. He looked half at Varousa and half at the king, his eyes creepy and cracked, even to the eyelids. I am Baba Yaga, aka Baba Yaga the Long Tongue, and I make my living in witchcraft. I came forward calmly. I'll thank you for bringing back those nasty monsters, but what do you want with Baba Yaga, the long talking Baba Yaga? That's the thing, Leopard King. Baba Yaga looked pleased with himself. In fact, I entered the silence through my realm at nightfall and have been searching for what I sought ever since. And now I've found it. It was you, wasn't it, Leopard Head King? And him. Gwyn couldn't help but bang his knee with his fist and shout at him. So this is one of those monsters that wants my silence and my heart. Well, that's not what I said. Finally, Baba Yaga said with satisfaction, sticking out his tongue and licking his pretty lips. 
Then it suddenly became clear why he had been nicknamed the Long Tongue Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga's tongue was as long and sticky as that of a chameleon. Baba Yaga did not pull his tongue out immediately, but flipped it around as if on purpose, and then put it back in again. The silence are now the dead city of the Night's Watch. Do you hear it, that scream? He said amusingly and waved his hand like a dead branch. Again the sound of rain died away. Immediately their ears were filled with a tumult of despair and madness. You monsters! Gwyn's eyes blazed with rage. Baba Yaga has a face to soothe it. Don't be so hard on yourself. You're the leopard, you're the one who brought this upon us. How dare you! Did you ask my silence to let me follow you horrible, unborn monsters? It's a bit like that. Baba Yaga, for example, was asleep in his rocky cave in Nosphorus, the desolate home of my eternal and far away, when he suddenly became aware of a strange presence in the sky. Then, for the first time in centuries, I climbed up to the Tower of Remembrance and read the stars, and there was a leopard star of a terribly huge, incandescent light that seemed to me to draw me as a lovely thing is drawn to an oasis or a mistress is drawn to a yawning terrace. And so, with some trepidation, I finally arrived at the silent capital of Chironia. And I was wandering aimlessly through the silence, where Gluck's horses were galloping about as if to announce a catastrophe, when I was drawn to you as the tide naturally carries the leaves and the fire naturally attracts the insects. Baba Yaga let out another squeaky laugh. So it is the fate of the stars, the fate of yarn, that I have you here, the leopard star so that the energy of the meeting of the seven stars once every six hundred years will be released to the earth through my art. The energy of the meeting of the seven stars once in six hundred years must be released on earth through my technique, and there I will establish the kingdom of Baba Yaga. This Baba Yaga has spent many years as a hermit, more years than you can imagine, and in all that time he has never even dreamed of an earthly kingdom. But what is strange is that what is not in the hands of those who have hoped for it should come into the hands of those who have been predestined to it. Come, Gwyn, symbol of the living energy that bridges the gods to the earth. No, Gwyn barked. Whose hand did you jump into? I've never gotten into your hands. I don't know if you have a long tongue or a long ear, but you'd better shut up and listen. As long as I'm here, I won't let a monster like you have even a shred of freedom over me my kingdom and my people. Get back, you unsightly creature. This is an order from the king of Chironia. The moment I said that, lightning flashed above my head, as if to place the crown of heaven on that leopard's forehead of Gwyn's. Ars and Volutha hung their heads in dismay. And in the pale light they saw him standing there, with his cloak flung up majestically, and his legs planted firmly on the earth of his kingdom and from that half-man, half-beast king came a terrific threat and a stern will that struck them like an electric current, and if it had not been for this, even they might have fallen prostrate there without remembering. Had it not been for this, they might have prostrated therein without remembering. The sound of the horse's hoofs of the unseen, glacially dark creature of hell, galloping overhead, echoed above the clouds. The footsteps of the horses, which had at first only been galloping through the far reaches of the sky, seemed to be coming closer and closer to the roofs. Whoa! But the long-tongued Baba Yaga, as if to mock Gwyn's angry command, stuck out his long, lumpy tongue and licked his lips teasingly, and even licked his own forehead, and repeated, Whoa! I told you, I told you. You think I'm a monster. What do you mean, back off? Whoa, whoa. You're more of a monster than I am. Don't you see, leopard-headed man? Every time you wake up in the palace, you're wary of turning away from the mirror the maidservant holds out to you, and your queen, Sylvia, looks away in horror. Why don't you take a closer look at yourself with your own beastly eyes? Baba Yaga's tongue lapped at his lips, his long, lean nose, and even his chin, and Baba Yaga raised his skinny hands and called out strange, unworldly incantations in a creaking voice. Just then, a moaning cry escaped from Gwyn's mouth, and the rain which fell on them, and chilled them, and showed no sign of abating the rain suddenly changed its form. Even the puddle at his feet and the torrential rain that kept falling all the water, all the water, suddenly came together to form a water mirror. 
The water mirror was now all around Gwyn, in front of her, across her, behind her, under her feet, and above her head. From every angle, there were a hundred or a thousand forms of the Leopard King, all of them with their own evil intentions and lives, just like the story of the shadow in the legend, staring straight at Gwyn with mocking, red eyes, pointing, and opening his leopard mouth to let out a loud laugh. He opened his leopard mouth and let out a loud laugh. Stop it! Gwyn screamed. His voice seemed to be laced with some kind of anxiety, or, incredibly, even fear. The shadows swayed in unison in response to the voice of the master, and each of them uttered a slightly different cry of, no. In slightly different tones. What the hell is this? Again Gwyn raved and crouched down to pick up the sword at his feet. At his feet were not one but many leopards. Their red eyes held out their hands to the mirror, as if they were pleading with him to let them out with the sorrow of a prisoner. Stop, you son of a bitch. Gwyn barked and raised his sword to smash the mirror. But. Wait, Gwyn. Baba Yaga's voice rang out. A mirror is a reflection of yourself. If you kill the reflection, your body must also die. No, if you break the mirror, your soul too will be forever imprisoned in its thousands of fragments, and as long as my spell lasts, you will be a shadow without a body, wandering the mirror world. If you think I'm talking nonsense, try breaking that mirror, O oh king. Or would you rather see what you've been trying not to see? Baba Yaga's loud laugh rang out in his ears. The next moment Gwyn stumbled to his knees. The egg-shaped face of a beautiful, slender, white, but haughty and contemptuous woman with golden hair tied up in a loose bun, superimposed on the face of the Leopard King, appeared in the hundreds and thousands of mirrors. And, eventually, it was replaced by that dazzling face of a leopard that filled all the mirrored surfaces. On her red lips, a smile of disgust and scorn drifted, and on her hair, which she waved without a trace of disorder like a tower, sparkled costly ornaments of red and green jewels, and her slender, supple limbs were wrapped in the smooth, thin white silk and feather ornaments of the nobility. Its doll-like face acknowledged Gwyn, and the two ends of its lips lifted up in an even more vexing manner, and the apparition opened its little lips. King of Chironia King of Chironia, what a magnificent king! The beastly king of Chironia, who is not even human. Only daughter of the great Achilles the Great, beloved husband of the Princess Sylvia. No, don't touch me, I'd rather die with my tongue in my mouth than be touched by such a monster. I can only accept you as a good man if you obey your father's foolish promise because of your honor as an imperial princess. I do not accept that. A half-breed, half-born beast from who knows where and how. I will not allow the blood of such a horror to be mixed with the blood of the venerable royal family of Chironia. You see, since the throne of Chironia was your goal, this will not be insufficient. In public I'm a one-ringed monster like you, but I'll make you a king and my good man. In return, don't touch me. And don't show yourself to me if you can help it. I don't want to see it. I feel like I'm keeping a monster in my palace. Who's there? You smell like a beast. Light the incense. And loud laughter a long, frenzied, increasingly hysterical, malevolent sneer. Stop it. King Chironia gave a squelching cry. From his strong hand fell a sword, and his hand went to his head, which was in the shape of a leopard. He grabbed her head as if he were scratching it, and shook it as if he had a terrible headache. Before his eyes, the white and haughty faces of the women overlapped each other and gradually merged into one huge face, and each time they did so, the insane loud laughter grew louder and louder until, at last, it seemed as if it was about to crush the king. Stop it. Get Sylvia out of my sight. Gwyn shouted again, and then covered his face. My king. What's the matter, my king? Not even the startled cries of ours of the whole mouse Torek seemed to reach his round ears. My king. It's a trick. It's just a distraction. Pull yourself together, king. My king. There's nothing around you. He's just making it look like there is. Verousa raved, too. 
Her eyes were full of tears and she wrung her hands. And she suddenly ran to the king and clung to him. My king, oh, my king. Don't let that disgusting creature fool you. What's wrong with you? You're the strongest, toughest man I've ever seen in all my life. Not in Kumu, not in the city of Arceus, not even since I came to Terrate. Oh, my king, look at me. Look at Veluka. I've been waiting so long for you to bring me to the palace. And suddenly she pressed her red lips to the beastly mouth of Gwyn's leopard head. Gwyn's eyes suddenly fluttered. He looked around as if he had just woken up from a bad dream. Yes, little girl, don't do anything you don't want to. In his ears, he heard the angry cry of Baba Yaga, and from before his eyes, he saw that the haunting apparition that had been poking at his head until now, and the magic of the water mirror that mercilessly revealed his deformed form, had vanished as if they were lies. All around was the same back streets of the silence as it had been in the beginning, and a torrential downpour that seemed to beat down on everything and try to wash it away, and a sky that was far away but could only see ominous black clouds illuminated by flickering lightning. The hearts of the leopards were mine for the taking. How dare you, with the guile of a mere dancer, block my arts and obstruct the path to my ambition. Baba Yaga raged and raved, his finger pointing straight at the frightened Varousa. When you think. Oh. Varousa's high-pitched scream rang out, and her body was suddenly lifted into the air as if she had been grabbed by an invisible giant hand. Help me. With a scream, Varousa struggled to her feet. Varousa. The king and ours went to her and tried to pull her back, but as soon as they did, Varousa's body increased its speed and flew out of their reach, as if to taunt them. Now she's thrown up in the air, neither suspended nor floating, higher than the roof of a silen. My king. Oh, my king. Only the sound of their cries leaks through the rain. Baba Yaga. Put Velusa down. Furious, Gwyn roared. The long-tongued monster laughed out loud. No, no. If I throw her up into the clouds, she'll suffocate slowly in the thin air. But before that, the hooves of those dreadful grack horses that roam so gleefully above her will paw at her tender breast and belly and make her cough up blood and turn her into an indistinguishable mass of bloody flesh. Or will you, O oh king, O oh leopard head, follow me and follow my ambition? You coward! Gwyn screamed. But he didn't hold back. All right, take my heart if you want it. Just put her down. All right. You're a good judge of character. The moment Baba Yaga was about to reach out in pleasure, it was. Wait, Baba Yaga. I won't let you get away with this. There was a black shadow that suddenly descended from the sky to the ground. Tamiya. Then, in the hands of the hawks, he grabbed the fainting Velusa and drove his hoof into her. They stared at each other with eyes that seemed to burst into flames. In the midst of the fluttering lightning and the end of the world thunderstorm, the three mages faced each other with bated breath. But the stifling confrontation lasted only a moment. Long-tongued Baba Yaga. First, Tamiya, the Black Witch of Landergear, set her glowing white eyes on the mossy monster, pointed a long black finger at it, and broke the silence with her piercing, angry voice. I had no idea that you had come to this place. I was told that Baba Yaga left Karakudai as a hermit once upon a time, when Canaan was an empire and the middle of the middle plain was the sea, and that he would never come back to the mundane world. Oh, black woman of Landergear, I.G. Sog, the beast synthesized by Agrippa. Calmly, Baba Yaga replied. I also didn't think that the silence would be filled with the likes of you. Leaving aside I.G. Sog who was born in the flask of the great wizard Agrippa in ancient times, which, that even a lowly one like you should come, does the once in six hundred years meeting of the seven stars attract wicked souls with such strength? It must be that I'm destined to have everything returned to my hands in the end. Baba Yaga, you really have a long tongue that can't be defeated even by the Mizagarn serpent. Not only that, but I'm sure you have more than one long tongue. Tamiya screamed. Her feet were not yet on the ground, and her head was almost as high as Gwyn's, looking down at Baba Yaga. But you must have grown a little geriatric while you slept among the mosses on the rock of Nosphorus, or that nasty moss must have grown into your brain and infested it. 
Baba Yaga. What kind of a fool are you? To show a leopard a trick and win his soul, Baba Yaga was about to say something back. But then the voice of IgG Sog rang in their heads. The Landurgeon woman is right. Baba Yaga of the Karakudai, the long-tongued hermit, you may not know it, or you may have forgotten it, but this leopard spirit who rules the silence attracts us because of his extraordinary vitality and unfathomable energy. If we attack it by creating trauma in him, we can certainly take advantage of the cracks in his mind, and we can easily take possession of his soul, which we cannot even hypnotize him with ordinary means, but that is because his mind is weakened and his precious life energy flows out in vain. But that is because his heart is weakened and his precious life energy flows out in vain. You're a fool, Baba Yaga. It's not like you to be so impatient for success that you shred the living jewel of your heart. I'm not so immature as to not know that, Baba Yaga answered angrily. When he shook his body, moss spores flew around him like a mist. On the contrary, I am not like you, a lowly magician who can only see what is plainly before him. I can see the unseen, and even the unseen I can see with my mind's eye. This is a man who, after many years in the wilderness, has acquired wisdom, who has taken the words of the stars as his own, who has mastered a skill that rivals, if not surpasses, those of Gracious the Dark Priest, Agrippa the Great Mage of Eternal Time, and Lokandorus the Seer. Suddenly Baba Yaga spoke up. Tamiya, Igasog, and the three flesh and blood people who were standing there holding their breath suddenly felt something like cold air surrounding them and looked around. It was a faint hint of a voiceless sneer. However, no matter how much they looked, the three mages could not see if there was anyone who was the owner of that frightening cold air. Any mage. The long-tongued Baba Yaga opened his mouth again to regain his composure. It is only because I have mastered the art that no mage can rival that I have been so reckless. You, miserable charioteers, who see only what is plain as fire before you, accuse me of folly because my art disturbs the rare mind of the leopard. You do not know. You cannot see the true heart, the true soul of this leopard. It is not a small container, such as a sake jar that empties when you pour out the sake, or a container that becomes useless again when you take out what is inside. On the contrary, the heart and life energy of the leopard is a true fire, a never-ending, stellar, infinite flame that could burn and even kill you if touched by a lowly person like you. If it is that of a planet shining with light from somewhere else, there are many examples of this in the world, and whatever it is, it will not attract us like this. But this leopard is a star. By its own power it shines, it radiates heat, and it moves fate. Isn't this leopard star the only one in yarn stars that is still undetermined, the variable factor in the stars, which is why we were drawn to the silence one after another, knowing that whoever frees this star will control the destiny of the stars. No, slave girl, foul beast from the flask, I'm right. I am right. The leopard soul will not be shaken by this. It's only that it's quenched and its light is withheld for a time. Sooner or later it will burn brighter and brighter for having been softened. So much so that you can't even look at me. So stay back, you wicked ones. The secret of the stars is not in your hands. The golden rule is too dangerous for you to move. This is no place for your kind. Go on. And Baba Yaga, with a look of horrible disdain, waved his hand across his face like a dead branch. I.G. Sog's red eyes blazed with indignation, and Tamiya's lips peeled back and bared her teeth. How splendid, how splendid, the foul, mossy, sandbagged plume, the manure of the living. Tamiya screamed, stomped her feet, and jumped down on the cobblestones, so angry that she forgot to drift in the air. Would you be so kind as to give us a little advice? If you'd just shut up and listen to me, what would you have to say to me, you dirtbag, you bag of tar? The secret of the stars is too much for me. Don't lump me in with animals like you and your IG Sog. I'm Tamiya, of Landergear. My servant, Lontagos, is a man who has been on this planet since before you were even born, before this world became what it is now, before that, when no human being had ever even been seen. He is one of the gods of Kusuru, the most powerful of them all, 
who flew to the earth and reigned from the time when this planet was nothing but a mass of boiling lava. But when they are roused from there, slumber by the power of the stars and reappear on this earth, the world will squeal and you will melt like miserable rats in the middle of a superheated iron. And then, I have to bring that god back to earth no matter what. You call them dolls, but dolls are like babies compared to the old ones that I worship, and your ambition to satisfy your own petty desire for domination in front of my mission. She was about to say something when Tamiya suddenly stopped and looked up. The others looked up and gasped. Black clouds are scurrying around like crazy, and the sound of thousands of hoofs above their heads is now so low that they touch the tops of the high towers of the silence. E.I., what a fool you are, you long-talking old man. Tamiya's ranting. You're the one who summoned those nasty Gluck horses from the darkness of the Norn. You attacked Gwyn's heart and nearly extinguished its flames, but you didn't stop there, you went the extra mile. That horse of Gluck's is quite a tricky thing to deal with and all that, eh, you raw soldier. How dare you, you frog-fearing slut. In anger, Baba Yaga screamed, stuck out his tongue and ducked it, so that he looked like a chameleon. Who is the art of war? I know all about the dark creatures. But I never summon Grax's horse. I want the untouched fruit of the silence, not the trampled, soulless husks. So it's you, I.G. Sog, you brute. Tamiya turned her head. The two and a half meter tall synthetic beast, with a goat for a lower body, a gorilla for an upper body, a bird of prey for a hand, and a one-horned, one-eyed cow for a face, was stomping its bent legs with hooves. I do not know. She sent out an angry telepathic message. Tamiya thought for a moment. Yes, yes, yes. You're Agrippa's errand boy, not a doll contractor. Agrippa has lived so long that he's already transcended the idea of good and evil, but he wasn't originally a devotee of the doll. Then there's no way you can control a dark monster like him. Then who the hell is he? Oh, no, not this cloud and the rain. Go away, go away. As soon as Tamiya's black hand, pink only on the palm, made its mark, the rain, which had been so heavy, stopped. Then a black cloud like a stream of ink disappears as if it were wiped away. Look at that. Tamiya pointed to something that had appeared from behind the clouds and ranted. Rule Ba to the east, I lack to the west, two giant faces. Oh, you're so cheeky. Baba Yaga shouted. I know them. It's the dwarf Iraha and the wood mage Rolba, the stone eye of Katai. Why in the world are Iraha and Rolba looking down on us from that place? Tamiya's ranting. I've never heard of them. So that woodcutter came here to take advantage of our generosity. I will answer that question myself, which of Lontagos? This time the voice came from the sky. It was the mouth of the stone Rolaba that moved. And then the eyes of the stone, the only eyes in the blind face that could be seen, fluttered open, and Ilak, looking to the west, lifted up his puffed eyelids and looked down at them mockingly with narrow eyes. You say you do not know me, but I know you well, you frog-fearing native woman, priestess of the vicious snake-eaters of the south. Was it not you who, in Cody, the ruined city of Landargia, devoured your own offspring out of hunger? and for your cruelty were you admitted to the service of Lontegith? What of the prostitute in Job's temple who, in the mire of Salisbury, mingled with the stonemason gods and performed the world's most abominable rituals of uncleanness, so that she was crowned with an abomination of a name she dared not speak? And... Shut up! Tamiya ranted. Relibe didn't stop. Her thin lips twisted into a depressed smile. I also know about you, hoofed I G Sog. I know how you came into being in Agrippa's flask and beaker, by mixing stinking tar and filthy mud with a disgusting philosopher's stone. You lowly beast. And you, Baba Yaga, call me, and I lack, which is a fair word for him, a woodcutter, which is a very broad word. Your tongue seems to have grown too long while you've been holed up in a rocky mountain, training only with field mice, newts, and slugs. What do you mean? You're just a disciple of Gracious. Baba Yaga became angry and shook his body, causing spores to fly around. 
You arrogant, flighty bastard. You should be in the sewers of the silence. I was already famous in Canaan when you were just a baby who didn't even know the runes existed. It is but the glory of ages past. Iraha interrupted with a sickening laugh. Your name may have been written on a stone tablet in Canaan, but it is a sign that the days of Baba Yaga are past. Your art has become as mossy, cracked and useless as your form. Indeed, it was Ilak who summoned Grax horses. But this Ilak is not one of you incompetent old men who pride themselves on their age and don't know how to harness the power of darkness. I can control the horses of Grak. Therefore, we shall be the champions of the Central Plains. I lack, you treacherous, two-timing, scabrous dog of ointment. Rolba shouted, wobbling his huge head to turn his stone eyes in that direction. Who summons the horsemen of Gluck to terrorize the silence by controlling them at will? Who can control the horsemen of Grak? You've forgotten what I said. I've been working with you to bring thunder and rain on these fearsome dark horses, but the main power comes from my spells. Don't be so conceited, you gutsy little virgin. That's interesting. I hear we're splitting up. Before Ilak, in a fit of rage, could say anything back to Rolva, Tamaya clapped her hands and shouted in delight. Come on, don't be shy. Go on, go on. But why don't you guys come down here instead of pretending to be something you're not? It must take a lot of energy just to look like that. Of course it's none of my business but I can't talk to you if you're looking down at me like that. Or are you saying that you were executed a long time ago and don't even have a body? You have a point, which, Rule Ba said. Well, I reha. The reason we happened to see each other in this form was because we both wanted to look down on the silence from above and find the man we wanted. I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that. Very well. Ilak replied. As soon as I thought that, the two monstrous faces that had so frightened the silence and terrified the people from the very beginning suddenly disappeared, and all that was left was the same old night sky. Is. Oh, that's funny. Tamiya mumbled something in her mouth, looked up at the sky again, and twisted her head. What's the matter, witch? Baba Yaga asks. You people are such helpless idiots. Tamiya said. You look at that and you don't even notice it, do you? Look at the sky. What time do you think it is? My see. Igusog said, without seeming to be bothered by it. It must be nearly mid-morning by now. I see. You're an idiot. Tamiya's getting a little too aggressive. It's not a matter of time. In this world, no matter what the great magic is, there is nothing more difficult than to be involved in the movement of the stars and to make time flow and stop at will, of course. Compared with that, even a child can manipulate space. I thought that the reason morning should have come to the silence, but it never did, was because that cloud and those two ghosts behind it were blocking the sun's rays. But if that's the case, the light should be able to reach us now that they've broken through the warding. But if the sky is so dark, and if it is only because the night is still there and the morning has been delayed, then there must also be stars, at least, there must be a night sky that is always known to us, the masters of magic, even if it is invisible to the eyes of the world. Tamiya raised her hands, hugged her bare shoulders, and shook herself a little. And yet, look at that sky how do you like it, Baba Yaga, I.G. Sog. Hmm, it's true that there is a huge darkness that seems to be enveloping this entire sky. Baba Yaga reluctantly agreed. But fear not, witch. Those fools have summoned Gluck's horse. Gluck's horse may have brought with it the darkness of Norn, its home, or it may simply be the handiwork of Ilak and Rolba. And, Tamiya, if, in truth, we too, despite our different gods and predecessors, are all part of the same dark power. Is this not the best thing for us all? Or do you, Black Witch, set your heart on the sun god Lure, the firstborn of Janus, rather than the light, the morning rather than the night, and the doll rather than the darkness? Well, that's true, but... Tamiya didn't look convinced yet. But then, suddenly, the air right under their noses began to gather together, and the darkness there became much thicker and heavier than elsewhere. And when it became stiff, the figure of a tall man was born there. He is a very tall man, nearly two meters tall. 
He wore a long black hooded cloak, and the hem of the cloak and the face behind the hood were so dark and foreboding that it was difficult to discern where the true darkness began and where the shadows began. Without a sound, the new mage appeared before Baba Yaga, Ijisog, and Tamiya, his skinny hands appearing from within his cloak, and he pulled off his hood, revealing a face with pale lips, an aristocratic nose, blind eyes, and a single eye of stone on his forehead. It must have been the same face that had been spread out over their heads a hundred times as large. He was the disciple of Gracious, the sorcerer from Kitai, the stony-eyed Ruleba. To look down on people from that place and enjoy it, you're still a bit naive, huh, Rolba? As if forgetting his concerns, Tamiya said and turned to him. At that moment Gwyn, who had been watching the assembly of these monsters with his hand on the hilt of his sword, uttered a piercing roar and flung back the hairs on the back of his neck in disgust. At his feet, where there had been no sign of him, a horrible creature like a monster spider suddenly appeared and tried to grab him by the ankles. Iraha. Rolba scolded with the eyes of the stone which did not know whether it was seeing or not at all. Don't do anything, even if you don't, it's an unpredictable coincidence that you'll meet so many of your peers here, that's already enough, your precious time is already being spent. Iraha gave a sickening, mocking laugh. He was commonly known as Irak the Dwarf, but the reason why he was so called became clear to everyone when they saw his whole body, not just his face. Because he looked more like a giant spider, a ground beetle, or a frog than a human being, even counting the solid mass of flesh rising up on his back, he was less than exactly one meter off the ground. His head, with its crushed face, sunk deeper than his shoulders because of his terrible boar's neck, and his diminutive limbs were bent and crooked, making him look like the wreckage of a crushed man. But all his infirmities, all his miseries, all his horrors, were not in reality so many. It is not because he is such an unborn cripple that Ilac the Dwarf makes those who see him, women and children alike, scream and twist their faces in horrified disgust. Rather, it was only because of the stench of his evil and twisted soul that emanated from his whole body. Even if he hadn't sold his soul to the demon Dole, he would have been a monster, a loathsome being who cast nothing but harm and curse upon the world. But then again, now that Iraha had joined the ranks of the five, the demons that swarmed about the silence, no one of them, whatever his outward appearance, was better than Iraha in the darkness and evil of his soul. And there was not one of them that was not as horrible and hideous as Ilac, in appearance itself, standing at a distance. They were none other than the five evil demons that had attacked the unfortunate silence without warning, the corpse-eating demons that crawled through the darkness and devoured the carrion of the graveyard. Gwyn's leopard eyes blazed red, and he looked around slowly, biting back a serious roar of rage at the disgust that threatened to escape his throat. Before you know it, the demons have surrounded him, Ars, who is following him, and Velusa, who is lying unconscious a short distance away, in a five-pronged formation that resembles a magic circle. His infinitely aged face is cracked, his hair and beard have been replaced by ferns, and he looks like a pile of moss and mud that has begun to move. On his left hand is I. G. Sog, a synthetic man with hooves, who is well over two meters tall, with a horn on his forehead, legs like those of a giant goat, and a single, red eye that is dazzling, and who was given life by Agrippa the Great in ancient times. The black witch Tamiya, who looks down upon it, and draws her arms around her bare breasts, and when she looks at Gwyn, a dreadful dark fire lights up in her eyes. She is a priestess of Lontagos, an ancient god older than Janus, and by taking possession of Gwyn, she seeks to fulfill her ambition to revive her god once more in this world, as well as her own passionate fire. He is said to be a stony-eyed ruler, a fallen nobleman of Kitai, and a disciple of Gracious, the dark priest. Of all of them, except Tamaya, he is probably the most humane in appearance, but it is precisely because of this that the third eye in his face, a stone eye with a vertical slit, is so awful. And Iraha the dwarf, the silence face appeared above him as a huge face at every moment, and his appearance, which frightened to death the hearts of the silence and all the people of the obsidian palace, was the prelude and the opening of this madness. It was the prelude and the opening of this madness. 
The leopard-headed king of Chironia now recalled with the greatest bitterness the advice of the mage Eulatia, who had warned him of the dangers of dark power. The Silens are now trapped between the long, poisonous claws of these five evil demons. This. A low, angry snarl of a wild beast escaped from the mouth of the leopard-headed warrior, who had been looking at the horrific sight of the five creatures of darkness that had crawled out of their different nightmares with intense disgust and antipathy. You filthy bastards, you disgusting monsters. Who sold your souls to the darkness while still alive, you unholy beasts. The seething rage that he had been holding in for so long rose up in him. Gwyn looked to the heavens, his nose wrinkled with horror, and howled in a voice that made the buildings around him tremble. Get out of Silen. Leave Chironia. We will not give the silence to scum like you. Not to you. If you don't want to go, until I put this sword to it and drive it away. Gwyn's leopard-headed shoulders and exposed bare skin turned red with rage, and he grabbed his beloved sword and flung it in all directions in a mess. But it was only a feint to dazzle his true movement, to make it look like he was upset and losing control. Just as he seemed to be swinging his sword wildly, his huge body stepped to one side of the five-pronged pentacle that held him like a thunderbolt, and suddenly his full-bodied blow struck the body of the mage who happened to be there. Whoa! The scream was the voice of the stony-eyed Rolba. Caught off guard, Luluba rushed to sink down, but did not manage to do so, and instead put her slender neck squarely in front of the king's great sword. With the horrible sound of steel striking bone, Luluba's blind head soars into the air. Rule B.A. Look! I'm the one who's going to protect Chironia. Gwyn's triumphant shout cracks. I once visited the wise man Locandorus in his mountain dwelling and saw the stars. I've even met Gracious the Dark Priest himself. The leopard-head king laughed out loud. He was no longer afraid or confused. Once he stepped into battle, there was nothing that could stop this giant leopard. Do you think I'm afraid of a low-level magician like a piece of wood, you fool? He rushed at Ilac, screaming and hoping to knock off the other head. But this time the mages were ready. As soon as the king's great sword had struck down, the dwarf's figure vanished from before him. As he drew his sword, he saw an ugly dwarf with his short hands outstretched and his feet propped up, laughing and shouting as he soared up into the dark sky. You! You're a freak! Gwyn barked and lunged at Baba Yaga. Whoa! I'm telling you, you're even more of a monster than I am. Baba Yaga's high-pitched sneer. As soon as he saw that thin, withered hand go up, the king was blinded by a sudden puff of smoke like spores, and he jumped away, covering his nose with his left hand, while he was shouting, sneezing and cursing at the same time. He swung his sword blindly, but of course it could not hit him. You're an insufferable handmaiden. Coughing and ranting, the king, in a fit of rage, rushed in the other direction, half blinded by the spores. Ahead of him was the witch Tamiya. Tamiya did not even try to dodge. The king's great sword plunged straight into her exposed belly. Tamiya staggered and fell. And then, unexpectedly, his black hands entwined like ivy around the king, his eyes glistening with lasciviousness, his mouth smiling lasciviously as he was skewered from belly to back. How dull of you, leopard-headed Gwyn. You know how long I've been waiting for another sword, not that great sword. Gwyn grunted angrily and pulled the sword from the black woman's body. There was not even blood on the sword, not even a cormorant's hair on Tamiya's belly. Now he was a wounded leopard. He looked about him madly and strode towards the giant Ijisog, brandishing his sword. Ijisog's body received the sword as if it had been sliced and cut but could not hold back, even though the smoke happened to take its form. A mournful moan escaped from Gwyn's mouth. He looked around in dismay, and then Laliva, who had been decapitated and was lying on the ground, got down on all fours and stood up. His hands are constantly groping for the cut marks on his neck, which have not bled. What's the matter with you? My head is missing. Either telepathically or with a separate vocal organ, everyone heard the headless Rolba shouting. There's your neck, Lolva. Ola. Tamiya laughed loudly and kicked off the head of the fallen wizard as if he were a cabbage. Rurba's torso fell on deaf ears. 
I've got no head, um, I've got no head. Where's my head? I'm wandering around, searching by hand. The short hairs on Gwyn's head bristled with disgust, and the roar of a wild beast involuntarily erupted from his throat. He realized in despair that he was out of his depth in this fight, that his sword was no match for these strange creatures. Oh, my oh, my. Gwyn's scream was tragic. Oh, the leopard barks. Tamiya pointed and shouted, laughing foolishly. But then he suddenly turned sullen. Hey, leopard head Gwyn, why don't you just give up and jump into my arms? When my magic and your sword work together, you'll have all the power you need, and I'll protect the silence. I'll protect you. And you, hey, tell me you'll choose me now. I'm really in love with you, strong as the sword of Arkandros, leopard-headed Gwyn. E.I., shut up, witch, cried Baba Yaga. Shameless whore, you'll never get away with it. The leopard is mine, it's mine. What do you mean, my? No, I'm the one. Shut up, shut up, shut up, Gwyn exclaimed. I don't belong to anyone. A moment later, I raised my sword again, groaning, knowing it was useless. Suddenly, a pale explosion engulfed him. A tremendous sound deafened the ears, and the leopard-headed warrior's body whirled around the sword as if an invisible energy overflowed from the sword in his hand. And fell down with a thud. It stuck. Well, Gwyn. Tamiya screams. Who the hell are you? You killed my man. If the leopard dies, there's nothing you can do about it, you spoiled pumpkin. I'm not dead. Laughing, Iraha leapt down from the sky. His diminutive frame was glowing as if his whole body was discharging electricity. If we lose time here, we lose the time needed for the ritual. I've spared you the trouble of stopping the goblin's mouth. Gluck's horse. Come down. You must carry the leopard. It's Gluck's horse. Shut up, you idiot. Tamiya's ranting. I'm not letting you take me. Yes, we can't let this opportunity pass us by. IGG Sog said, and started like a sinister dreamer. Then, as if in answer to Ilaka's voice, the footsteps of the invisible horses were coming closer and closer. Give me my head. I want my head back. Suddenly Baba Yaga let out a woman-like scream. The headless torso of Rurba, which had been wandering around looking for its head for some time, touched Baba Yaga's dead branch-like hand and clung to it tightly. What are you doing? Whoa! Get out of my way, you idiot! Baba Yaga shouted and sprayed spores, but the faceless Rurba clung to him, seeming to feel no pain or itch. Hanace, Hanace! Baba Yaga lost his nerve and cried out, and the spores that flew up so wildly each time became a white yellow smoke that finally covered the whole area, and Tamiya and Iraha began to choke. Then, suddenly. Iraha, you fool, you called for Gluck's horse. Tamiya's screams were drowned out by the incomparably loud thunder of the earth. Oh. Gluck's horse. Give me my head. Where's my head? I.G. Sog. I.G. Sog. It was as if an invisible demon had just been unleashed. There was nothing to see, but the sky was filled with hooves, and the clouds were scattered, and the towers were crushed. As countless unseen things ran past, the bricks of the tower were covered with huge hoof prints, as if they had been burned into the bricks, and they overlapped one another, obliterating the previous hoof prints. Eventually, a crack appeared in the hard stone roof, and it quickly spread across the entire roof. And in a curiously slow process of decay, the proud towers of the silence rattled down over the streets of the city. Help me. Help me. Arg. Janice. Janice. Have mercy. Immediately, there were screams and cries, and an orgy of death that made you wonder how so many people could have been dying under the roof of what was thought to be an uninhabited city of death. Ilahar. Idiots, bring back Grak's horse. If we don't, the silence will be crushed. Iraha, the screams of the mages. And then there's this. Did you see it? Did you see it? Did you see it? Iraha's voice echoed throughout the silence as she laughed outrageously. I am strong, I am the strongest of you, I am skilled in magic, 
I have the power to take the leopard and the stars and this world and everything. Do you see? Do you see? Hurry up, horses, pick up Gwyn and carry him on your dark backs to my hideout. I'm not gonna let you do that. In the midst of the cascade of debris, the shifting steel frame, and the thunder and fluttering lightning, it was hard to tell whose voice it was, what shape it was, or what position it held. The only thing that's missing is the face of the victorious Iraha, which has been warped even more than before, puffed up and soared up into the sky, and now only its huge face is smiling and laughing, as if it were trying to cover the night sky of the entire silent city and swallow it. In the midst of the catastrophe scene, Ars, his small body shrinking ever smaller, finally dragged Volusa's fainting body under the collapsing building, shaking, covering his ears, covering his eyes, and peeking fearfully, watched the unworldly battle. They watched the unworldly battle. Volutha, be strong, Volutha, oh, oh, king, king. Help me, please. It's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. The end of the world. The end of the silence. Whoa. Blinded by lightning and coughing up smoke, the little villain nevertheless showed his strength, aiming to pull Gwyn's prone body into the shadows while the demons were distracted by the unusual battle. Half in tears, he runs to the king's side and pulls on his heavy body, but each time he does so, the blast of wind and thunder sends him screaming into hiding. Damn it, I'm not dying, I'm not dying, if they get the king, the silence are finished, just like the rumored demon empire of Shem, they'll turn it into dull territory. We have to save the king. We have to save the king. His crying face was blackened with smoke, mud and dust, and he was ready to call on Gwyn again. What? He screamed and plopped down. Suddenly, some unknown, invisible, yet palpable creature moved upon Gwyn's massive frame. Oh! Every time it moves, the cobblestones are filled with sizzling smoke and unbelievably huge hooves. If it was indeed a horse, Gluck's dark steed must have had more legs than eight, and perhaps even hands. It, itself, lifted Gwyn's huge frame with a mighty heave, and the fainting body of King Chironia, as if on the back of an invisible creature, snapped in a crook at the belly and leaned to either side. And leaned from side to side. The king's body went up into the air with great speed. Whoa! Oh, my king! Ars cried out and ran out to stop the king. But he was struck on the head by a slate brick that blew from above, and he screamed and rolled over. His head was bleeding, and he could no longer do anything but stare up at the king, who was stunned and wringing his hands as he climbed to an incredible height. And... Suddenly, a hideous creature appears in the sky the bizarre form of I.G. Sog, who stretches out his clawed hand and tries to snatch the king. Gaw! In the background, Iraha's kilometer-long mouth opened, and she suddenly exhaled a huge white breath at I.G. Sog. The breath took the shape of a lion in the air and grabbed I.G. Sog, who had to scramble to regain his position to fight it. Hurry up and carry the leopard, horse of Gluck. Ila cries out in a voice that is louder than a gong. Wait. I'm not doing it. When Tamiya's loud voice came out of nowhere, a dog-headed snake suddenly appeared from the ground and bit Iraha's huge eyes like a flying staff. Iraha's mouth opened again, and another lion leapt out and fought another deadly battle in the air but. Whoa. Suddenly, Iraha's huge face contorted. In the middle of his forehead stood something that looked as small as a needle, Baba Yaga's staff. Before he knew it, Baba Yaga had perched himself like a sack on the top of the tower, and he threw his staff at Ilaka's brow while he struggled against the body of Rurba, who was still clinging to him. Whoa! Again Ilak barked. Gluck's horse. It was only a moment later that Iraha lost control of her dark steed in a moment of agitation and pain. The dark horse, never accustomed to anything, suddenly seemed to stand still in midair. This is because Gwyn's body, which had been leaning in the air, suddenly seemed to be slipping down, and then it began to fall like a huge stone for miles in the air. Oh, my king! R screams in terror. Oh, 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 Gluck's horse is going, going. Wait for me, come back, come back. Iraha's scream. In the midst of all this, as if happy to be free from the spell that bound it, 
The unseen fearless horse made the sound of many light-footed hooves fluttering in the void, and through the fluttering thunder, it gradually moved away, perhaps into the far northern sky or the depths of the earth, into the endless darkness of its birth. It was a world of endless darkness. I, you little soldier, if it weren't for Grack's horse, I'd be on my own. Baba Yaga screams and soars high into the air with Rule Ba in his arms. The king the king. R screamed in terror and started to measure its fall, trying to hold it as it was about to hit the ground. You can't kill a leopard. IG Sog notices and swoops down from the sky, but his claws fail to catch the falling Gwyn two or three times. The speed of the crash was too fast. His huge, heavy body accelerated, and if he kept going, Gwyn's body would slam into the cobblestones and he would be forced to jump. It's over. It's over. He realized that he would not be able to reach the drop in time, and that even if he did, he would not be able to take on the body of the king, which was twice his size, and he fell to his knees on the cobblestones, ruffling his hair with both hands and crying. Gwyn. Tamiya's screaming voice. In the midst of it all, the king's huge frame fell like a rock. Just as he was about to hit the cobblestones, he stopped, as if the thread that bound his ankles together had been stretched taut. Oh. Ars looks on in horror as if his breath had stopped. No. It wasn't just Ars. A sudden startled astonishment spread among the mages, and one by one they stopped their movements and swept the sky as if frozen. From Tamiya's mouth came a low, faint murmur of astonishment and disbelief. Oh what the hell is that? And the witch suddenly began to scream as if she were stricken with great fear. Chapter 4 Death Battle at the Black Devil's Den What the hell? Perhaps it was the synthetic I.G. Sog who was more frightened than anyone else. He was bending down to hold back Gwyn's falling body, and could not see the reason for the incredulity and bewilderment that was on the faces of all the mages who looked behind and above him. The synthetic man, with goat legs, a bull's head, and a single red eye, looks back at him with an air of dread. And I saw it. His red eyes are wide open and his chin hangs down. Oh. IgG Sog's dumbfounded telepathy cracked. What the hell was that? I don't give a shit. Finally, Tamiya was recovering from her initial shock. It's most likely you're doing, Baba Yaga. No. I don't know. Baba Yaga looks on in amazement, saying in a trembling voice. But what the hell was that? What happened to Iraha? The whole sky, it was so wide open, and now it's gone. Tamiya murmurs. All the while, her white, wide open eyes do not leave the point in the sky. That's. And what is it that has so shaken them, and even thrown them into panic? What was it about this strange creature in the sky that made them so upset? and even sent them into a panic. It had been nothing but the wreckage of towers and buildings that had fallen to the ground and been damaged in the exhaustion of the storm. In the heart of Silent City, which should have been huddled together in exhaustion after the storm. It was a strange, square-shaped structure, even blacker than the darkness, as if it were a dark nebula gathered there to become a black demon temple. It seemed to be a frighteningly huge monolith, or perhaps a tombstone, but it had no windows or entrances, and on the contrary, although it had the houses of the silence at its feet, it was not from this world, but a dark tombstone that had grown out of a different, more bizarre dimension as its foundation, or even a vacuum of space itself that had been cut out and appeared there. Rather, it was as if the vacuum of outer space itself had been cut out and appeared there. Its feet are hazy, distant, and strange, and they seem to be farther away than the top of the sky and they are there but not there, and they cannot be there but they are there as if they are unmistakably superimposed on other beings. They seem to be firmer than stones, more insubstantial than jellies, and they could not help evoking a shudder in the hearts of those who saw them, as if they had touched the indescribable, depressing, dreary world of the underworld. It was as if the tombstone itself were a living thing, a kind of strange intelligence, swaying and shaking, as if it were whispering something. Then, four or five meters above the ground in the air, as if suspended by an invisible thread, the strong body of the king of Chironia, which had been floating perfectly still, suddenly lifted up. As soon as it seemed to have reached the very center of the huge monolith that had suddenly risen above the silence, it turned around and increased its speed, 
and began to be sucked into the mysterious black structure in a straight line at great speed. It was truly a speed that can only be described as being sucked in. The king's body plunged from the leopard's head into the monolith before the watchful eyes and mouth of the people, who knew not what to do. Someone screams, but the monolith flips from side to side with an almost gentle gentleness, as if it were a jellyfish trying to catch the tip of a fork or rather, as if it were a wise man trying to hastily invite in his long-awaited guest, Maruto. The monolith fluttered to the left and right to embrace Gwyn's body with an almost gentle gentleness, as if it were an owner trying to rush out and invite awaiting guests. And then, in an instant, it is locked up again exactly as before. There appears to be neither exit nor entrance at all, but only a strange, living darkness, a single black plate floating in the air. Ah! Finally, a faint cry of astonishment burst from someone's throat, but only after some time. The leopard man. This is ridiculous. What 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 the hell is that? By the time they had come to their senses and began to shout, there was no longer any sign of the leopard king, nor even of Iraha's hideous face which had previously loomed over the whole sky. It was floating in the air, trembling faintly. E. Hylaka's wrinkle, what is this? Tamiya shouts in disbelief. But. No, that's absurd, he's not that big. If he was this good, he could have killed us all with one hand, without even bringing Grak's horse. But then who the hell is? He turns around and looks at the three remaining mages as if he were asking them a question or trying to find an answer. But no matter which one I looked at, all I saw was a face that was more stricken than the witches, a face that could not recover from its surprise, a face that was depressed. Tamiya's knees nearly buckled. But suddenly, the power of that evil god was poured into her as reinforcements, and she jumped up as if to say, What the heck is that? You've come out of the woodwork and snatched what we've worked so hard to find. Hey, Baba Yaga, Igasog, what do you have to say for yourself, headless rulebreaker? Don't open your mouth like a fool. Don't you get mad at that monster tombstone for snatching your Gwyn. I don't know what kind of messenger it is, but I'm pretty sure it's the same one they're after anyway. Oh, yeah. You were right, Tamiya. Baba Yaga shouted in agitation. What the hell was that? Who put you up to this? We'll get to that later, you slow old bastard. Tamiya is a stubborn man. We have to get Gwyn back as soon as possible, the meeting in question is tonight, the dragon's hour, and there's only half a day left. Now, you do as you please, but I, Lontagos, need your help. I've got to get Gwyn back, my little man. But if you don't know what the hell that thing is, you can't be careless. IGG Sog said thoughtfully, but the Witch of Landergear was no longer looking at him. It's a dog-headed snake. She calls out in a shrill voice and summons her strange messengers. Two furry monsters appeared out of nowhere, straddling the neck of the one that leapt. You have to go. I scolded him and tried to levitate towards the monolith in the sky. Wait. Then I'll have to. Iji Sog and Baba Yaga rushed after him and folded. Suddenly, the monolith seemed to be enveloped by a strange light. It was a dusky, unholy, vague glow that reminded me of the corona of the black sun, the lives of the dead, and so on. As soon as the light hit them, ours, who had been frozen in fear, saw the bodies of the mages become as if they had been touched by electricity. Tamiya never spoke again. And Iji Sog and Baba Yaga. Even Laliva was crawling for his head. Their wicked faces suddenly became very dim, and they began to look like the dead, listening to oppressive and powerful commands from very far away. And when I saw that, they have begun to move. It looked as if it had started to walk or slide. It was just like when Gwyn's body was lifted up and sucked into the monolith, but it was different, and it seemed as if they themselves, by their own will, were levitating through the air and approaching the monolith with unworldly power but their own will, their very hearts that felt it, were overpowered by a powerful force that they had no control over, and they were temporarily prevented from feeling anything, or even from opposing it. There is such a strangeness. One by one, the forms of these mages, 
as powerful as any of the dark powers, soared into the air and were drawn towards the monolith as if they were walking on an invisible bridge of glass. But if he could see them closely, he would see something in the glassy eyes of Tamiya, Ijisog, and Baba Yaga, who had become like living dolls. In the eyes of the glass balls of Tamiya, Ijisog, and Baba Yaga, who had become like living dolls, he would have found something that froze his soul, something that terrified even Dole himself, and something that made him shudder even more with the pain of being forced to do as he was told. Undoubtedly, the monolith's mighty power had imprisoned them, and they were unable to see each other, to scream, or even to scream. As they did so, their bodies slid through the air and came close to touching the monolith, or rather, the monolith also seemed to be approaching them with a faint trembling. The body of Tamiya, who was in the lead, suddenly disappeared into the dark jelly, seemingly unable to tell that the monolith had embraced her or that Tamiya had jumped into it. Then Ijisog then Baba Yaga. Finally, after the headless torso of Luluba was plunged into the ground with struggling limbs, the eyeless head of Luluba herself jumped into the air like a ball that had been picked up, and with that the monolith stopped emitting light. On the contrary, even the faint light that knew the darkness and the body of the monolith, which was darker than the darkness, began to fade. In the end, they blended together so perfectly that there was no way to tell which part was the night darkness and which was the monolith. And yet, it has not gone away, wherever it may be. In fact, the fact that it is no longer visible makes us feel even more clearly that it is indeed there. There was no sign of what had happened to Gwyn and the five mages who had been swallowed up in it, and yet it was there. For a while, R sat on the cobblestones, looking up at the black sky in a daze, in a state of limbo that was no longer frightened or horrified by the too rapid change. He did not seem to pay any attention to the pile of rubble around him, nor to the faint groans of the wounded coming from somewhere. Suddenly, he sprang to his feet, as if he had come to his senses at the sound of a call. Oh oh, my god. Suddenly, he looks around and shouts. The thin nose and round eyes of his epithet, which resembled those of the cave rat Torek, flashed and trembled violently in his deadly pale face, and then he lay limp in the hollow between the stones and began to drag out Varaus's heavy body, which was uninjured, he pulled out Varaus's heavy body, which was unhurt, and began to shake it. Volutha, Volutha. Oh, no. They've taken the king with them. Volutha, wake up, Volutha. At first, the Arachnean dancer did not show any signs of regaining consciousness, no matter how much Ars shook her. Ars, in his eagerness, struck Varousa on the cheek two or three times, moved his head from side to side, and when he saw that she did not notice him, he looked about for some place to take care of her, or at least a jar of water or wine. It couldn't be, the area was no longer the glorious capital of Chironia, but the misery of a mere ruin, with rubble, broken houses and broken pillars all around. Oh, my God, we have to, Valersa, come on. As Ars fumbled with his hands, Varousa's chest suddenly rose and fell a couple of times, and she opened her eyes blankly. The last scene in her dazed memory must have suddenly appeared in her mind it was the horrible scene of being lifted high in the air by Baba Yaga's sorcery, and then being thrown down. Then Igisog's claws suddenly appeared out of the sky and grabbed her firmly by the torso, a terrifying scene. She raised her body and let out a high-pitched scream. But soon he looked around with eyes that this time were clearly aware of his surroundings, and noticed that the appearance of the area had somehow changed. His eyes fell on ours, and he opened his mouth to scream again, but he immediately recognized it as ours, and looked at the little bandit who had been with him on his adventure in the magic alley with a puzzled and unsure expression. Oh, ours. King. King. A muffled voice finally escaped from her mouth. Ars grabbed Velusa's bare shoulders and tried to explain in a frightened voice what had happened during her unconsciousness. Took the king. Who took him? What about the mages? Varousa shakes her head, seemingly unable to comprehend. She looked as if she was about to cry out in frustration, and Ars shook her. They're gonna get the king before you can say anything about it. I don't know what to do, just tell Obsidian Palace. You idiot. What's the use of informing the soldiers of the court? Varousa, who was finally beginning to understand the situation, made a firm decision. 
Ten thousand of the bravest knights in Chironia could not stand against such a demonic force, not even the king himself. But if that's the case, the king is with them. What do I do? What do I do? Velusa, finally realizing the gravity of the situation, twisted her hands together and let out a cry of anguish. We can't get back to the first court in time, and I don't think those hard-headed courtiers will believe anything you and I say any time soon. Oh, what am I going to do? The king is going to die. And again she lifted her hands to the sky and shook her head in anguish. But I haven't done that for a long time. Suddenly, her eyes widened she peered at ours, as if the thought had been floating in the air around her and had suddenly entered her with her breath. Yes, it is. It's Yolasha. It's Yolasha. He unties his twisted hands, claps his palms together violently and shouts. Yeah. Well, don't you see? You're so impatient. Why do you think the king came to the silent city in the middle of all this commotion without being accompanied? The king knew at once that this enemy could not be defeated by ordinary means and decided to ask for Yolasha's help. Yolasha is a great white magician who could live in such a strange place and foretell all this. I'm sure she'll help us defeat them and save the king. Let's go, ours. We'll never make it to the palace in time. You and I will go to Yolasha and tell her of our plight and ask her to save the king. But, ours was about to say something, but he could not finish what he had said. Don't bother coming, girl. Suddenly, on a street that should have been empty, a voice came from the sky, and like a shadow in the water, a dim figure began to emerge. And it was in the form of a mage with white hair and white beard, wearing a hooded cloak tightly around him. Hiya! Ars screamed and ran out of there as if he had been burned. Velusa put her hand over her mouth and almost screamed, but barely managed to stop herself. Whoa! Wow, you scared me. Don't freak me out too much. From where Ars had jumped, he put his hand to his chest and made a grumbling sound. Yolasha laughs. I didn't mean to alarm you. But things are a bit urgent. No, no, there's no explanation. I watched the whole thing from the beginning with my mind's eye from my home in another dimension. No, then why didn't you do it sooner? The mage raised his old hand out of his palm to stop Velusa, who was about to speak out in anger. I am not aware of all that is going on in the world, and I am not at liberty to do anything about it. I had to measure the stars and find out what was preventing them from moving in the right direction, and I also had to find out the nature of the feverish miasma that was enveloping the silence. But now I've done all of that, and apparently I've also got the weapons I need to cut down the ever-present miasma. So I immediately opened the dimensional portal and this is how I came to be here, my daughter. Things are getting pretty serious. If they succeed in misusing the energy of the Kylonian leopard, the bad factors will destroy the right factors, and the whole area will become a horrible picture of darkness instead of light, and the will of Dole instead of the golden rule. It could be a horrible version. Then why are you lingering here? Varousa shouted, jumped up and pointed to the sky, dark and seemingly empty, but not the night sky of all nights, but rather a blocky, starless, cloudless sky. Because, daughter, I must beg your help. Yolasha replied. That's why I stopped going directly from my dimension to the dimension of that dark monolith and came here. I told you earlier that I have many weapons, but one of them, not to face the greatest danger, is you, my daughter. I don't know, do you want to help the leopard? Of course. Varousa coughed and puffed out her chest. I'd die for the king. Because I'm, I'm the king's. He stopped saying it. His dark cheeks stained slightly. Yolasha nodded. You're coming with me, even in this strange dimension. Don't you dare sit here and tell me what to do, was Varousa's reply. She looked around, and as soon as she saw the glint of a dagger on the cobblestones, which seemed to have slipped from the sheath of someone's sword, she sprang to her feet, picked it up, and put it in the sash at her waist. Yolasha looked at ours as if to ask what you are going to do but this time in silence. Ars rolled his eyes and shuddered. Of course I'm coming. I want to save the king too, so why would I not want to go? I shouted with all the energy I could muster. Yolasha nodded under her hood, 
her lips twitching slightly in a wry smile. All right, let's go. I'll tell them. But but how? How do you fly through the air? She looked up at the sky and suddenly remembered that she had been lifted high into the air by Baba Yaga, and she clutched her hands to her chest in fear. Yalesha gave a small laugh. A true magician doesn't need such a grandiose device. Like I told you. Come here, stand on either side of me and close your eyes. You'll get dizzy if you're not used to it. The trip should only take a second. Now, let's go. Ars and Valersa looked at each other, and then slowly walked to the sides of Eulatia. The mage's calloused hands fumbled with the prayer cord on her chest, and her lips began to chant some incantation. And so they set out on a strange and bizarre adventure, the likes of which no living person has ever encountered before. A darkness spread behind my eyelids, which suddenly turned into a feeling of being lifted up and a faint blush. There was a strange, dizzying sensation, as if the whole body had been melted into mush at a frightening speed, and then immediately put back together again, and time and space lost their normal operation. All right, you can go ahead and open your eyes now. Yulaisha's calm voice came after what seemed like an eternity, but could have been an instant or thousands of years. Both Ars and Velusa, who opened their eyes and looked around, drew in their breath in astonishment, and swallowed their inarticulate cries. It was a place not unlike the streets of the silence, destroyed without a glimpse of them by Grax's horse, where they had been a moment before. On the contrary, it does not seem to them to be in the least similar to any other place they know of, in all the frontiers of the world, in all the spheres of civilization. Co, this is. Ars looked back at his surroundings in disbelief. I don't know where the hell I am. The monolith, as you called it earlier. That huge black structure isn't really a structure at all, but this is inside it. In that tombstone. So you're saying we're hanging in the air now? Ars looked down in dismay, but could see nothing. Verousa was more pragmatic. She looked as if she had no choice but to come wherever she was, and after a moment of wonder, she paused to catch her breath and survey her surroundings. It was an indescribably beautiful and bizarre sight. All around, from the ceiling, which seemed to be far above our heads, to the surrounding walls, there was the same strange, soothing shade of darkness. The darkness seemed to be made up of the same jelly or jellyfish, although in places the shadows grew thicker and thicker, and in other places the darkness was tinged with a hint of whiteness, as if something beyond it could be seen, and this strange world was tremendously wide, as if it were a huge limestone cave. Wide and high. At the bottom of the cavern, which was so vast and high ceiling that it was not even a tenth of the huge audience room of the Obsidian Palace, they stood together like rats wandering in the audience room, looking upwards. The walls on all four sides are not flat, but like a lump of clay that has been kneaded and abandoned by a mad sculptor, with deep hollows in some places, and weird scaly bumps all the way down to the top. The difference is that all the walls are shaking like gelatin, and seem to be constantly shaking and moving, making those who are inside dizzy. On the left-hand side, where they were standing, there was an overhang of steps, like a balcony, and on the right-hand side, there was a gradual ascent, which led to a darkened passage like a wide-open mouth. I could see it in the strange gloomy brightness. The other places, too, are vague, but each exposes its own bizarre, object-like appearance in the dark space. There was no sign of normal life at all except for the three of them, and the area was bizarrely silent and grim to the extent that it made me wonder if there were no normal sounds, lights, or even life in this world. It's hot. Verousa wrinkled her nose, murmured, and gently wiped her forehead. I don't know, and it smells weird. He wrinkled his nose and muttered again. In fact, there was a warmth in the air that seemed to come over me even if I remained still, and as Verousa had said, there was a strange and unpleasant smell in the air. The faint but persistent smell was different from the musty, clammy smell typical of the demon realm, or the sweet smell of the evil incense of the Temple of the Dolls. It was, as it were, a, it was a faint but tantalizing and unfamiliar odor, like the smell of blood mingled with the sweet stench of a rotting disease or overripe fruit. They made them anxious, uncomfortable, and nervous. 
At last, both Farousa and Ars leaned closer to the mage, grasping his cloak as if this man chased by the doll was their only hope. And it's so big. What the hell is this place? With such high ceilings, it seemed natural that the voices would reverberate, but instead they were absorbed by the walls as if they had a high degree of soundproofing, and the original grim silence quickly returned. You wouldn't believe me if I told you that, and it wouldn't do you any good if I told you that. Yalesha replied. Is there really a king in here somewhere? Ars asks. Yalesha nodded. Definitely. Okay, well, let's go out. As Veluka finally realized their urgent task. Hey, I don't like being here. My back is starting to itch and I feel like something is very dangerous. I don't know what it is, but it's staring at us from somewhere and wondering what we should do. That's strange. To tell you the truth, I was just thinking the same thing and was about to say it. Ours cried out, and they looked at each other and shared a secret shudder. Yalesha nodded several times as if she had some idea of what was going on, but said nothing about it. For now, I think our first priority is to find the king, but to do that, we must first know where he is. He then pulled his wrinkled hands out of the sleeves of his cloak and began to make some intricate signs. His slender, clawed fingers quickly draw runes in the air. Finally, the mage took out a small crystal prayer ball from his chamber and dropped it into the ward he had just drawn in the air with his own fingers, and it stood perfectly still between his hands as if held together by an invisible thread. Yalesha drew elaborate rune patterns on it again. As Varousa and Ars watched breathlessly, the crystal ball suddenly began to emit a faint white light, illuminating the strange, other-dimensional cave as if a small, incandescent sun had been born there. Go! When Yalesha waved her finger as if to frighten him, the ball soared high into the air, still emitting light, and after wandering around in the air for a while as if searching for its whereabouts, it began to move toward one direction with a kind of joy as if the dog had found the odor trail it sought with its sense of smell. Yalesha looked back at her two companions. Very well. All you have to do is follow that prayer ball and it will find out where the king is. Ha! As Yalesha urged, Varousa and Ars looked at each other again as they stepped in the direction of the sphere. Velusa is the daughter of a dancer in the service of a mysterious female sorceress in a magic alley, and Ars is not completely unrelated to the world of witchcraft, having touted for a gypsy fortune-teller during her various itineraries. We know that this world is not necessarily the only absolute one, that this world is just a shadow of another, and that the shadows of this world are also surely falling into other worlds. The term witchcraft, black magic, black magic, white magic, and white magic are not the stuff of fairy tales, they are nothing but the accumulation of wisdom to know and use different series of laws, which can be called horizontal axes if the laws of physics are vertical axes. I am well aware of this. But even they could not help but be intimidated, engulfed, and awed by the strangeness of the situation and the many wiles that the mages wielded with such ease. This is truly a realm that is beyond the reach of human wisdom or mundane science, and the laws and golden rules that pervade it are also impossible to know. The deeper one penetrates into this realm, the more it penetrates and overwhelms the hearts of the living, silencing their mouths and filling their eyes with nothing but wonder, bewilderment and shame. Well, I'm not going to let you talk me into it. Following the crystal ball that stood to guide the way, Yalesha quietly explained as he walked faster and faster, seeing the two of them. I have cursed that prayer ball with the sense of smell of a dog and the love of a pigeon, plus the personality patterns of a leopard-headed king. That's why that sphere is relentlessly pursuing the leopard-head king no matter where he is, and that flame will never go out until it finds him. This is just a very rudimentary magic method, but it was also an experiment for me. An experiment. Well, this dimension is probably no other than a boundary artificially sealed by my archenemy. I needed to find out quickly whether the techniques I use in the midst of this world have the same effect as those of my sealed world and the general world out there. So, fearfully, Varousa asked her. Yalesha did not answer, but pointed with her chin to a ball of light moving ahead. For a while there was no one left to talk to. They remained silent and concentrated on keeping up with the ball. 
It was a strange and bizarre journey that they will never forget. The ball, without hesitation or hesitation, went straight ahead like an onboard boat being sucked into a distant mothership, and at first it soared straight up, and then went up the slope on their right, keeping a constant height. At length they came to a dark hole, a monster's mouth, where they paused for a moment, as if in thought, and then suddenly increased their speed and plunged into it. If any of the three of them thought that it would be unwelcome to go into that lofty cave, they did not say so. They stepped into the cave in silence. The lukewarm, odoriferous air stung their faces in a sickening way. It was vomit-inducing, dirty, and even evil. Wherever this is, it is certainly not a ward created by a righteous and pure heart, Varousa thought, and said it softly. Ours only cut the sign of Janus and made no reply, but Yalatia nodded. That's right, girl. I say this very seriously. It's like, it's like I'm in the belly of some kind of beast. And Veluka said. That's right. And Yalatia answered briefly. In fact, it could be said that he had entered a place several times more unpleasant than when he had walked through the depths of the hole. The path was so narrow that a tall man could stoop down to walk on it, and if he stretched out his hands, he would be grabbed by the walls on both sides. The walls seemed to be made of a substance a little firmer than the gelatinous material of the previous one, but they undulated in regular waves that made their skin crawl strangely, and the same was true of the ceiling and the floor so that if they were not careful of their footing, they would almost trip over the protruding parts of them at every step. The inside of the cave, whether it was the ceiling or the walls, was warm and still, and sometimes sticky water dripped from the cave as if it were oozing. It was not a good feeling, of course, but it was still better than the same liquid that seeped out from under my feet with each step. It's like walking through the body of a snake, Varousa thought secretly. She did not know in her dreams how true it was. The warmth, the darkness, and the smell, but even more unbearable was the instinctive fear of man of the confined space, of when that strange, lifelike, weird hole would close up and contain them, and the seemingly endless passage would suddenly cut off. When the seemingly endless passageway suddenly broke up and opened up again, Varousa and Ars let out a low cheer. But immediately Yalatia's hand tugged on his arm as if to scold him and discourage him. But there was no need of that. At last they came to a space high above their heads, and as soon as they had leaped forward their feet stopped, their voices froze on their tongues, and their eyes widened as if they were about to burst. The guiding sphere was clearly overflowing with joy to an unusual degree. Its light became dazzlingly strong, and it no longer even waited for the three of them but flew quickly up into the sky, moving with great speed. Where you're going? There was the figure of the leopard-headed king I sought. The surrounding area is very similar to the place where they first regained consciousness, a place that could be called a hall in a limestone cave. At the bottom, a winding slope, a number of inscrutable pillars, and an unfathomable darkness mark the path they have taken. The hall, however, extended higher and higher than the exit of the pit in which they stood. The walls around this area are much harder and darker than those below, and it is difficult to tell what is hidden there or what kind of undulations are hidden there. Above all, above their heads was a darkness that they could not even see, and so they looked up at the darkness above and below them and thought that they themselves must be right in the middle of that black monolith, but they could not even imagine how far that darkness extended above and below them. I couldn't even imagine. It could be said that the lower part was the darkness of the Norn's depths, and the upper part was the abyss of outer space, or, in the first place, could there be anything in this world that could be said to be above and below, and, and in the very midst of the darkness, far above their awe-stricken eyes, Gwyn lay there quietly. However, it was also difficult to say under what circumstances he was being held. He was lying on his back as he had been when he was lifted by invisible hands from the silent streets, carried and sucked into the monolith, his eyes closed, apparently insane, but his body was either lying on a jet-black platform or floating in a thicker, more concentrated darkness. I could not tell whether he was floating in the dark or not. And a strange thing was hovering quietly on the chest of his motionless body, just around his heart. A ball of brilliant crimson light, like a flaming jewel. It is just the size of a prayer ball, 
but it flashes quietly, just like the heartbeat of a leopard-headed hero. As soon as she saw him, a low voice came out of Yulaisha's mouth. Oh! He plucked the leopard's soul from the king's chest. I didn't think he'd make it that far. We must hurry, the king is in danger. The king the king. Varousa's patience, which she had barely been able to hold on to, seemed to fade as soon as she saw her beloved king, and she suddenly tried to run at Gwyn. Wait! Yulaisha grabbed her arm just in time and held her back. Why are you stopping me I have to save the king. We wait. I said wait. Yulaisha scolded him. You'll see. With a quick gesture, he raised his arm and pointed vaguely to the area. Varousa gasped as she was gripped by Yulaisha's strong, thin fingers. Oh this is. I heard Arza's horrified voice. Suddenly, the darkness around them turned to a faint twilight brightness. In the midst of it all, I saw. Tamiya, Baba Yaga, I.G. Sog. Headless Rolba and his head right next to it, and Iraha back to her original size. They are none other than the figures of the five mages who disappeared a while ago. But they were as if they had been turned into wax figures or something. Rather, each of them is encased in a translucent, gooey jelly that keeps them alive for a while, if I may say so. They stood frozen in the air, or in the air, or close to the wall, as if they were ornaments arranged by the hand of some daring person who had collected them. His eyes are dim and dull, and he does not seem to be seeing or hearing anything. And, it's, someone's watching Alicia. Suddenly, Velusa whispered in a trembling voice. He's staring at U.S. From somewhere, Yulaisha puts her hands on his warm, bare shoulders to soothe him, and squeezes his chin as if to say, look. In the meantime, the prayer ball wasn't waiting around. It seems to have sensed in its strange intellect that it had finally come close to the one whom it sought, as soon as it ventured out into the open. It seemed to be a twin of the red ball on Gwyn's breast, and it flew up and down like a pale comet toward the form of Gwyn's leopard-headed human body that was lying on his head. And now just as it was about to touch Gwyn's body, it was a tremendous blow, as if lightning had directly struck the ground in front of him, and through the shock like an electric shock, a metallic sound of perine deafened my ears. When they finally regained their bearings, they looked up. The shining ball of prayer was shattered without a trace. The invisible barriers on Gwyn's body had shattered it into a million pieces. Oh! In awe and shock, Velusa screams, but it is quickly replaced by a shrill scream. They're waking up. Shoo! Be quiet! Was Yulaisha's sharp rebuke. Look at me, daughter, get down. The king! The king! Velusa shouted in a thirsty voice. And then. And before them, looking on in horror and amazement, as if life had been breathed into a clay figurine, the five wicked sorcerers opened their eyes, and their breasts rose and fell, and they looked about them, and they said, What is this? And they found each other. Ah! Varousa closed her twin eyes as if in a state of intense fear and despair. Whatever it is that has made this monolith a ward of foul black magic and has kidnapped and sealed Gwyn and the five mages within it, whatever its intentions, there can be no doubt that it is evil infinitely evil. There's no doubt about it. If even that was the will of the Lord of the Sealed Realm at work there, then it was undoubtedly nothing but the worst and most unfortunate moment that that will chose to bring those five abducted mages out of suspended animation. The fear of not being able to save the King of Chironia, who lay there as if dead, unmoved by the noise, made Varousa forget herself and she drew her dagger from her waist sash. Daughter! Stay down! Stay down. Yulaisha's fingers tighten around her arm. No, I have to save the king. Velusa shouted back, but as soon as she saw the cold blue eyes peering out from behind the mage's hood, she felt as if she were choking and stopped speaking. When Yulaisha looked away, she could breathe again, but she did not dare to scream anymore, because of the instinctive respect that a burned beast has for fire. But I'm not the kind of girl who gives up on that. Instead of screaming, why, Yulaisha, if they, those dark power mages, find out about the king and one of them goes there, the king will be unconscious and unable to fight. They'll take the king and leave him in their hands. Fortunately, they're dazed and motionless as if they'd just come to their senses. 
They don't seem to have noticed the king either, so I have to get up there and save him while I can. He lowered his voice but spoke very fast. Yalatia shook her head. It is not for the present that you are needed as weapons of war. Daughter, even though this is such a strange world, it too can never be completely free from some laws. For example, the operation of the stars. As long as that is the case, nothing can be accomplished without waiting for the right time, waiting for the inevitable factor to take its course. We must wait. You don't know what you're talking about. Look up, look up. And then, with a tight breath, he watched the world's most bizarre magical map. For a moment, it seemed as if there was no sign of anything moving, just a bunch of wizards frozen in place like the wax dolls from before. But, the next moment, their glassy eyes caught each other's, and in their mournful faces, a silent and terrible hostility, or rather, murderous intent, suddenly flashed like a bolt of lightning. What's the matter with you, Yalatia? There's something wrong with you. Velusa screams in a hoarse voice. She'll look at it. Yalatia whispered, and with a tense expression made some kind of sign. There was still a brief pause as the five mages spotted each other. Then, suddenly, they rushed at each other. I.G. Sog's mouth, which was open to his ears, opened and he gave a cry like that of a monstrous bird. As if in answer to his cry, Baba Yaga raised his staff. With that movement, the moss spores that had grown all over Baba Yaga's body flew up like a cloud. I.G. Sog. I.G. Sog. Once again the synthetic screamed a hair-raising yell. The headless Raleba held his head in his arms and seemed to be in the most frenzied rage of all. He took his head back in his hands and held it up high. The first eye, made of stone and standing upright in the middle of the forehead, snapped open. Caw! A strange cry burst from his mouth, and just as he thought it, the eyes of the stone suddenly became red and bright, and a ray of light burst forth from them, aiming blindly and desperately at the other four. The black witch Tamiya was on the line. She jumped away with an agile gesture, but as soon as she did, Reliva turned around. Gaw! It was Iraha who screamed. Struck by a ray of light from his stone eyes, the dwarf fell backwards, but recovered quickly, and, in a fit of rage, he spread out his hands, crawled up into the air, looked down and opened his mouth. As if a sticky white thread had been spat out from his mouth, the thread immediately spread out and wrapped itself around Luluba. Rolba shook his body in anger. But the thread that Iraha had thrown out seemed to have a strong adhesive power, and the more Raliba struggled, the more it stuck to him, and the more he was caught up in it. Rurba struggled furiously to free himself from the thread. But when she found that she could not free herself, she was seized with a mad rage, and, brandishing a raw head with eyes of stone, began to shine a beam of light at him at random and everywhere. One of the strips just happened to hit Baba Yaga's back as he was glaring at Igasog. Immediately, from Baba Yaga's rocky back, a huge amount of moss, ferns, and mud blew away, and at the same time, a thick yellow smoke rose up from it. Baba Yaga turned and pointed at them with his thin, shriveled hand. Immediately, the smoke rose up like a living thing, and split into three lines, and fell upon Tamiya, Iraha, and Ruruba, who was wrapped in Iraha's thread. It's a dog-headed snake. Tamiya's scream is heard, and a disgusting messenger born from the air leaps up to repel Baba Yaga's poisonous smoke. Yalesha, Yalesha. In the face of this whole thing, Varousa was shaking so much that she didn't even realize that she was holding on to Yalesha's cloak like she was about to tear it. What's the matter oh, what's the matter? They re they re they re they re they re out of their minds. What's happened to them? What's happened to them? You're right, you're out of your mind, girl. Yalesha whispered back, her voice filled with a faint, unconcealed excitement that did not match her calmness, as she watched the Dark Ones fight to the death. Look closely. They are fighting each other with all their skills and are filled with mad rage that they must destroy all the others, but they are not aware of the reason for their rage. They are just fighting puppets, taunted, put to sleep and left to their own devices. That that's such a... Varousa put his hand to his mouth, and at that very moment the swinging head of Luluba turned downwards, and he screamed as that murderous wraith shot out at them. It's okay. 
Yulaisha suddenly drew a circle with his slender fingers, and then, quite close to their bodies, the rays suddenly disappeared, as if they had been absorbed by something. Do not leave this circle. I've put a barrier there. As long as you're in here, your magic can't help you. Yulaisha explained, pointing to the area where his long finger had just drawn a circle. I am the man chased by the doll, and you are the dark powers that have the doll at their head. Even against the doll herself, even against the great demon Sabine, this barrier could not be broken by her servants. It's a magical path. Ars murmured as if he had a feeling. Both Farausa and Yulaisha looked at him in surprise, because they had honestly forgotten about this little bandit. But to turn such, such powerful mages into such, such fighting puppets, who in the world would do such a thing? Who? Varousa whispered. It's not that I don't trust Yulaisha's so-called barriers, but everything is so abnormal that I'm not sure to what extent I can withstand the shock of her and ours in the flesh. Yendar Zog. Yulaisha's answer was short, and she did not know what it was, but it had a terrible ring to it. Yander Zog. Velusa and Ars rolled their eyes and looked at Yulaisha. Yulaisha nodded. Yendar Zog. He's the one I've long suspected would be my greatest enemy in this matter. So you're a mage. Velusa sensed something in Yulaisha's tone and asked her fearfully. Speaking of mages, well, I suppose you could say that. Yulaisha watched as the head of Tamiya's dog-headed snake, which had been torn off, fell straight down and rebounded against the barrier. But who knows where men become men and where they become not men, besides the gods. Except, of course, for beasts like that I.G. Sog. Iga Sog was struck by Baba Yaga's staff and fell, but he barely managed to regain his position in the air. Even so, can the renowned Gracious, the Dark Priest, be called a mage? Of course he's a mage. What about Agrippa, the legendary great mage who lived for 20,000 years? Do they not have powers far beyond our concept of mages as human beings who are involved in magic? He continued in a tone of voice as if the place was not the hell of the five demons, but an elegant salon with rose tea in front of it. Gracious, priest of darkness. Agrippa, Ars shouted. His little charming eyes were round and round. This Yendar is just as great as that legendary great mage. How much difference do you think there is between two to the infinite power and three to the infinite power, Ars? Yulaisha said, wiping away the spray of someone's blood that had splashed against the barrier with a flick of her finger. Oh, Iraha's got a hand wound. Varousa and Ars look up in panic. The ray of light from Luluba's stone eye finally cuts through the spider silk that Iraha is sprouting, and frees Luluba's body. At the same time, Iraha's thread, having lost its way, slithered toward Baba Yaga, who threw his staff at it in panic. Iraha threw away his staff, but could not get rid of it, and was struck in the shoulder, and fell backwards, trying to stop the blood from spurting. As the infinite power of two approaches infinity, and as the infinite power of three approaches infinity, they will appear to your eyes only as infinitely large. But to the eye that can grasp them as a precise concept, it is clear that as they grow infinitely large, the difference between them also grows infinitely large. Do you understand? What's that got to do with this? Ars rolled his eyes and asked, but Yulaisha didn't try to explain further and urged him to look. They're going to get Iraha. As he did so, the wounded dwarf staggered and tried desperately to regain his footing, but Baba Yaga's staff, which had escaped his grasp, fluttered into the air and came back to haunt Ilak. With all his strength, Iraha opened his mouth and spat out several strands of thread. The thread spun out so smoothly that they nearly caught the staff and twisted it around. Seeing this, Baba Yaga turned and made a gesture as if to throw something at it, and the whitish ball from the end of his hand, which looked like a withered branch, flew up into the air and split open, and a cloud of poisonous smoke billowed from it and fell upon Iraha, who was still holding the staff at the end of the thread. In the meantime the hoofed IG Sog had disposed of all the three dog-headed serpents which Tamaya had summoned. The monsters were either decapitated, or ripped to shreds by IG Sog's hoofs, or torn to shreds, and smeared with fur and plasma, but soon their remains grew black and then disappeared like sand in the wind. 
Tamiya threw up her hands in anger and grabbed Iji Sog like a dark skinned harpy. Iji Sog dodged and opened her mouth with a snap, and a single flame spat out from her mouth, hurling it at the witch. The witch's body was engulfed in the flames and seemed to burst into flames, but a moment later, Tamiya's hands were brought together in a strange way, and then the fire was weakened as if it had been sprayed with water. As Tamiya's hand moved further, the flames suddenly flowed backwards and came upon I. G. Sog himself. Y. G. G. Sog flinched. At last Tamiya raised her hand as if to fan the flames, and suddenly a ray of light burst forth from their midst. It's a rule B.A. Tamiya and I. G. Sog were taken by surprise and staggered. Then Iraha's body, having lost its balance, fell from above and struck Tamiya. Tamiya rushed to change his stance, but could not do so in time. A. Ah. With a scream, Tamiya lost her balance and was hit in the face by a beam of light that radiated from Reliba's eyes in all directions. Gaw. Tamiya's scream drew the sticky darkness. Tamiya's black hand clamped down on her face, and she remained in the air for a couple of seconds as if in a tatara, before dropping downward like a shot bird. Immediately a thick, thick darkness engulfed the witch's body. Tamiya's been hit. Voluka screams and puts her hand over her mouth. How dare the witches of old Landergear come to me like that? Yalatia says. There's a faint, mocking crack in his voice. Irahao, he's not going to go down that easy yet, either. The dwarf, who had almost fallen, followed Tamiya and was about to be swallowed up by the darkness below when, at the last moment, he managed to support himself with the thread that had come out of his mouth and recovered. His shoulder was bleeding from the blow of Baba Yaga's staff, and his misshapen face was grimly drawn, but he turned his face to the side, and spitting out something white from his mouth at the wound in his shoulder, he gave it as a first aid, and immediately he slipped up into the air again, and rejoined the fight. And joined the fight again. He's going to need all the help he can get from Grax horses. Ha! His magic is more like a power that exists elsewhere than one that he possesses, so he's in trouble. Yalatia adds his comments. Velusa clenched her fists in front of her chest tightly. That monster mage of theirs is driving them insane, making them kill each other. R stared at Yalatia. So, what the hell is he going to do with that? Of course, they have the same intentions as the rest of us. Yalatia spoke in a grave tone. I'm sure he's thinking of taking the leopard head king into his own hands, dragging all those who might threaten his ambitions into his domain to fight each other, and if he can, he'll easily reap the benefits of their blood sacrifice, you know, a ward of its own. Suddenly, Velusa cried out in shock. So, that's us. Yes. Yalatia shrugged. We are now within the walls of Yendar Zog. Where did you think you were? Well, then the monolith is. Yes. The mage answered briefly. Verausa and Ars looked at each other in horror. So, are we ever gonna get out of here? It was Verausa who spoke in a whisper. A faint shrug under his cloak was Yalatia's only answer. Valersa looked around in horror. It is a scene which, when they are informed of it, strikes them with an unbelievable strangeness which they do not believe to be of this world. A dark, starless, gelatinous cave that seemed to be the womb of something huge. In the temple, as if in sacrifice to a gigantic dark god unknown to the world, was given a mighty leopard-headed warrior, whose eyes were still closed, as if completely deaf to all this noise, and whose a ball of red light shining on the chest of the armor, like a ray of light guiding the destiny. And the demons of dark power are fighting to the death for the sacred offering. It was, of course, a world and an inhabitant beyond the comprehension of mortals who remained in the realm of human knowledge, not to mention its destination, its course, and even its whole picture. Verausa's lips were as white as paper and bloodless, and with a small movement of her lips she continued to chant the name of Janus and all the prayers she knew. She could not help wondering if the hand of the gods of righteous destiny, with which she was so familiar, would ever reach her there but she knew that the chanting of his name was a sign of the normal operation, balance, and order of events that it symbolized, it reminded her of her burning desire to return to that place, and she felt that it would, at least in some small way, pour some light of sanity into her heart. Verausa glanced sideways and saw that the little villain had also turned his lips as white as paper, 
and was rattling his body and fumbling with the hilt of his carved dagger, chanting a name. In the meantime, the bloody battle in the sky continues. Rather, the more time passes, the more bloody and ghastly it becomes. In this horrible battle, where everything is an enemy and a target, those five living demons, who are still fighting under the control of something while losing their minds, are now mostly bleeding from some part of their bodies. Baba Yaga's staff is snapped by I.G. Jisog's teeth, and the old mage's back and chest are drawn wide as he is gripped by his claws. He still hurls poisonous smoke and flames out of the void at the synthetic man, but his already infinitely old face is dark with limp fatigue. But the I.G. Sog, too, was beginning to weaken, its fur scorched by Tamiya's fire and its scales torn by Lova's rays. Only its huge red eye blazed with a fierce rage, and it raised its hoof and kicked at Baba Yaga repeatedly, but its deadly hoof, which could not help leaving a scorching mark on stone or even steel if it struck properly, had lost its momentum, and Baba Yaga the Baba Yaga kept dodging and dodging, and in addition, the body of Ruba suddenly came out from the side and blindly clung to his legs. I.G. Sog. I.G. Sog. The synthetic man shouts in a gruesome rage. But Luliva's headless torso clings to him like a bat. Before he knew it, Rolba's raw head, which he held tightly in his hand, was snatched from him by Iraka's thread and thrown to the ground. The Cathians, who had lost their heads, were filled with a dark rage. His hand, which had embraced I.G. Jisog, crawled upward in search of his head, as if he would not be touched again. Yiga. As soon as I. G. Sog screamed and raised his powerful leg, he slashed his knee across the middle of Rolba's body, and Rolba's body caved in like a ball and flew through the air. Kao. Varousa involuntarily claps her hands over her mouth and lets out a scream. On Luluba's chest, a vivid hoof print, nearly ten centimeters deep, is burned like a brand. It was not a fatal blow and Luluba's body fell squarely on Iraha. Iraha screamed and tried to push him away. He was hit squarely in the wounded shoulder. Tamiya had fallen ahead of him, and was nowhere to be seen, whether waiting for an opportunity or in a stupor. Oh! Velus's strength and stout heart were distracted by the sheer viciousness of the endless struggle between the mages. Almost from within their hearts, they felt that they had lost all sense of reason, of where they were and who they were fighting against. When fire is spat at them, they turn it back with water, when poison is poured on them, they create vipers out of thin air, they mobilize all the secret arts they possess, and fight like madmen against the shadows in the mirror, covered in blood and mud. You'll see. Yulaisha's voice is also trembling with a frown of disgust and shiver. You see. I knew from the beginning that the five of them were equal in power, in skill, and in scale. Their strength is equal, and unless they have the help of Gluck's horse or something else, as we have seen, there is no chance of any one of them beating the other four, even if they were to fight for thousands of years. As long as one of them fights against each of the other four, they will never be able to win the final victory, as long as each of them exerts his strength little by little, almost as if the same quantity of wine were spilling out of a tartar of the same size through a hole of the same size. We will never win the final victory, we will just keep fighting. Since all of the techniques and mental powers are equal, the only thing that remains is the most primitive, since techniques are cancelled out by techniques, poison by poison, and wounds by wounds anyway, power against power, hand against hand, fist against fist. It's only a battle of teeth against teeth and even that is. Oh no. Ilak is. R screamed. Iraha tried with all his might to break free of Rolba's headless body, which clung to him like a tick, but he was a dwarf and could not break free of Rolba's height. Meanwhile, Rolba's hands were busy stroking Ilaka's body in search of the head he had lost, and at last he touched the neck that had fallen into his shoulders. But as soon as he did, a strange strength came into his hands, and slowly, with his bare hands, he twisted the dwarf's neck and pulled him out. Gaw! Iraha's tremendous scream deafened me. Kao! Varousa screams, covers her face with her hands, and finally crouches down there. Ours is also pale and trying to hold back the vomit that is coming up. Rorba's strong hands gripped Iraha's neck firmly, trying to pull it out of his hunched shoulders, bit by bit, 
inch by inch. Yalisha, ours pretends to sound disgusted. Don't rustle, was the answer of the man chased by the doll. A mage is no longer 100% human. Even Rolbo lives and moves around headless. The only reason they keep their human form, even if it's only for a short time, is because it's an unwritten rule of wizardry. Oh. Finally, Iraha's head has been cut off. Even Yelai Shaw furrowed his brows and looked away. Iraha's mouth let out a strange moaning sound that would never leave her ears again, and at the same time, blood began to spill from her mouth. Finally, Rolba's hand tore the little man's head from his shoulders. From the edge of the torn neck, I could see the white fluid of the bone marrow and the thin yellowish threads of the nerves trailing down, mixed in with the blood and red slime of the raw flesh. The headless body of the R.U.L. Ba was unconcerned with all this, and lifted up the head which it had at last obtained, and waved it about with glee, and then, trying to place it on the base of its own severed neck, it sprang at him in a rage to take back the head. He leaped with agility from Iraha's body. Iraha's head suddenly snapped up and she snapped at Rolba's wrist. Rolba, reeling from the pain, threw out Iraha's head. And just as he was about to lose his head again, ironically, his own throne head flew headlong into the line of fire of the murderous rays from the stone eyes that were being hurled at him without anyone's knowledge. Gaw! This time, the most horrible screeching sound in the world rang out from the headless body of Rurba. He just flapped his legs a couple of times and didn't move. On the other hand, Iraha, or rather, Iraha's severed neck and torso were circling each other like mad insects looking for a partner, but the neck, which was thrown out by Rorba's torso, found its own torso first, and once it had soared upwards, it rushed to come down. In the moment it's about to land on your shoulder. I'll take that. A dark yellow pus-like substance spurted from Baba Yaga's hand and stuck to the base of the back of his neck where it was torn off. Iraha's head turned quickly and landed on the base of the neck, which was blocked by the yellow stuff, but no sooner had it done so. He, with a shrill voice, the dwarf raised his short hand, scratched madly at the base of his neck, and began to dance the dance of death. Baba Yaga's left hand was broken off at the hoof by a blow from Ijisog's hoof, and was left dangling. The old man, a pile of rags in motion, saw the dwarf flailing madly and stuck out his long, bearded tongue and licked his mouth as if he were pleased with himself. Oh, I can't do this. He does not pay any more attention to Iraha, who is gradually sinking downwards as if she has lost even the strength to hold herself in the air, and suddenly, while making a gesture as if rowing with her hands through deep water, she tries to ascend little by little. When Valersa was about to jump out of the way and was held back by Yalesha, she saw that the purpose of the attack was obviously Gwyn, who was lying on the ground. I.G. Sog. I.G. Sog. With a feral scream, the huge body of a synthetic human suddenly teleported out and hit Baba Yaga with his body. It was so hard to resist the blow of the hoof that hit him squarely on the back. A long green tongue spat out from Baba Yaga's mouth, and Baba Yaga turned a couple of times like a frame spinning on the edge of a cliff while emitting smoke from his back, and then he fell straight down. IGG Sog. The monster's screams were clear and loud. The scaly crest on his back and his long bull-like tail were torn to pieces, his fur was scorched, and some of the tough scales were torn off, revealing whitish flesh. From its hoof, it soared toward Gwyn with tremendous force, trailing white smoke as if from burning iron. The two huge spikes fluttered downward as if they had grabbed the warrior and were about to fly away, and IGG Sog opened his mouth again and uttered a cry that was inaudible to the human ear. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Veluka screams. All five of us fall. The king's going to be killed by a monster. Bullshit. And no longer able to bear the thought of being separated from your beloved king any longer, leaving the fate of your beloved king to your own devices, you suddenly turned your back on the mage's hand and tried to run away. But when she had gone only five or six paces, an invisible wall stopped her, and she fell down, gasping with rage, and hurled all the curses and curses she could spare at Yalesha. From behind her. Wait for me, you slow-witted girl. It's not long now until it's our turn. See it. 
Suddenly, Yelisha's voice took on a terrifyingly dignified dignity, and she fell silent. And then he screamed. The IG Sog. No longer even remembering to berate Yelisha. Agrippa's synthetic, hoofed IG Sog's huge frame was about to grab onto Gwyn's body with its fierce claws. Jeez. He was suddenly flung backwards as if he had been knocked off. Oh, it's just like that crystal ball. Velusa screamed. Yes. Yendar Zog probably put up a strong barrier to protect his precious food, but I saw that it could not possibly be breached by an IG Sog, and it seems I was right. Look. Yalesha points. Varousa and Ars look over and gasp. IG Sog is on the ropes. The front of the body, the part that had been hit by the shockwave of the barriers as it tried to grab Gwyn, from the face to the legs that were bent like a goat's, was burnt to a crisp, the skin peeled off and hung down like rags, the flesh melted to reveal bones. His one red, fierce eye was now mangled, and IGG Sog, scratching his face madly with a half-mangled hand, strode about the cave, striking the walls here and there. Every time he did so, they watched in horror as the wall became like a tomato that had been smashed into the ground. That's when. Now. Yalesha yelled in a resounding voice. The celestial clock is now. Come on, Valersa, ours. Where, where, where? Of course, you idiot. They've all been killed, and Baraku has lost his fighting spirit. Take this opportunity to rescue the king. Because because the barriers. R screamed. He looked up at IGG Sog, who was rolling his eyes and screaming strangely. No matter. I can break through the barriers, because they are all of the dark power, and for that reason I cannot break through the ranks of the dark power's inner power, but I am the man chased by the doll. But since I am a man who has abandoned the doll, the techniques I use are of a different order from those of you. Yalesha explains, impatiently. I don't know what it is, but you're going to save the king. Then go, go, go. Velus is on the ground screaming. All right, grab my cloak. Hold on tight. Yalesha took two coils of heavy prayer string from her hiding place and put them over her hands. Listen, as long as you hold on to this cloak, you'll be safe, but the last time you let go, you'll melt away like a fly in boiling oil. I'm going to tell him to pray harder and I'm going to search his prayer beads. No sooner had they waited for Velusa and Ars, who were desperately clinging to their cloaks, than their bodies flew up into the air like bubbles in a soap bubble, and they flew straight to Gwyn. The word soap bubbles was not necessarily a metaphor. For, as soon as they came within a stone's throw of Gwyn, there was, as usual, a tremendous noise and a burst of sparks, and the pale blue sparks dimly illuminated the invisible ball that surrounded them. Hiss. Caw. Varousa and Ars shrunk their necks and tried to hide in the shadows of Yalesha's cloak, but despite the shock of course, they were nowhere to be seen like IG Sog. All right, let's get this barricade down. Yalesha's shout reached their ears as if to wet their shock. It's a bit dangerous here, but don't worry. I really need to get rid of both the enemy barriers and my barriers at once some. The mage's muffled voice chanted a long series of strange runes, his lips twisted in a way that was impossible for a human being, and the prayer string in his hand began to twist and lift to one side with tremendous force. And the prayer cord twisted and lifted to one side with tremendous force. And just when I thought. Okay, we're clear. Eurasia said. His face was covered with beads of sweat, and he threw up his prayer string, which had become useless. Then, with Velusa and Aruz in tow, he lands on the shelf next to where Gwyn is standing. This time, no sparks flew and no shock was felt. The surrounding area was still, and there was no sign of a fight, as if the mages had lost their strength. My king. As soon as Varousif saw the half-beast, half-man king she was in love with, she seemed to have forgotten all the crazy fears and strange occurrences she had been experiencing. My king, my king, my king. Already crying out in a half-whispered voice, he stumbled up to the leopard, looked for a moment at the red sphere in the air, and then immediately clutched the leopard head king's chest and tried to rub the leopard's head with a soft hand. My king. From the other side, a timid Ars also calls. Yalesha, what's wrong? 
The spell is broken, and the king won't open his eyes. Varousik cried out in reproach, and stretched out her thin but strong hand to shake him to rouse him. Wait! Sharply, Yalesha stopped him. She huffed and ducked her hand. It was the Chatsu barrier that I removed, but that won't last much longer. Moreover, in order to remove the barrier, we had to remove our own barrier as well. And indeed, his mental energy is indeed tremendous and enormous, and he still confronts me fiercely, so every second counts. I'm going to ask you a favor, Valersa, ours, the king's soul has been taken from him. It's easy enough to bring him back using my magic, but to do so so quickly might damage the king's will. So I need your energy, so hurry up. What are you doing? Ars let out a shudder. There's nothing to be afraid of, Yalesha said. But it's a bit tricky because it has to be done while this anti-barrier sorcery is refusing Chatz's intervention. But first that, he snapped his fingers. At the same time, the ball of red light that had been hovering above the armor began to sink silently into the king's body. This is. Ars looks him in the eye and tries to reach for his hand. Don't touch it. You have your souls back for now. With your love for the king, you must call him back from his wanderings into the darkness of Norn and bind him to his body as before. To do this, first, well, at any rate, massage his limbs while calling his name. Like this. Ars reached out to the king's body with trepidation. Whoa, you're cold. I feel like a dead man. Of course. The king has not been alive for some time now in the sense of your words. Like this, like this. Fearfully, Ars began to rub the king's strong, well-developed legs. But then he suddenly realized. Varousa. He made a grumbling sound. What are you doing I have to save the king as soon as possible? Something. Velusa hadn't even heard what Ars had said. His black eyes are wide and piercing, his lips have lost their color, and his face has an indescribably strange expression. If she had been a cat, all the hair on her body would have gone back. Varousa, how to? Ars was about to say. It's like you're covering yourself with it. There's something, there's something watching. Arachne's dancer whispered in a muffled voice. The thing that's been by our side all this time the thing that's been watching us all this time it's very close, and it's staring at us with its glowing red eyes. Velusa, come on, you're freaking me out. Ours made a womanly sound of fright and looked around. There's nothing, yeah, there's nothing. No. Yalesha raised her hand loosely and they both turned to look. I can feel it, too. Yanderzog. The voice came out of Ars' mouth with a tremble, as if he was afraid to hear it with his own ears. Um if that's the case, but, where, where the hell are you? If you're so easy to get to know, you have nothing to fear. Yalesha was very strict with him. In addition, this is Chatsu's own sealed world, if Chatsu has already appeared. I don't understand, why on earth did Chatsu not dare to fight again? but only left behind a barrier of residual thoughts and left it to us to comb over again. Why did Chatsu not even dare to fight, but simply left behind a barrier of residual thoughts for us to comb through? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something about the foul spirit of Chatsu. Velusa, you feel it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Earlier, I did indeed. Then Yendar Zog is lurking here somewhere, watching for an opening. Valersa has a strange gift. That's why I've been with you. But. I'm scared. Varousa tried to shout something. But. Ack. Look. I look back at ours as he screams. And. My king. You found me. He shouted with joy and ran to her. His feet froze. My king. They stare at him curiously. The leopard king's eyes widened, and his ample chest began to rise and fall in a slow and regular motion. But his eyes didn't see anything. My king I am. It's Voloka. Stay with me, my king. My king. In ours. My king, my king. While being shaken from both sides by the two, however, Gwyn's glorious leopard eyes, which are always filled with such fierce and strong vitality, are as dim as glass. My king. 
Wait. It can't be, but maybe the resuscitation didn't work after all. Or maybe Yendar Zog. Chatu is. Yulesha bent towards the king and was so carelessly distracted that she was completely distracted. Immediately, his body was flung away by a violent impact. Oh. A cry came out of his mouth as he stood upright against the king's body. Tatamia. Yes. You're alive, my dear. The black witch suddenly sprang out of the air, laughed out loud and pointed her finger triumphantly. Thank you, Grandpa. For removing the barrier and getting Yander's attention. Thanks to you, Tamiya came to her senses. All right. We're in control now. All the secrets of Gwyn and the stars are now Tamiya's. A filthy, sibilant laugh. With the king in their midst, the three of them stood as if frozen in place. Tamiya Yuri alive. Yulaisha's face twisted. The mage pointed a finger wildly at Tamiya. What's the meaning of your big words? Gwyn is mine, and that means the silence, Nakahara, and this whole world will be mine. Tamiya laughed aloud. A shrill, crow-like laugh. Hey, Gwyn, my man, isn't it? Now, don't just lie there, come here. Tamiya's thin clothes had been torn to shreds by the fierce battle, revealing her shiny black breasts and her strong, outstretched legs. The witch threw her arms around her chest and laughed loudly again. It's no use. Your friends are all as they were. The secrets of the stars do not belong to you. Back, witch. However upset Yulatia may have been by the surprise, he quickly regained his bearings and managed to regain at least a superficial air of confidence. He raised his hand angrily and made a violent gesture of retreat. But it didn't seem to have any effect on the lander gear witch. Instead of cowering in fear, she turned her chest away and laughed harder. I don't talk back to old men like you, doll chaser, while flaunting your gleaming chest. You should have succumbed to the white magic and been captured and eaten by the doll. Now, don't get in the way of my business. Just disappear and be gone. You talk a big game, you frog-grubbing whore of Lantagos. Yulatia replied without a hint of anger. You do not know. That you alone among the five mages gathered here have regained your senses and are able to speak so loudly does not mean that your art is superior to that of the other four. The power that should have been under the influence of the wards of this dole is merely stronger than that of men. In addition, the energy of the star-crossed dragons is far too much for you to handle, so don't waste what you have gained in the underworld, and flee back to your old home, where life is a kind of thing. Ha! Tamiya clapped her hands furiously and shouted in derision. Ha ha ha, you say. There's life and there's property. You want me to run away and go home? Ha! He turned his face away and laughed again, but when he straightened his head, the mocking expression had disappeared from his face. Oh, I almost forgot. There's not much longer until the meeting of the stars. I can't just sit here and kill time with this. Muttering in his mouth, he turned to the king with his white, glowing eyes glistening with fascination. Come on, Gwyn, wake up, the mages are done, it's just me and you. Come out here and give your long-awaited bride a kiss that tastes as good as your strong drink. You're filthy. Verausa had been silent until then, but how could she have withdrawn when she heard this? The king is not a groom for a dirty black woman like you. Before Eurasia could restrain him, he sprang forward clinging to the king's still half-awake shoulders and shouting. Oh, this little sparrow was perched here. Tamiya is blatantly mocking you. Come, Gwyn, my man, my brave and very strong man, wake up and come here. Tamiya will hold you, Tamiya, the black witch, will cover your leopard head with her two tits and kiss your wet nostrils. And I'll kiss your wet nostrils. The king will not be deceived. My king. In her haste, Verausa tries to hide the king with her own body from Tamiya's outstretched hands. Suddenly, however, his body was thrust aside by a thick arm that came from behind him. Velusa stood still. Gwyn's getting up. The expressionless leopard head had a strange, drowsy, sleepwalking appearance. No sooner had Velusa stretched out her hand and grabbed his arm to hold him back than the leopard-headed king's huge frame stood up straight and walked out like a giant golem. 
towards Tamiya. My king, Valersa screamed. My king, my king, have you noticed? Yes, sir, ours is here. Ours screams too. Yalacia's eyes narrow. Tamiya is very proud of himself. Yes, come here and hold me in your strong hands, leopard, oh, I'll make you sit on my right and be my king. Yeah, well, the world is just you and me. Gwyn. Suddenly, Yalacia shouted at him in a strained voice. It sounded like a magic spell. Gwyn, wake up. Wake up. But, the king stretches out his hand towards Tamiya, and continues to approach her with a very slow, almost mournful gesture. It's no use, old man. Tamiya sneered high in the air. Yalacia raised her hand and made an inviting gesture, but when she saw that there was no effect, she grabbed Varaus's shoulder and pulled him back. It's not right, it's not supposed to be like this. I whispered quickly. My art comes from Dole and protects him, and since I have survived thus far with Dole and all of his servants as my enemies, there is no way that my telekinesis can defeat the telekinesis of a witch like her, even if she is a priestess of Lontagos. Remember, Valersa, Gwyn said you met Tamiya before. What happened then? Did Gwyn give the witch something to wear, nails, hair, a vow or something? Unlikely as it may seem. I cannot awaken the king with this telekinesis of mine. There's a strong block preventing me from controlling him. Varousa sank hard into thought, but faster than she could think of it. Ho ho ho. If you don't know, I'll tell you. Tamiya's laughter rang out. Her black hand was stretched out, almost touching Gwyn's strong hand. Gwyn is mine. Well, one should always have good roots. I rescued Gwyn and those two lads from the Arachne spider. Gwyn swore an oath in the name of the Leopard King. I'll repay you, one way or another. Ho ho ho. Ah, ours is ranting. Yes, yes. Well, the king made a sacred promise to drink the witch's brew in the witch's ward in Landargia, and to repay her in due time. You drank the wine of Lontagos. A moan of pain escaped from Eulatia's mouth. Oh, you idiot. You drank the old wine of the witch of Lontagos. Yes, of course. And Gwyn has to fulfill her promise, she's my knight in shining armor. Tamiya's voice now sounded like a trumpet sounding in full force, and he was filled with a sense of triumph. Gwyn, wake up. You need to wake up. Again, knowing it was useless, Yalacia tried to break the spell cast on the king. But. Post-hypnosis. You can wake this up at. She grasped the prayer cord with regret. Tamiya caught Gwyn's head in her fleshy hands, embraced him and rubbed his cheeks in a mischievous manner and looked at Varousa furtively. Now, no more games. Gwyn, my knight, do me a favor. I want you to crush these three right here. What? You witch. Ours was furious and drew his dagger. Velusa looked at Gwyn as she gasped. My lord, oh, my lord. Look at me, you don't think the king would put that sword to me or Yalacia or ours, do you? My king, my king, it's Varousa, it's Varousa. Ho ho ho. Tamiya pursed her lips in a smile. Ha 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 ha. His arm, adorned with many rings and bracelets, rose up and pointed straight at Yalacia's chest. And Gwyn's body turned gravely and began to move towards the white-haired mage like a strange, jerky mechanical doll. Both of his strong hands were held out in front of him and his fingers were folded in a crooked manner as if he was looking for something to pull with his hands. And a black and fierce will that would make even a demon god shrink back in fear. No, do something, Yalacia. Don't break the king's spell and let that witch have her way. Varousa screamed as she clung to Yalacia. Yalacia did not take her eyes off Gwyn's inching movements, but answered with a groan as she stepped back a little. If I could do that, I would. Daughter, all my power has been used to crack Yendar Zog's barriers and put up higher barriers. Even now, I'm fighting to feel and hold on to the monstrous psychic waves crashing into my sealed world. With that out of the way, it would be easy to break Tamiya's jutsu, but as long as Gwyn is under oath. 
then we'll be killed by the king. Velusa ranted, terrified, and jumped away from Gwyn's massive hand as it tried to close in on her. Yes, I know. It's not the king, it's not the king, there's something bad inside the king. Gah! Gwyn barked. Yalatia and Varousa leaped to either side, avoiding being caught in his deadly hands. Gwyn's huge frame slumped forward and then staggered back to its feet. There was no trace of the agility he had always displayed, and he moved like a borrowed body, sluggishly but precisely, trying to catch Yalatia. Gwyn Gwyn. Wake up. Come on, let's get the old man and cut him in four. Yalatia's screams echoed with Tamiya's ranting. Gwyn stalked after the old mage, not paying attention to Varousa. Yalatia also jumped away from the powerful hand at the last moment, but her face was contorted and her forehead was beginning to sweat with anxiety. My king, please. The king is in control. We're on your side. Varousa wrung her hands and cried out. Wake up. Don't take orders from a nasty witch. Get it over with, Gwyn, there's no time to lose. There's not a zong left until the meeting. However, Tamiya herself also seemed to be somewhat impatient. He reconfigured his hand signs and focused on strengthening his magic technique to control Gwyn. There was an opening. Take that. Suddenly, a tremendous rant came from Tamiya's mouth, and she staggered back to her feet. This, this, this. The witch clutched her side and choked with rage. While they were distracted by the struggle between Gwyn and Yalatia, Ars, who had come around from behind, suddenly leaped on Tamiya's back and raised his dagger. You little rat. The witch's hair stood on end and her face took on the appearance of a temptress. The witch's mouth snapped open and she spat a stream of fire at Ars. Wow! Ars screams and rolls over. The flames engulfed him and turned into a huge viper that attacked him. Help me. Velusa bravely raised her sword and ran to save Ars. I hope you're both bitten by vipers and die in agony. How dare you interfere with Tamiya's work with a human. Tamiya ranted and raved, but then. Gwyn. Yalatia's shouts of joy made me look back with a start. Gwyn, do you realize, do you understand me? Gwyn had stopped moving. In those yellow eyes, the usual fierce flames of the king of Chironia's irresistible will and life are burning brightly. M. Um, his mouth groped in a slow, painful voice came out. I know. Do you understand me, Yalatia? Can you hear me? Um. As if he were Imhotep, the king who had just awakened from a deep and cosmic sleep of thousands of years, King Chironia slowly, slowly moved his shoulders and then his arms. His whole body is suddenly filled with the overflowing radiance of life, the unceasing energy that makes him so different from other life, just like a wild spirit. Tamiya's face was gripped with rage, and the witch, in a frenzy, uttered the cursed words of mental concentration, called out, made a sign and threw it at him, desperate to bring the king under her control again. But. Oh Velusa. Ours. Gwyn's eyes were fixed on you, and then he jumped and wrapped himself around ours, ripping off the snake that was aiming for his throat. He ripped it off and threw it out as easily as if it were a small snake with no poison. To the king. Oh, my king. My king. My king. Varousa and ours jumped from both sides and hugged her. The silence, the silence. I know, was the king's surprising answer. My body was lying there like a dead man, while my soul, or whatever it was, was being pulled away from my body and drifting in the air, feeling as far away from everything as the bottom of the water. I was watching. Then let's get on with it. Yalatia quickly retied the prayer string. I'll take care of this. The once in six hundred year meeting of the stars is imminent. The king's body is already beginning to be affected by it. It's a rare event and I can't possibly know all the effects it will have on the king. Leave this to me and get out of here anyway it might be dangerous for you to stay. What do you mean, don't do it? Tamiya screams and turns to Gwyn. Gwyn, you remember, don't you? You promised me I'd pay you back, whatever it was, now make good on that promise. King of Chironia, the leopard-headed warrior will not fail to keep his word once it has been spoken. 
The king said he'd thank me, but he didn't say what it was. Velusa shouted. Tamiya glared at her, her eyes burning. Don't talk nonsense, little girl. You should have been eaten headfirst by Arachne's giant spider. Gwyn we don't have time for this. Yolesha shouted. On his face there was a deepening impatience, and his eyes were blazing with irritation. Go on, then. I'm the one to deal with this witch. If only you could escape this barrier's sphere of influence I could unleash all my power on this frog maiden. Come on, Gwyn, follow me. The way will be clear. Yolesha grabbed something from the sky and threw it high into the air. The object turned into blue fire in the air, flickered and flashed faintly, and immediately began to advance as if to say, follow me, go on. I'll follow you as soon as I get rid of this whore. I'm sure I can catch up with you by the time you reach the portal. You shouldn't be here in the middle of a meeting. Hurry, hold on, Gwyn. Tamiya goes crazy and stretches out her hand, calling out a spell to try to stop Gwyn, but it's no use. Witch, you are torn, and yet you do not know it. Yolesha's loud voice rang out. You have failed. Gwyn is no longer under your spell and Varousa's love for the king is a powerful barrier protecting him. And you, witch, will never have the strength to break free from the bonds of Yendar Zog. Now, Tamiya of Landergear, the man chased by the doll, Yalesha, is your opponent. You're an old man you're in, but you're not sure you're out. His face no longer looks troubled or radiant. Her teeth were bared, her eyes turned into white flames of hatred and regret, and the miasma of evil, ferocity, and darkness that emanated from her black and slimy body made her reveal all of her true nature as a monster that could not be described as either a lone demon or a black harpy. The miasma of evil, ferocity, and darkness had made her reveal all of her true nature. Tamiya's tied-up hair came undone, and her long, shiny, black hair began to wag as she looked at it. As she looked at them, she saw that they had all turned into horrible vipers, their fangs dripping venom and their tongues flicking wildly. Tamiya turned her head away, and just as she saw it, those snakes bared their fangs and came at Yulesha. Yulesha held out his hand and a shining staff appeared at the end of his hand. With a wave of his wand, Yulesha swept away the vipers with a flash. He saw that the wand blocked the way for his poisonous fangs. O oh, dog-headed serpent, O oh, Amolgos, Goneril, Tamiya is called. The demon that came out of the air and fluttered its flaming tongue at Yulesha was definitely a monster that was several times larger than the ones Tamiya had summoned before. But. Don't waste your time on me. The dog-headed snake that was about to sink its fangs into the mage's shoulder was suddenly engulfed in flames with a bang. It would burn in an instant. Tamiya's lips wagged in annoyance. What's the matter, that's all, slave girl. Yulesha raised her voice relentlessly. How could you, with such skill, have the temerity to take a bite out of this plot? Now the farce is over. An even greater foe awaits me. Go back to the stinking muck you deserve to crawl in, frog. He takes up the prayer cord and begins to chant runes in a loud voice. At the same time, he approaches Tamiya fearlessly. Tamiya's black face changed its expression from anger to humiliation, from humiliation to bitterness, and from bitterness to fear, like a cloud being tossed about by the wind. But at last, realizing that his opponent's power was too great for him to contend with, his eyes widened to the point of burning, and his fat lips began to tremble. Well, at least let me send you to the hell you want, and tell me, do you want to burn in the fire or be buried in the mud? Yulesha continued to close in on her with the purse string still attached. Tamiya's face finally showed the horror of being hunted down, and the witch fell to her knees and held up her hands as if begging for help. But I wasn't begging for help. Oh, your servant is twisted before the wicked arts of the new god. The witch began to shout loudly at something. Show yourself, O oh lord, to this servant of the old gods, who has turned darkness into light. Lontegos. And the witch turned her head away and called the eight spells that could not come from the lips of the most horrible human being in the world, those forbidden and terrible words that were sealed away tens of millions of years ago. On the other hand, 
Gwyn, Velusa, and Ars were led by the demon fire that Yulatia had unleashed, and they were rushing to get out of there, stopping their footsteps even though they were worried about the battle between Yulatia and Tamiya that was going on behind them. The demon fire of the sorcerer stood ahead of them, looking very confident, and went into the passage of that narrow pit from which the three Yulatia and the others had escaped earlier. Are we going in here? Gwyn growled, wrinkled his nose in disgust, and bared his teeth. Don't worry, I'll be out in no time. Verousa twisted her hand around the king's thick arm and pulled him to her. Her face shone like a glow. She was still far from being out of danger, of course, but the fact that her beloved, leopard-headed warrior, with whom she had shared Therid's adventures, was now conscious and in front of her made her feel that there was nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of. There is nothing to fear. Gwyn looked at Velusa with some admiration. Her clothes are torn, her hair is disheveled, and her face is pallid from the unusual experience, but in the midst of a bizarre other dimension that would make any woman in the world lose her mind, her slender face is not distraught with fear, her lips are firm, and her eyes are shining with the will to protect her king. His eyes glittered with the will to protect the king, and his hand was still grasping the dagger. You're a brave girl, aren't you? Gwyn couldn't help praising him. It's not easy being a princess, even an Amazonis. You remind me of the Princess of Paro with whom I fought many adventures in the distant past. I've never seen a woman with such a vibrant, proud and unyielding spirit. She is a noble princess of a noble kingdom, and you are but a little dancer of Kumu, but it seems that you and she have very similar souls, and, come to think of it, you have the ability to sense something that has not yet been revealed. And Gwyn tapped Velusa's firm waist in rough praise. Velertha's cheeks flushed with happiness. It's just like when we were in Terid's spell path, he says as he clings to his king. Me, ours, the king. Not at all. But I wouldn't say that things are much better or more comfortable around here than they were back then. Gwyn muttered gravely and looked around, flinching in disgust. What kind of world is this again? To Verausa and ours, it was just as they had seen it before a squishy and unpleasant side hole like the inside of a rubber hose. But to the eyes of the king, who was unable to stand up straight and walked with his back slightly bent and his head bowed, the bumpy walls and the ground that seeped out a disgusting liquid with every step he took seemed horrible to him, and he wrinkled his nose and sniffed the air around him. The king wrinkled his nose and sniffed the air around him, occasionally making a grim snorting sound. But what a smell! And it's so hot. I'm dripping with sweat, and I don't like it here. I have a bad feeling about this. Is this the way it's going to be for a while, huh, Verousa, ours? I'm pretty sure the last time I went through there, I think it was a little bit further out into the open, but... Verousa looks around hesitantly and thoughtfully. It was unmistakably the same side hole that she and ours had been led through by Yulatia, guided by the prayer ball, but Verousa's keen senses had sensed a subtle difference that could not be described. That said, it is difficult to point out exactly what it is. But if it reminded me of the inside of a snake when I passed by it earlier, it reminds me of the inside of a snake now, with its ridges and weird bumps every few steps, and yet it gives me the feeling that it was a slumbering snake that is now waking up. And yet, it gives the impression of an inexplicable breath of fresh air. The King Valertha nearly wriggled her lips in an attempt to convey her dubious concerns to the king. But, not knowing what to say, he just squirmed his lips and fell silent again. If this is really the womb of a monster, how is it possible that something this big is part of a single, living being that suddenly comes to life and starts moving? The more she thought about it, the more it seemed like nothing more than a ridiculous illusion, and Velusa jerked her head away and put all her strength into her right hand, which was wrapped around the king's arm. Whatever dangerous and frightening place they are in, it seems to me that it is no more hopeless, no more frightening, no more dangerous than it was a moment ago. Because just a moment ago, they were lonely, unreliable wanderers in an unworldly world, but now, beside her, the strong and dependable king of Chironia is walking strongly. Just the thought of it made Verousa feel infinitely comforted. Gwyn did not pay any attention to Verousa's progress, nor did she speak a single kind word to him. But when she thought that he was beside her, 
and that his heart and soul were now fully awake and with his body and soul, she felt that she had nothing more to fear from the leopard-headed king, who was in contact with her. The leopard-headed king, who was in contact with her, seemed to let a part of his powerful heartbeat and unceasing energy flow directly into her body through her skin from his strong, thick arms. Yalatia is. Suddenly, she realized what was happening and opened her mouth. I wonder what happened to Yalatia, and Tamiya. After she had said it, Varousa was even more stunned. There was no sign of movement behind or in front of me, no noise, just a stillness oozing with water or some kind of liquid that looked like water. It is still and quiet. In the midst of this inhuman silence, I heard her voice suddenly and inexplicably, and a faint feeling of fright came over me. Em, no, it's okay. I know a man named Yalatia. How can he be defeated by a witch who worships the old gods? After all, he's the man chased by the doll. A witch like Tamiya is no match for a mage who can even survive against the greatest of demons, the one who rules over all darkness and death in the world, the doll. I hope so. What's the matter, Varousa? Gwyn said curiously. You've been looking kind of worried for a while now. What's wrong? What's bothering you? No just. Varousa thought and answered. It's not that I'm worried about anything, but I'm worried about a lot of things. Do you get the feeling that Yalatia's life is in danger? Gwyn looked a little concerned. I remember Yalatia's advice. He warned me to heed the instincts of the Kumu dancer and to remember you, Ars. And indeed, it was through Ars that I was able to escape Tamiya's spell earlier. And if that's the case, maybe the other piece of advice is right. I wish I could feel as clearly as you do that Yalatia is in danger. Valersa was impatient. It's just that there's a danger so close, something so terrible, that I feel as if I'm completely engulfed in it. He said with a wag of his lips and clung to Gwyn's arm tightly. What's wrong? It's only when I'm like this that I feel even remotely safe. I'm so glad you're right. And Varousa rubbed her head against the king's shoulder with a dainty, feline gesture. Seeing this, R said in an indignant voice. Keck. I can't watch this. I'd rather have that kind of wet spot in the silent palace, after we've at least gotten out of this nasty hole in the ground without incident. But what about? The danger. Valersa, you just said that again. You said there was something nearby, staring at us. Suddenly, he looked around cautiously. I don't, I don't feel like there's anything there. Um, but if Voluka says so, then it is indeed dangerous. The king pats Varousa on the shoulder soothingly. And I certainly don't like it in here either. It's too small to fight well here, and the footholds are too bad, but more than that, it's understandable that Velusa would be frightened here. Let's get out of here as fast as we can. By then, Yalatia will have caught up with us. And they looked up at the fire, which was waiting for them in the air, and said gravely, Our Lord. So they kept their mouths shut and stopped short and devoted themselves to hurrying on, as if frightened by some unseen pursuer. And when they cease to talk to each other, again there comes to them a sticky and strangely languid silence. Had it been the stark silence of death itself, more dull than death itself, after everything had died, it might not have stirred up so much fear and secret panic in them. But she did not speak again, for fear of stirring up her companion's heart, but instead she leaned more and more heavily into the king's reassuring warmth, and murmured softly in her heart I am sure of it. This darkness. This silence is alive. It was no illusion. All around them, that solid, gelatinous, serpentine, undulating pit was somehow coming to life, regaining its foul, dark life, and slowly, very slowly, beginning its unholy pulsation. The passage through which they were passing was no longer a mere passage, but a horrible and unbelievable life of its own, with a primordial consciousness in it, gazing at them and watching over them. The wavy bellows oozed out a soothing, vile fluid as their feet trod upon it, and it sent up from the bottom of Varousa's feet to her brain an indescribable horror, like that of wiping on raw flesh. Somehow, unlike the time when even the gelatinous substance had passed through earlier, 
it seems to have begun to have a strange elasticity and a sense of resistance that only living things have. And at the bottom of the silence that surrounds them, which is sticky, dusky, and filled with the sweet smell of decay, it seems as if the beat of silence, similar to the regular and heavy beat of a drum, is beating gently. With her right hand she grasped the king's arm, and with her left she clutched the hilt of her dagger, which she held ready to be drawn from the sash, and swallowed a fresh spit. No matter how many times they tried to tell themselves that this would not happen, they could not get rid of the fear that the wall itself would suddenly turn on them with obvious hostility and bend them in two. If the situation had continued for more than a few minutes, she might have panicked, and finally, just to keep silent and not to feel the soundless pulse of the silence, the lifeless life, she might have cut at the wall with a knife and raved hysterically. He might have been compelled to rant hysterically. But, and this is the limit, when she begins to be unable to think of anything but that idea. It was as if something had seen and captured my thoughts, and I could see a round, open exit in the side hole. Even ours cheered. The demon fire also happily speeds up and flies towards the exit where a faintly cool breeze is blowing in. A faint but persistent suspicion seized her again, but she shook her head and decided that it did not matter, but she shook her head and decided that it didn't matter. But she turned her head and decided that it didn't matter. She was done with this cave anyway, and no matter how strange the world of the Bell Cave or whatever it was, it was impossible to believe that a cave could so easily change its shape like a melted jelly. Oh dear. It's over. Ours is so excited that he follows the fire and runs out of the hole first. Then the king and Verausa. But. Their feet stopped there as if they had been suddenly pulled down by some hand. There's. It was a dead end. It is nothing like the wide, high-ceilinged, cavernous depths of the world they remember. Rather, it is as if the brightness of the exit that had led them there and made them stop with joy had already been nothing more than a horrible trick, and as soon as they left it, they found themselves on a precipice that ended only ten meters away and beneath it, a fathomless gloom stretches out, and a few more meters beyond that, an unbroken line of darkness, blocking their way, how far it stretches, up and down they realized that they were facing a precipice that they could not even measure. The three of them stood there, stunned. Just before that, Runte goes. Lante goes. Tamiya's impassioned screams rang out. What's the matter with you you frog witch? At first, the old wizard held his staff in his hand but he immediately regained his composure. Doesn't that great god of yours even show himself when his servant is being hunted down? Laugh out loud. Lante goes. Tamiya's voice now had the crack of a scream. I'll tell you. Yalesha became even more calm. This is what you have been unable to see all this time. You have not even now realized what a ward this is. You are inexperienced. You see, this is Yandar Zog's ward, the world he created and the world he makes to exist. Ye Yander Zog. A scream escaped from Tamiya's mouth. That Yander Zog, king of Kitai and priest of the cursed doll. Yes. Yalesha moved her fingers in the shape of runes and touched the amulet. I can only be here safely if the psychobarrier I use is at least as powerful as yours, and if I can avoid the influence of Yandar Zog. But Lontegith is one of the old ones who came to earth in prehistoric times, a different lineage from all the gods we worship, a different kind of god. Why would a sorcerer of Yendar Zog's stature allow an alien to enter his domain, let alone face him head on? Oh, no, no, no. Tamiya screamed. All the hair on the snake's head had fallen back and its face was contorted with despair. I can't believe Lontegs is looking out for me. Lante goes. Don't you see it's futile? It's not that the frog god has forsaken you, it's that you've entered a dimension beyond his reach. The wand in Yalesha's hand rises to a great height. If you want to hold a grudge, you should hold a grudge against your own unknowingness, which made you proud of your momentum with the help of something else, instead of having mastered magic with your own power. Yalesha threw her staff at him. The wand became an arrow of light and flew straight at Tamiya. Tamiya jumped to escape, but as if enchanted, her body rushed towards the wand, contrary to the owner's fear, and it pierced right through the witch's two breasts and into her back. 
Gah! Tamiya's scream shook the area. The witch grabbed the burning arrow that had pierced her with both of her black hands and hovered in midair for a few moments. On her face, a look of disbelief and unseemly fear spread like a blot. Ye Alicia, those lips were wagging. You killed it, you killed this Tamiya. Remember that. Lentegos will never abandon it. Servants, you're not only being hunted by the dolls, you're being hunted by the old ones of Ku Su Lu. But he could not finish what he had said. A gray shade of death gradually spread over his black face, and a gray carbonizing effect began with a spasm from the center of his body, which was filled with streaks of light, to his limbs. And in time, the Witch of Rantegith turned into a hard, burned stick, and then she began to fall apart at the edges, until finally a gust of wind blew the remnants of what had once been the Tamiya of Landergear into thin air. A gust of wind blew the remnants of what had once been the Tamiya of Landergear into the air. The man chased by the doll watches on with a blank expression that can't be described as pity or disgust. A low murmur escaped from his lips. The old ones of Kusulu, go after them if you must. In any case, even if there are a hundred and eight more demons chasing me, I'll only die once. Then he looked around as if he had suddenly come to himself. This cannot go on. The time is drawing near, which means that the time of the final death struggle between me and Yendar Zog is also drawing near. It's a disadvantage, of course, to be forced to fight in the midst of my opponent's wards, but with Yendar Zog as my opponent, I can't afford to mock Tamiya and the rest of the riffraff. Ha! Or, ironically enough, after escaping from all of the dolls and Ku Su Lu's that were chasing me, my end may be a battle with Yendar Zog. The giggling figure of Yelai Shah suddenly began to melt away, and then disappeared. All that is left is the dust of the remnants of the battle. This this is. Gwyn ranted. Did Yelaisha teach you a lie? We can't even go on with this, let alone pass through it. No there certainly wasn't anything like this earlier. Varousa, who was about to say something, suddenly gasped sharply. What's the matter? Another premonition. Gwyn suddenly puts his hand on his great sword and yells. Varousa's changed. No 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 no. What's the matter Varousa? It can't be but. Gwyn grabbed Varousa by the shoulders and shook her. Velusa struggled violently. His eyes are wide open. They are eyes filled with fear and trembling, incomparable to those of the past. Her lips turned white and she trembled, and she tried to say something, but could not articulate it. He's dangerous, he's trying to kill you. What's wrong? What did Gwyn say? Varousa. For God's sake, tell me what I need to know. Where's the danger? Varousa's hand went up, trembling, and pointed upwards, and then round the cliff. And then his hand moved timidly, trembling with disbelief, bewilderment, and fear. And then it just stopped. On Ar's chest. What? At that moment, the little bandit of Tarid turned into a puzzled, innocent face, as if he had no idea what he was talking about. The king was just as puzzled. Danger, what are you talking about, Varousa? It's ours of the pitmouse Torek, our companion in the adventure of the unholy path. You're out of your mind, Valersa. Ours shouted angrily. You must be under a spell if you don't recognize me. My king, yes. Velusa is under a spell, just like those mages. Maybe so. Velusa, ours defeated Tamiya with his own hands and saved my life. If ours is an enemy, why would she do that? Velusa, whatever you do, take it easy. It was a moment. Don't move. Even if ours had been the strongest swordsman on earth, he might not have been able to catch the sword, let alone see it with the naked eye. But a moment later, Ar's body fell backwards. As if he'd tripped over something. What what? Are you doing, King? Ar screamed as he flipped over on his back and did not even try to get up. He looked up at the king as if frozen, his eyes shining brightly in his thin, charming face. What have I done? Even the king, even the king has been affected by their magic. Shut up. Gwyn barked. With his beloved sword at his side, he stood in front of ours like a giant, angry god, protecting Varousa at his back. The leopard's eyes blazed with fire, 
and he was filled with a terrible murderous spirit and tension. My king, I'm not crazy, just like Voluka's not crazy. You thought I didn't understand. What, what, what are you talking about? Arsa's voice is staggered and faint with fear. He looks down at it with a sneer. I don't have the psychic powers that Velusa has, the Leopard King said coldly. But in return, I have gained comparable, if not greater, experience in actual combat and have survived. A good warrior must have a third eye on his back, ours. When you followed me and Velusa through that pit, you wanted to kill me not twice but three times. More than once, you felt a strange, powerful evil. Don't tell me you don't know. Did you think that such an intense presence would be so imperceptible to me? The king's voice became louder and louder, with a tremendous crack that would have made the faint-hearted sit down on the spot. Well, 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 ours. So, no, king, I'm. Don't you dare lie to me. Gwyn exclaimed, and suddenly drew his great sword again. Like a leaf blown about by the wind, Arza's small frame flew backwards. If you were a mere thief of the Terid, a pedant of the Ifriqiya, you would not be able to dodge my sword. You, who are you? The leopard-headed king's eyes blazed with fire, and his whole body was filled with a ferocious killing intent that he could not even face. Ars sat down on the ground and screamed like a woman. Say it. Gwyn catches up to him. He raises his beloved sword three times in a spirited effort to mercilessly slash its neck. Ars, his eyes glittering in his drawn face, opens his mouth as if he were about to shout something. Is. And then. Beware, my king. That's Yendar Zog. A loud voice suddenly came from the sky. What the hell? The king suddenly drew his sword and jumped back and looked at the figure of the black cloak that had suddenly appeared in the air a short distance away. Yalesha. Is it true? It's true. Was the answer of the mage, who was hovering almost as high as their heads, holding a prayer stick in his hand and glaring at ours. There's no mistaking this Yalesha's knowledge of all the arts. That's Yendar Zog, the enemy's main body. Even as he speaks, his fire and burning eyes are fixed on the little thief and he will not leave them. Why, Elisha, you too. He didn't even listen to the wobbly Ars' attempts at protest. How dare you disguise yourself, Ars, as Ars of the Hornet Torque. But Yendar Zog. The perfection of your disguise, the way the water leaks from your hands, is like a glimpse into your true nature. Because the psychic Velusa, the extraordinary Gwyn, and I, Elisha, have been together so long, have shared so many adventures together, and yet through it all I have never been noticed. You are the only magician who can do such a thing, and you are the only one who can do it. Well, now you've got to show your tale. You're wasting your time, Yendar Zog. Gradually, Yalesha's voice grew louder and louder, and as soon as she called out Yendar Zog's name, she raised her hand and pointed it straight at him and it seemed as if Yalesha's whole thin body would swell several times over. His whole body exudes breathtaking dignity and fierce spirit, and from his pointed fingers you can see a glowing light piercing through his chest. Ha! When the finger was put to him, ours, or whatever he had been called, seemed to twitch. As it is, he crouched down with a deep swoon as if he had been overwhelmed and did not move an inch. A terrible silence and tension prevailed around them. The stifling silence came upon them as if it were a living thing in itself, and the moment they moved or made even the slightest sound, they would be crushed to a pulp. Ours didn't move, and neither did Yalesha, who stood in the air with her finger pointed at it as if she was a goddess. The leopard-headed warrior, facing ours, holding a great sword in his hand and protecting the frozen Velusa behind him, also does not move, just like the strange legendary god statue and only the two eyes that shine with a bluish light in the leopard head without fail tell that it is not a statue but a living being. It tells us that he is not a statue but a living being. After what seemed like an eternity of confrontation, the time passed. And, ha! At first, it was such a loose movement that no one even seemed to notice it. Ha ha! Ours, or what they had known as ours, he began to look up slowly, very slowly. Ha! Feeling something unusual, very unusual, 
In her appearance, Velissa clutched at the king under her breath. The king and the mage's eyes, like four flames, watch over what should have been ours without blinking. And... It finally looked up. Oh. Verousa heard someone let out a faint, frightened groan. She doesn't even realize that it's her own moan of fear and tension. This this is ours, that ours no way, again, a faint moan of unconsciousness escapes from her mouth. What they see before them now is. It's. She was nothing like the petulant and charming little bandit who had shared her adventures in this ward with Terid all those years ago. It was as if a viper in a rabbit skin had slowly opened its red mouth, or a scorpion disguised as a stone had slowly raised its slow, terrifying, death-dealing tail and begun its shuddering dance. As if. It was a transformation that filled me with horror and disgust. I don't have a choice. The three of them stiffened when a heavy voice, not unlike R's voice, leaked from his lips. The mystic mage, and the last and greatest of the dark powers stalking the silence and the leopard head king, Yendar Zog, is finally about to reveal himself. There's nothing to hide. Especially since the end is near. Indeed, I am Yendar Zog. Well spotted, Yelisha. It would have been better for you if you had been a simple magician who could not be detected. If that had been the case, you could have died peacefully without knowing anything about it. Ours or rather, Yendar Zog's voice had a chilling and unmistakable crack of derision in it. Even the calmness of his voice gave them a sense that the thing before them was a being of evil, ruthlessness, and power far greater than the five dark powers they had fought so far. Yendar Zog, King of Kitai, the greatest sorcerer in the East who ever sold his soul to the wicked doll. Yelisha, however, did not appear to be pressured. He put his finger straight against Yendar Zog's chest, just as he had done with Tamiya earlier. You have already taken possession of the power of darkness and could be called the King of Darkness. So why should you be so obsessed with the mere land of Chironia? Leave the Silence alone and return to Hades where you belong. Then I won't have to fight you. To be honest, I don't want to fight you, Yendar Zog. Foolishly, you become a weakling, a man chased by a dole. Yendar Zog replied in the same chillingly calm voice. Verousa inhaled audibly. It was an uncanny sight, the familiar, frail, timid, rat-like body before them, with a completely different personality, speaking to them through the vocal cords and mouth of the so-called R's. And it speaks to them with the vocal cords and the mouth. It was an awkward and unaccustomed sight to see, in the midst of all the pointy jaws, thin cheeks, and reluctantly lowered eyebrows, only the two eyes, which were completely different from each other, shone with the light and authority of serpents. You are a man who once served as a priest of Dole, mastered the secrets of the dark arts as much as me, and yet dared to turn your back on Dole, choosing to live in darkness for the rest of your life. It would be naive to beg for your life now, Yelisha. I'm not begging for life. Yelisha replies angrily. I only wish to see if I could not make you turn your mind. You and I would not suffer a terrible fate if we fought each other unnecessarily, for if we fought each other, it would be obvious that both of us would have to pay a very great price before either of us could kill the other. So, you're getting old, doll-chasing man. Yendar Zog scoffed. And when they saw it, Verousa and Gwyn suddenly gave a cry and ran away. Suddenly, without warning, the body of Yendar Zog's Rs began to melt away before their eyes. The flesh of his face was beginning to spill downward, as if it were a lead doll exposed to high heat. Verousa screamed in disgust and covered her face. Gwyn clasps her shoulders with her left hand and pulls her face to his chest. Yelisha holds up her prayer staff and watches him with a watchful eye. In the midst of their gaze, two eyeballs that had melted and spilled from the eye sockets that could no longer support them fell to the ground and looked back at them as if to wink at them. And not just the face. In no time at all, what had been ours of Torek was turning into a pile of melted clay that did not even retain its human form. His clothes and the things he held in. His hands melted away in a blur and though he still stood there like a long, thin mountain, he swayed and swayed, and then he fell away like melted ice cream. This this is. 
The voice of the unperturbed king of Chironia rumbled, and the king looked to Eurasia for an explanation. The man chased by the doll was staring at the enemy with bloodshot eyes. Noticing the king's eyes, he regains his senses and opens his mouth as if he were about to say something. But I didn't have time to say anything. Suddenly, from above, a tremendously loud and terrifyingly demonic crack of laughter shook the walls. Yander Zog. Yalesha was called high. Oh, you. I'm here, Yalesha and Gwyn. Yendar Zog's voice sounded as if it were descending from an unimaginable height. The three looked about them in dismay. But all that lay before them was a precipice that barred their path, and under their feet was the foul slime that had been Ar's flesh, but nowhere was Yendar Zog himself to be seen. Where are you, Yendar? Come out, you coward. Yalesha's shout was interlaced with the roar of the king as he readied his sword. The laughter that fell became even higher. You still don't see me. I'm right here, don't you see, look right in front of you. Now their loud laughter is a blatant mockery. They look forward with a start, and their eyes go up, and then they stop moving as if they were frozen. A precipice that seemed to be disappearing into the darkness, with no end in sight above or below, blocking their way. So far above the precipice, so far above the precipice that it would be five times their height. Like the stars of battle, twinkling red and fierce, their evil eyes looked down on them. Ah! Valersa shouted. Yendar Zog is up there. No! Was Yulesha's grumbling answer. It is not that Yendar has risen to that height at any time. This is what Yendar Zog is all about. Then, suddenly, Yulesha lifted his prayer staff and threw it straight at the precipice in front of him. The moment the wand came into contact with them, they were suddenly stunned by a shock as if the very walls of the earth and the surrounding area were shaking, and they rushed to their feet. The staff, glittering and shining, stuck there for a while like a light itself piercing the darkness, but then, as if suddenly pushed out, it lost its light and fell downward. And then. I won't stand for this, Yalesha. Yendar Zog's laughter rang out loudly. But, well, I'll give you credit for noticing it, even if it was very late. I'm here. It's better to say, this is me. Yalesha, Gwyn, that Arachnian dancer has the makings of a good witch. Earlier the little girl had dimly perceived that it was alive as she passed by. That's right, that's me. It's more like. You are in my body. And once again Yendar Zog's triumphant broad smile flashed through the darkness. It would have been easy enough to cook you, with or without the barriers. Nevertheless, do you poor wretches understand why I have allowed you to live thus safely until now, and even allowed you to bring back the leopard-headed king, whose heart I once took out and hung in the air? And this one too. Looking down from a tremendous height, I saw two fireballs of more than three meters in length, the ferocious twin eyes of Yendar Zog shining with a bizarre and brutal joy. And when I saw... Suddenly, high above their heads, several balls of light appeared in the sky. This is it. Yalesha screams in astonishment. Inside that ball of light. Baba Yaga, with his left arm torn off, his back split open, and still clutching his long staff, the long-tongued Baba Yaga, Iraha, the dwarf, with his head ripped off, the raw head of Iraha, with his eyes wide open, drifting near the base of his neck, which was also torn off and covered with red, the headless, stony-eyed Ruruba, and the hoofed-eyed Jisog, with half of his body burned to a crisp, a living corpse. It was like a procession of demons, a vision of hell. Varousa became dizzy and started to fall unsteadily. I held her tightly. Didn't they, the dark power mages, go down? The king of Chironia shouted. Overhead, Yendar Zog's answer gravely. No, I am not dead. But they are not alive in the sense of your word, as you were when you were struck by the lightning, O oh leopard. They are only suspended in their last moments, because we stopped their time for a while, and you do not know why. But I see it. I see the energy of the stars accumulating with the approach of each new day. It's comparable to the explosion of a star, and it's a huge thing that I've never experienced even in my life, which is dozens of times longer than most people's. 
Therefore, in order to bring that energy down to earth in accordance with me and my purpose, a very complicated ritual is required. The blood of the black mass must flow in greater measure than ever before. Your eyes move to show Yalatia, and then they look at Velusa. And those four little masters are the sacrifices necessary for that, which is why I have allowed you to live until now, just before the meeting. And now the time is about to come. Wait! Gwyn shouted at Yalatia, who was about to open her mouth to refute him. From the very beginning, everything is so different from the norm that I can't understand it. What is the meaning of this once in six hundred years meeting? What is the energy of the stars and how does it affect the terrestrial world that has nothing to do with magic? And moreover, what role do I play in all of this, that my silence had to be involved in such an incident? When I tell you, you won't understand it half as well as I do, mortal. Yendar Zog answered. The dark giant's red eyes fluttered as if in pity as he stood there, looking down at Gwyn and the others at his feet and at what was left of the four mages in the air. But let me put it to you quite simply. A once in six hundred years meeting is a direct line of stars. A direct line of stars? Yes. Yendar Zog said, I pity the ignorant. The stars follow their own orbits in the sky, and their orbits never cross each other, unless they are comets. But there are rare occasions when the stars, though in different orbits, are in such direct alignment that from one side they appear to be exactly one star, and this brings about various changes in nature, the most common of which are the eclipse of the sun and the eclipse of the moon. It is nothing else. By the way, the world under the control of magic is, in a word, the energy world corresponding to the material world of the earth. Yalatia is taken over. To us mages, all energy, from thought energy to heat energy, and even the energy of the stars, is what we call real events. And it is useless to explain this, but the energy fluctuation that such a series of stars brings about in the energy world is extremely large, even an eclipse of two stars is like that, and we therefore choose the time of the eclipse of the sun and the eclipse of the moon we therefore choose the time of the solar and lunar eclipses to perform the great magic arts. Our magic is, in essence, the art of harnessing the energy of the natural world and using it as one's own power. Therefore, the meeting that is about to take place tonight at the time of the dragon is nothing more than a unique stellar alignment in which the seven fixed stars of the constellation of the lion are exactly on the same line when viewed from the earth. This means that the energy of the stars that are emitted will be multiplied and synergized with the energy of the seven stars. Yendar Zog tied the knot in a calm manner. What's the connection between that star society and me, Gwyn? In other words, you are the fuse to the bomb that is you, Leopard of Chironia. Yendar Zog answered. I do not know how many times we have had such an opportunity, living for thousands of years, even though we meet only once every six hundred years. But they have never borne fruit, because in all those times we have met, we have lacked that most important of trustees. Only with you as a fuse can the vast energy of the stars be harnessed for use against the earth. It can be transformed into the greatest bomb this world has ever seen, or into a reservoir of atomic energy. So now that we have the sacrifices, we have you, the heart of the matter, and we are waiting for the stars to align, we are about to acquire an enormous power that has never been seen before, a power so enormous that it could be used to control everything on earth and below. I'm not going to let you do that, Gwyn exclaimed. I will not let the priest of Dole rule this world and make it a repeat of Canaan, the dark continent that perished. As long as I'm here, with this sword in my hand, I won't let that happen. Leopard. Sir, what are you? Suddenly, as soon as he heard it, Yendar Zog seemed to be greatly agitated. His huge eyes flashed violently and the cave, which was his body itself, trembled. Why do you know the name of Canaan, a super-ancient continent that has been marked by the old gods and submerged under the sea in the struggles of the dark gods? It's considered a huge secret even for a mage like me. It would be a mistake to think that just because you've mastered a little bit of Dole's black magic that you have all the wisdom in the world. Yendar Zog. Yalatia shouted. There is so much more to this world than you know. And Gwyn is the greatest living mystery of them all. You can know why he's so important to the energy of the stars in the first place, and how to use it, 
but you can't solve the mystery behind it. King Gwyn of Chironia, he is a much bigger secret than you think. Yes, you're right, it's all a bunch of nonsense. At the moment, the three men inside Yendar Zog's body thought they felt his flinching and hesitation as an invisible wave. But it was only for a moment. Immediately, Yendar Zog seemed to remember his purpose and the imminent hour. Whatever secrets Gwyn may have, they have nothing to do with my ambitions. I don't have time to listen to this nonsense. I'll get what I want. Oh, the time of the meeting is about to come. Suddenly, the area turned into a thick jelly. No, it would have been more correct to say that Yendar Zog's body itself had suddenly turned into nothingness. The strange bell-shaped cave in which they had just been standing, looking up at the giant Yendar Zog, had changed its appearance from that of Yendar Zog's body. Ah! Oh, a piercing scream erupts from Gwyn's mouth. We were in the middle of the abyss of outer space. Before they knew it, they had lost even the ground beneath their feet, and had been thrown into the midst of a sea of stars. Looking to the left, looking to the right, looking up, looking down, there was no sense of up or down, it was a true and eternal night. Far, far away, in the spiral nebula and the galactic ocean. Far beneath his feet, you can faintly see a green and blue jewel that looks like the earth of long ago. Gwyn felt a shiver of vertigo and turned to look for Eulatia, to ask why his body was floating in such a place, where there should be no air, no time, not even morning, and why he was able to float without suffocation. But what I saw was nothing but an expanse of stars as far as the eye could see. Eulatia had disappeared. And the reddening, haunting twin eyes of Yendar Zog, the giant of darkness, they seemed to be doing their utmost to fight a strange, unknowable battle in some unknown, unworldly dimension, a battle that only mages and wizards can wage, in some unseen, unworldly dimension, a strange and unknowable struggle to the death, possible only between a mage and a mage, is taking place. Suddenly, Gwyn felt a horrible, chilling sense of loneliness overwhelm him. If he were to be relocated to such a place by Yendar Zog, and the two mages were to fall together, he, who must be a flesh-and-blood human being even though he was deformed, would have no choice but to remain there, staring at the stars forever, and turn into a deserted human satellite. Fanned by this sudden and intense fear, Gwyn flailed and tried to walk, or swim, or whatever it was that he was doing to get out of there. But a low moan escapes from his mouth, he can turn his head and turn his body slightly, but there is no earth for his feet and no water for his body to float on. It does not seem to be moving in either direction. Gaw! A tremendous roar escaped from Gwyn's mouth. Suddenly, the king of Chironia had become a wounded leopard, a beast hidden within Gwyn, usually held in check by the intense human spirit within him, and only tinged with the peculiar hues of humanity, but suddenly bursting forth at such a moment to transform him into a giant carnivorous beast itself, literally from head to toe. But when it does, it bursts forth and turns him literally into a giant carnivorous beast of prey from head to toe. Now Gwyn was a mad beast himself, locked in a dark cage with no way out. If the darkness around him had been a wall, he might have smashed his head against it with all his might, and cracked it open himself. Such was the horrible cosmic loneliness that had plunged this brave king into a primeval, blind panic. G-U-H. He barked. Yalesha. Velosa. Yendar Zog. There is no response, only the stars twinkling coldly as if teasing. The real depression has finally hit Gwyn Gwyn's mouth lets out a series of tremendous roars. He tried to flail, but his body only turned softly. At that moment, his keen senses suddenly detected the presence of something moving in the distance. With a start, he tries to turn around. After several unsuccessful attempts, he was finally able to turn around. But as soon as he saw it, the hairs on the back of Gwyn's head stood up in disgust, and he wrinkled his nose and let out a tremendous snarl. It was I.G. Sog's bloodied body that drifted into the space behind us and approached us. Then, from the left, the right, and above, the horrible wreckage approached one after another. Gua! The leopard howled like a madman, brandished his great sword, and tried to keep the unholy and disgusting living corpse away from him, but he screamed and drew his sword just as it was about to touch him. It was Varousa's body, limp and fainting, with her arms and legs hanging limp. 
Gah. Gwyn ranted as he dug Velus's body into his left arm. You're torturing me, Yendar Zog. There was no answer. But with that, King Chironia finally regained some of his reason. On his left arm, he could feel the pleasant warmth of the smooth skin of his fainting daughter's body. And more than anything else, the thought that he must protect this brave girl who had saved him made Gwyn's heart bristle with cold water. Gwyn repositioned himself as best he could in that position and looked around, still looking for Yendar Zog and Yalesha. That's when. When did that happen? At first, the king didn't understand any of what was happening. But suddenly, her body is lifted up by an overwhelming and irresistible force, and as soon as she reaches out her hand, Varousa's body is snatched away from her hand. Varousa! The king of Chironia cried out. But then the king realized. The surrounding vacuum had suddenly turned into a seething inferno. Baba Yaga, Ilak, Ijisog, and Rolba their wounded and weak bodies were being crushed and torn apart before the king's eyes, as if by an invisible, gigantic hand. A terrible and mighty force field seized them, and pulled their bodies about, and crushed them to a pulp. The king groaned in disgust. The king's face and body were splattered with the blood, brain plasma, and entrails of the crushed mages. And. Varousa. Varousa. The king's throat erupted in a piercing scream at the thought of his daughter being dragged into this ghastly hell and turned into this hideous, crushed lump of flesh. That's when. Oh, the party's about to happen. I hear something, something that exists on a cosmic scale, telling me in an inarticulate voice that it is so. When the king was startled, a twin eye of tremendous size suddenly appeared and covered the whole space in front of him, extinguishing the brightness of all the stars beyond with its fierce red flame, as if it were about to engulf him. Yanderzog, the time has come. The time has come. The time has come. The same voice from before called out in an echoing voice. Then the king saw. To the naked eye, it must have been a sight that could not be seen directly. But the king's eyes saw it too clearly to be a vision. Oh, the stars are breaking. The seven planets, the seven planets that make up the lion's palace, are now about to come together as one, while being enveloped in a white-hot flame that will slowly engulf everything, making a tremendous noise. The king's body was thrown up into the air and into the abyss, and seemed to be grasped and twirled by an invisible arm. He could see the distant whirling nebulae wavering in the distance, and he could clearly feel the astronomical energy of power emanating from the overlapping stars, as if it were aiming at his heart, and erupting like a rampaging horse towards him in a torrent of light. The stars. Yendar Zog's twin eyes stare at the king. A numbing spell slowly seizes the king's soul with overwhelming power. The king dimly perceived the terrible spell called by Yendar Zog, which caused a violent rumbling throughout the universe. Come come, leopard, give me strength let that leopard's heart be mine. The spell was sweet and strong, and came to embrace the king with an enchanting coaxing. The king groaned. His mind is numbed, and his soul is about to succumb to a quiet, sweet sleep. Come on, it's easy. Sleep is sweet and you're tired, surrender to me. Close your eyes, all you have to do is close your eyes, it's easy. Leopard, Gwyn, King of Chironia. The temptation had grown so strong that it was no longer irresistible, but, King Chironia, paralyzed and about to fall asleep, Gwyn's head was suddenly filled with light like a cone. I am, I am the ruler of the silence, the emperor of Chironia. Yalesha. Gwyn pursed his lips. Paralyzed and reluctant to move, he struggled to regain the strength to resist, and his voice faltered. Yalesha. Yalesha. Kill me. Rather than let the pawns of the doll overrun my Chironia, kill me here and now. Without me, she can't harness the energy of the stars. Kill me, Yalesha. Yes. Gwyn listened dreamily to the echoes that suddenly came from as far away as possible. All right. Say your prayers, O oh king. I have no gods to pray to, Gwyn tried to answer faintly. I don't know why, I don't know who made me this way, and I don't know who put me here, but I will not call anyone the master of my fate until I have reclaimed the meaning of my life and my past. But his lips did not move. 
An immeasurable agony seized Gwyn, and he closed his eyes and surrendered himself to the pain. In the depths of his fading consciousness, he saw a huge, shining great sword hurtling through space towards him from a great distance. It seemed to pierce his heart straight through. Ah, it's Yalatia, Gwyn thought vaguely, and lost the energy to wonder why he could see it so clearly when his eyes were closed. He waited for it to pierce the middle of his strong chest with his armor from behind, and then he tried to call on his lips, faintly but inaudibly a certain beautiful name that he loved most in the world. That's when, daw, suddenly, a deafening scream cradled and pierced him in a wave. The scream goes on and on as if it will never end. The king opened his eyes. And I saw it. In the king's hand, the sword of light had somehow replaced his beloved sword and was now firmly in his hand, and it was pointing straight at one of Yendar Zog's glowing red eyes. Oh, oh, oh. Three times the mage's screams of pain shook the area. He ranted. Whoa. I failed. I failed. The king felt the stars rapidly fading into the distance. In the midst of this sensation of falling, he thought he saw, faintly, the figure of a tall, immeasurably old, dignified man, dressed like some king or other, with one hand over his eyes and the other glaring menacingly. I thought I saw the depressed form of Yendar Zog. I'll make it right I'll make it right. I may have to leave now, but in the near future I will return, leopard, and take your kingdom for myself and your secrets for myself. Take heart, Gwyn. The king's body continued to fall while he continued to squirm. Just before he was about to lose consciousness and sink into the abyss of darkness, he heard the voice of Yendar Zog, the wizard king of Katai echoing from within the monolith that flew away with a resounding gurgling. Sound. He heard the voice of the wizard, the king of Katai. Epilogue. My king, my king, my king. Someone was cradling Gwyn violently. His head ached as if it had been ripped open, and his whole body stung as if it had been pricked with needles. The king moaned, and something cold and smelling of musk was put into his mouth. As soon as I swallowed it, all the pain and the remnants of the upheaval disappeared as if it were a lie. This is, oh, Silen. With a cry Gwyn leapt to her feet. A soft hand stopped the king. It was Valersa. A smile came to her face. Don't get up yet, my king. We're in Yolaisha's house on the spell path. No, not the house of the stars. Yolaisha's O. Oh. The king patted Varousa on the shoulder and heaved himself up. I'm fine. I'm fine. Reassure her. The old mage sat on the other side of Varousa, small and compact, as if he had aged a hundred years or more at once. I'm very sorry. I was upset too. Yendar Zog is indeed a formidable foe, and I was so busy protecting Varousa that I almost left the king to his magic. Yalatia said and squeezed her chin to make the king drink from the jar. Velusa held the jar out to the king's mouth. The king gulped down the fragrant wine, drunk with the giddy sweetness of life. What happened to the silence? That was the first thing that came out of my mouth. Nothing important. The silent storm has passed. The people of the silent empire are rebuilding, and they're a healthy people. These nightmares will be forgotten in a month. I've sent word to the Obsidian Palace, and soon the Marquis of Langobard himself will come for the king who saved the silence from the demons. Well. The king seemed to be sinking in thought. Then. That was a remarkable thing, though. I only managed to throw you a sword of light that released energy in time, but a moment later an astonishing amount of light energy burst from your body and the area was enveloped in brightness as if a new star had been born. Even Yendar Zog couldn't hold out for even a second. You're an amazing being, Gwyn. Yander is he dead? No. He was wounded, but he seems to have escaped somewhere. Well. You said you were going to go after the silence again sooner or later, as long as I'm around. Well, never mind. Gwyn seemed to ponder for a moment, but soon his yellowish eyes shone like lamps, with even a hint of a mischievous twinkle in them. It's not as if I'm going to remain king of Chironia until he comes back to finish his ambition. And, Varousa, 
Or do you insist on being the mistress of the king of Chironia? Yeah. Varaus's cheeks flushed. Gwyn drew her roughly to him by the waist, and a look of rapture came over her face, and with a meek gesture she threw herself on the king's breast. So this is Spell Ali so things began and ended in Spell Ali. And now, Yelisha, I've got a beautiful woman who loves me and can fight alongside me, and she's not afraid of my leopard head. She will give birth to a very strong child. When Yelisha answered and looked at Gwyn and smiled, Varousa buried her face in the king's chest, even the nape of her neck turning red. Gwyn watched with admiration in his eyes, and with the pride of a glorious victory. He tapped his lover lightly on the hip, and just then knocked on Yelisha's door, and nodded to Yelisha to come with him before the loyal Marquis of Langobard, who had come to receive him, and stood up slowly, embracing Varousa's shoulder.